understand the heavily armed and militaristic Starfleet that emerged after the Dominion War, an analysis of the Federation's foolish golden age that precipitated the war must be fully understood. Ironically, this golden age, time of pacifism really, came at the price of blood. Lots and lots of blood. From its very formation in 2161, the Federation endured continued tensions, Starfleet either being on the brink of, or actually in, some type of war. The conflicts would continue to threaten the very existence of the United Federation of Planets until after the tomed incident of 2311, after which the Federation would prosper and expand in all directions for nearly 60 years. In short, the Federation started out being a war-weary power and stepped into a golden age and all it really cost was 150 years of near war or constant war, massive expansion once the Federation was unopposed, and ultimately nearly losing everything due to hubris. Contrary to popular belief and dialogue found in The Next Generation, the first 150 years of the Federation was mostly strife and near constant need for battle readiness. We know this because the formation of the Federation occurred after a combined United Earth, Vulcan, and Dorian, and Tellarite Task Force defeated the Romulan Star Empire's assets at the Battle of Chiron, ending the United Earth-Romulan War. After the Federation's establishment, Starfleet, the defensive and scientific arm of the Federation, found itself in a constant state of battle readiness. This was to combat the most well-known adversary of the Federation in the 22nd century, the Klingon Empire. In fact, there wouldn't be a time in the 23rd century that the Klingon Empire and United Federation of Planets weren't in some form of war or Cold War status. Many brush fires would flare up during this century, resulting in battles between Starfleet and the Klingon Defense Force, including, but not limited to, the Battle of Dona 5. At some point, internal struggles within the Klingon Empire caused its infrastructure to fracture, giving a bit of respite to Starfleet forces. This brief break would only last for a scant 11 years, however, when the Klingon Empire's houses united under a Klingon named Takuvma, and a Klingon task force devastated a Starfleet defense force at the Battle of the Binary Stars. The ensuing war lasted for almost a year, and an excess of well over 21,000 Federation citizens would lose their lives. One third of Starfleet's forces would be destroyed, and Starfleet would be pushed all the way back to Earth. The war ultimately ended in a ceasefire, neither side actually claiming victory. The conflict created deep divide and resentment between the Federation and Klingon Empire, plunging both sides back into the Cold War that had existed before. Starfleet spent most of the century rebuilding its fleet strength and once again began exploring, though in the opposite direction of the Klingons. Even with Starfleet expanding, again away from the Klingons, there would still be some issues including a brief battle with the Romulans during the Neutral Zone incident, an encounter with an entity known as V'ger, which almost devastated Earth, and the near destruction of Earth by a well probe. The beginning of the end of the bloody conflicts that stained the 23rd century began in about 2293 with the Kitimer Accords. This would mark the end of the Klingon Cold War and allow for a scaling back of the military arm of Starfleet. Though tensions would rise briefly, the Klingons ultimately cut most all ties with the Romulan Star Empire in 2344 after the crew of the Enterprise C gave their lives defending a Klingon outpost. With the Klingons, the largest threat to the Federation pacified, and basically becoming an ally, Starfleet would still have intermittent confrontations with the Romulan Star Empire, the Empire being the only other major power of the time, at least as far as was known. However, these conflicts ended at the Tomed Incident and the signing of the Treaty of Algeron leading to the Golden Age, which we'll discuss after this. After the Tomed Incident in 2311, the Federation, and indeed Starfleet itself, saw massive expansion in both territory and the sciences. This period of time has been coined, as I've stated, as the Golden Age, 
full credit going to the YouTuber Lore Runner. I've personally called this same time the age of pacifism as Starfleet massively scaled down its ability to conduct war and opted to acquiesce rather than engage in prolonged conflicts. The Federation also finally began to have enough political weight to solve problems diplomatically. There would be less and less a need for large scale ship engagements. Hell, even starships began to reflect this change as policy moved away from all military personnel on a ship reminiscent of the United States 1960s tradition to more of an amalgamation of the early UK's 12th century naval doctrine intermixed with progressive ideals allowing for a civilian presence. Vessels would be outfitted with the ability to defend itself and other colonies true, but also had a main focus on exploration and family. The ships of the early 24th century would be basically palaces, grand cities in space. 24th century ships would have holodecks, aquariums, gymnasiums, luxury areas, schools, advanced medical facilities, and more. Even areas off limits to civilian personnel would have a very homey and comfortable feel. These shifts in aesthetic and policies had dramatic impacts on those who worked within Starfleet as well. Starfleet personnel became more complacent, thinking they were more explorers than soldiers. Hell, the captain of the flagship of Starfleet would be quoted as saying, Starfleet is not a military organization. Our purpose is exploration. This mentality would be seen reflected in the entirety of the crew of the Enterprise D, Starfleet Command, and even other ships. The conversion would not only be in Starfleet, but the Federation itself. For humanity, and probably most all of the Federation, currency would become largely antiquated. This due to innovations such as the Replicator, Holodex, and other amenities. Citizens could do anything they wanted, be able to chase their dreams. Advances in medical science would mean that most species would live longer and overall were more healthy. With all of their base needs met, some children would grow up in a universe where they were only bound by their imagination. And this, understandably, would lead to complacency. Starfleet becoming so pacifistic that even scientists were allowed to go and research organisms like the Borg that are rumored to be one of the most fierce enemies of the Federation. They thought they were unbeatable. However, while the quote-unquote golden age lasted roughly 50 to 60 years, cracks would start to be seen even within that time. Starfleet Command would slowly become aware of dangers on the horizon. The Cardassian Border Wars, renewed interest from the Romulan Star Empire, the Federation's Inkethi War, an attempted coup at Starfleet Command by bug-like entities, and Klingon internal issues that threaten the Federation-Klingon alliance, all were warning signs. However, even with all of this, the Golden Age wouldn't be interrupted, at least until it came crashing down when the Federation was plunged into yet another war. This war being started by the Borg who invaded their territory. To give real scope here, during the Federation Klingon War of 2267, the Neutral Zone Incursion, and even the Tomed Incident, Starfleet fielded starships built specifically for the purpose of defending the Federation. The Constitution, Miranda, Excelsior, and Ambassador-class starships were a part of many in the front line in the 23rd and early 24th century. Yes, these ships did have exploratory missions as well, but they were built with the mind that the universe is dangerous out there. And this would be a sad irony, because at the Battle of Wolf 359 in 2366, the Federation would defend itself with a task force that was… laughable at best. While the fleet that was meant to stop the Borg Cube would have Nebula-class starships and a few other modern vessels, the bulk of the fleet was designed during the 23rd century, and many of those wouldn't even be able to defend themselves against other 23rd century vessels. In one battle, Starfleet lost over 11,000 personnel, all of them either KIA, MIA, or assimilated. It was a near miracle that the Borg vessel was stopped and Earth not assimilated in the end. After the Borg incursion, Starfleet did wake up, if but for a brief moment. They began to make vessels geared to defeat the Borg, ones geared for war. Unfortunately, old habits would die hard. Even with the culture of Starfleet starting to change back to what it was, those personnel within it would not truly understand the role of Starfleet until a brutal war with the Klingons and ultimately the Dominion War itself. It is often stated that actions done in the present have devastating impacts in the future. This can surely be proven true with what we've seen happen with the Federation. The scaling down of the military aspects of Starfleet after the ceasefire and alliance with the Klingons would lead to a golden age where Starfleet thought itself only meant for exploration. And even after the wake-up call of Wolf 359, Starfleet would not understand what it was to be a military power until halfway through the Dominion War. Stay tuned as we continue to discuss Starfleet's pacifism in the Golden Age with a breakdown of the Cardassian Wars. It is easy, in a post-Dominion War analysis, to break down Starfleet's failures. It failed to stop the Cardassian threat during the Border Wars, failed to stop the Cardassian threat during the Klingon-Cardassian Wars, 
Starfleet Command stood back and allowed the Cardassian Union to oppress people and watched as Cardassia subjugated and strong-armed people into forced labor camps. However, is it really that simple to say they should have done something? Because to stop all of this, to stop the Cardassian Union, would have put the Federation in the business of nation-building. An in-depth understanding of the Cardassian border wars can't be appreciated until the non-interference policy of Starfleet is fully realized. Anyone who has looked into the Prime Directive will agree that the non-interference clause is pretty direct. But what many fail to realize is how hands-off Starfleet would be from a global perspective. With the exception of the mid to late 23rd century, when Starfleet ironically was able to defeat its enemies, the organization largely limited all of its interactions. For instance, the Klingon Empire and Romulan Star Empire are both governments that are known to enslave those who are within their borders. We see this with the Remans for the Romulans and get a sense of what Klingon rule looks like in the original series episode, Errand of Mercy. Well into the 24th century, the Federation was complicit to allow the enslavement of other races as long as it wasn't within its own borders. Hell, even after the Federation Alliance had won the Dominion War, they didn't require the freeing of the Vorta or the Jim Hadar in the Dominion. In fact, the Galen border conflict from the TNG episode Suddenly Human is a wonderful example of Starfleet modus operandi. Occurring in the 2350s, the Talarian government was technologically inferior to most anything Starfleet could field. However, the Talarian government would utilize guerrilla warfare and deception to inflict massive casualties on Starfleet. As an example, the Talarians would send out fake distress calls from abandoned vessels and then blow them right the hell up with Starfleet personnel on board. This tactic worked so well that it cost the lives of at least 219 Starfleet personnel. This is a war that the Federation could have won at any time should they have chosen to. That's not in debate. But they opted to limit the war in hopes of gaining peace and not devastating the Talarian government. Hell, after the peace agreements, the Talarians were supposed to send all prisoners of war back. However, it was discovered that one of the captains of the Talarian military had kept a four-year-old child, had kidnapped him, and raised him as his own. When the human child had been recovered, the Talarians were about to go to war, and it was decided that the child would be returned to the Talarian captain. Because God knows Stockholm Syndrome isn't an issue, and I know that if I was killed by the military of an enemy government, I wouldn't want my own government to recover my child. I would just want them to, you know, let the other government raise my kid after their military killed me. I mean, that's just what enlightened humans do, am I right? All of this leads and helps explain the Cardassians and the Border Wars, also known as the Federation Cardassian War. From dialogue we see in both TNG and DS9, it is likely that the Cardassians were probably not always the quote-unquote savages that they are portrayed. At some point before the Border Wars and occupation of Bajor, the Cardassians were likely similar to the Federation, wishing to just coexist. However, for reasons that haven't been revealed as of the upload of this video, the Cardassian economy would crash. This caused devastation among all territories owned by the Cardassians. It was so bad that we know that children starved on the streets and would fight over rats and eggs just to survive. This allowed militant aspects of the Cardassian military to gain control and either change or form the Cardassian Union. Almost overnight, the Cardassian military would begin massive expansion in all directions. This would result in the occupation of Bajor and the Cardassian border wars. Ironically, these two events are more linked than people like to think. Many will state that the occupation of Bajor would be an internal conflict, an issue regarding the Cardassians and the Bajorans, because apparently none of them ever watched the original series and learned about Captain Kirk and his interactions that stopped an advancing Klingon Empire, but let's just not get into that. Even if we assume that the Cardassian-Bajoran conflict was an internal matter, which it wasn't, but let's say that it was. The Cardassians were strip mining Bajor and using those resources to build more Cardassian vessels of war that they would then send to the border of the Federation to kill civilians and military officers alike. 
It's telling that Starfleet wouldn't strike at a strategically significant military target to stop the war. Make no mistake, had they liberated Bajor, Cardassia would not have been able to continue the border wars. Additionally, the occupation of Bajor was brutal. As has been noted, Cardassians were strip mining the planet for its resources. Labor camps were thrust upon the Bajoran people, and ultimately, women were forced into sexual service if they wanted to survive. The Bajorans, who were considered some of the most advanced peoples for their time, had been reduced to one of the weakest powers in the Alpha and Beta quadrants. By the time of DS9, they were a backwater planet. And in all of this, Starfleet did nothing. After all, as we've discussed, it's an internal matter. People getting killed, forced to work, the suppression of speech and religion, that's something that the Federation stands against, sure, but ultimately, Starfleet can't get involved in everything. Now let's be fair here, to expect Starfleet to get involved in this has a few consequences. Assuming we don't include the border wars, men and women would be dying for something that isn't technically any of their business. Secondly, once the Cardassians have been pushed out, Starfleet is now in the business of nation building. It takes more than just a few years to help people, it takes decades upon decades. Possibly one to two generations have to die before a stable government can be formed. And where does it stop? If the Cardassians aren't allowed to subjugate people, are the Romulans and Klingons allowed? Why isn't Starfleet attacking those empires as well? Is it just because these empires have the ability to defend themselves? Does Federation justice only come when the fight is easy? Ultimately, this entire affair is complicated. Even more so when we take a look at the Cardassian border wars, which we will right after this. Historically, I have been pretty hard on Starfleet for their inability to win the Cardassian border wars. There have been a minority of people that argued that the Cardassians may have had ships that were more on par with Starfleet technology and thus why the border wars were so prolonged. This doesn't make much sense as you have to consider that if Starfleet couldn't defeat the Cardassians, then the Cardassians would have been on par with the Romulan Star Empire and the Klingon Empire. Additionally, we know that the Nebula class and Galaxy class starships were developed and launched during the time period of the Cardassian border wars, which were between 2347 and 2366. These two vessels outmatched Cardassian starships significantly. So it is extremely unlikely that the Federation was in a quote unquote war with a species that matched them. However, there were other issues that the Federation had to deal with. Federation territory was vast by the time of the series of conflicts. The Klingons would still have raids into Federation territories, even after signing the peace agreement apparently. The Romulan Star Empire was still a significant threat to Starfleet. And don't forget the Battle of Wolf 359 occurred in 2366, when the peace agreement was signed by the by. This would mean that during the Border Wars, Starfleet had become aware of the Borg and were worried more about them than the Cardassians. No, what is more likely to have occurred would first be the pacifists of the Federation's Golden Age being able to convince Starfleet Command that a simple stalemate in use of diplomatic pressure was required versus devastating the Cardassian Union. Now let's be clear here, keeping assets available for other hostilities and not going into a full-blown war economy was worth more than the lives lost in civilian and Starfleet personnel during these wars. And when looking at the specifics of the Federation Cardassian War, there aren't a lot of specifics. All of the information known generally involves Cardassian aggression with a mild Starfleet response. During most of the fighting, Cardassians would attempt a land grab and remove Federation forces. This includes, but isn't limited to, the attack on Setlik 3, claiming the lives of most all Federation civilians, and the attack on an outpost in 2363 that involved weeks of fighting, which also included a three-day, never-ending firefight. It's ironic that during the first season of TNG, the Cardassian border wars were still going on, and yet the Golden Age was so prevalent that the crew of the flagship of Starfleet never even brought up the fight. Another interesting piece, though probably more just for the trivia. Captain Jean-Luc Picard, a man who was always talking about how things never should be hidden, who always talked about how everything must be brought out in the light, how the populace has a right to know what their governments are doing, would be complicit in a cover-up to hide the fact that the Cardassians had been caught building up for war to prevent another Cardassian border war. The border wars would result in the demilitarized zone, something we'll talk about in a long, long time from now. Stay tuned as we finally get into the Dominion. Only 20 minutes into this series and I'm finally talking about what you came for. It's like Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, but without the mom's name Martha. 
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. I have a favor to ask you. With this time of year and of course the apocalypse happening outside, YouTubers are getting hit pretty hard. If less than 1% of everyone who watches my channel every month gave $1, I would be set and not have to worry about the YouTube advertising. This would help me feed my kids as well as make content that you guys love, so please consider going to patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or becoming a YouTube member. I really appreciate anything you guys can do. And with that, I'll catch you guys next time. The problem with the Dominion is that we only have their word when it comes to historical facts about the government. We know they aren't shy when it comes to boasting about their abilities, but how much of it is fact and how much of it leads into legend? The truth is, the Dominion is steeped in mystery and obfuscation to such a large degree that we can't be sure even how old the government is. As an example, Weyun 4 in the DS9 episode To the Death states that the Dominion has endured for 2,000 years. However, in the DS9 episode The Dogs of War, Weyun 8 claims that the Dominion hasn't lost a battle since its beginning 10,000 years ago. While in theory you could argue that if the Dominion was founded 10,000 years ago, then it would have endured multiple 2,000 year periods, the definitive nature in which Weyun 4 tells Sisko this information leads me to believe that this was not what was meant at the time. If I were to theorize, I would say that there are two possible explanations. The first is simply that Weyun 4 was lying. During the episode he told Sisko this information, again in To the Death, he was already giving vital pieces of data to Sisko that he knew would get back to Starfleet Command. It may have been an attempt to give bits and pieces of misinformation to keep things distorted. Surely, if the best lie has a kernel of truth, then the worst truth has a lie within it. It's possible that by giving this inaccurate information, it could cast doubt on Sisko's entire report. The other is that Weyun, regardless of which clone he is, simply isn't sure. It's possible that the changelings are so scared of solids that they keep their history obfuscated, even from those they have created and enslaved. I wouldn't be surprised if the changelings were so paranoid that they gave inaccurate information to the Vorta and Jim Hadar on purpose. Additionally, they could restrict most all information to any solid. Knowledge can be its own form of power, after all. This does raise questions on the entire formation of the Dominion, however. Remember, the stories that are given to us are given by the Founders, not exactly the most trustworthy. While I don't doubt that the Changelings were being persecuted, I wonder if there's more to it. While this isn't canon, and again is just pure theory, it wouldn't surprise me when they expand the history of the Dominion to show them to have either coexisted on a planet with, or found themselves to be neighbors of another race of solids. For whatever reason, a war between the two could have broke out. This could have been a war just on one planet or possibly been in a sector. The changelings would be hunted in some areas of space which then ties into later conversations of a changeling being chased and a Vorda who hid him from those attacking. The founders would form the Dominion and begin using genetic manipulation starting with the Vorda. This would be the beginning of their practices turning the Vorda into diplomats. At which point, perhaps the Dominion offered a diplomatic envoy. This could have been a trick, Dominion forces overrunning the defenses of the enemy, and then they turn those defeated solids into Jim Hadar and use their former enemy to protect them. It certainly would be interesting, fleshed out, and sound like something the founders would do. Regardless of what occurred, the changelings would ultimately send the genetically modified beings, again the Vorta and Jim Hadar, out in all directions to expand their empire. The Vorta generally arrive first, providing diplomatic options and concessions for the penance of the future client states, and should that fail, the Jim Hadar is sent in. It wouldn't take long for the Dominion to expand in hundreds of cultures, hundreds of races really, to be subjugated. By the sheer use of logic, the Dominion initially had to have some form of infrastructure and build their own ships. However, when we listen to dialogue, it becomes painfully clear that the Dominion heavily relies on subjugated client states for its needs as of the events of Deep Space Nine. Several different governments are noted as the ones to build and supply the massive Dominion war machine by the time Starfleet became aware of their presence. One of the amazing attributes of the Dominion is its intelligence gathering abilities. We have reason to believe that the Dominion was far more aware of the Federation than should be possible before the discovery of the wormhole. Though interestingly, I haven't been able to find any evidence on whether the Dominion was aware of the Borg or not. 
You would think, given the Dominion's ability to know about the Federation, they would have intelligence on the cybernetic species, but we just don't know. In all of this, we've discussed the genesis and the buildup of the Dominion diplomats and military machine. However, the society of the Dominion, and those under it, is just as intriguing. Everyone knows that the Dominion has the Founders as the leaders, believed to be gods. Interestingly, most cultures, most civilizations will never see the Founders. And then you have both the Vorta and the Jim'Hadar, with the Vorta seeming to be the messengers, administrators, and diplomats, and the Jim'Hadar the foot soldiers. Though not everything was as it seemed. While we know that most Vorta seem wholly devoted, only having an example of one defector trying to leave and join the Federation, we're made to believe that Jem'Hadar rebel much more. This is why the Jem'Hadar would be required to have chemical addiction along with the training to keep them obedient. And there were, of course, tensions between the Jem'Hadar and Vorta as both vied for favor in the eyes of the Founders, and had little use for anything else. This shows a sort of Gilded Age, everything being pristine on the outside, with the inner being rusty and gross. We're never completely told what life under the Dominion was like, but it does seem to have some form of hierarchy and system to it when it comes to the client states. We know that several different powers work for the Dominion, creating their wares, and different species appear to interact with each other as well. Looking at the client states themselves, there appear to be some that are more important than others. It's likely that the subjugated species are allowed to work within their own bubble and do whatever they want as long as it's for the glory of the Dominion. Additionally, interaction between other Dominion planets and territories is allowed while interaction outside of the Dominion borders appears to be limited. I am also going to note that given how far we see Starfleet is able to corrupt and venture into Dominion territory in order to trade illegal goods and interact with other species, you remember when Starfleet was instigating the war, it appears that the Dominion rule by threat of force more than force itself as they aren't able to stop Starfleet. Dominion forces, in fact, seem to be unable to keep out or widely detect incursions into their own territory, showing they may not be able to keep as strong a hold on their space as they pretend to. All of this leads into the mentality of the Founders, though. Ultimately, nothing matters to the Changelings, except themselves. Now, I get that this might be something people consider a no-duh, but I don't think they really realize to the extent. The Founders don't care about anything solid. Whether a specific solid lives or dies doesn't mean a lot to them. Entire planets are engulfed in plagues, others allowed to flourish. In fact, the female changeling in the Alpha Quadrant was quoted as saying they would give up the entire Alpha Quadrant to have Odo. While this is maniacal, it's also telling. The changelings truly only cared about themselves and their own safety. Everyone else was just a pawn to them. The point of talking about the Dominion and the changelings before we even get into the events of Deep Space Nine was to give an understanding of their mentality, just like we had done with the Federation. And now, with both of the principal players analyzed and their baggage brought to bear, we'll see how all this plays out in the next episode as the Federation starts hearing whispers of a Dominion threat. When reviewing how the Alpha Quadrant reacted to the Dominion, it's really startling to see how they dealt with the situation. Starfleet often wouldn't even look to see if territory was owned by someone before barging in, preferring to ask forgiveness than permission. It's of little surprise that they would find themselves so quickly in a fight. For all the bluster of the Dominion, it's strange that we don't see a more immediate response to Starfleet quote-unquote invasion of their space. That said, however, the Dominion's presence is always felt in the Gamma Quadrant, whether they're there or not. We see whispers of them as early as DS9's episode Rules of Acquisition. The Ferengi are told that anyone who wants to do anything in the Gamma Quadrant must go through the Dominion first. However, the actual Dominion itself isn't a factor until a much later episode in DS9 named the Jem'Hadar. In that episode, we get the first real interaction between the species of the Alpha and Beta Quadrant and the races of the Dominion, namely the Vorta and Jem'Hadar. And of course, as we know, DS9 doesn't make continuity breaks, so the first interaction with the Vorta will show one utilizing telekinetic abilities. She does this to knock down Cisco, so of course this will be an ongoing trend where Vorta utilize this ability, if only to get out of rough spots. So don't worry, because only Discovery has continuity issues. Okay, so joking aside, if I'm being fair, the time we see the utilization of kinetic powers by the Vorta, it is a ploy to trick Cisco and gain information. We know that, at this point, Dominion technology is leagues above that of the Federation. It's possible that the Vorta is utilizing some type of device that mimics telekinesis in order to trick Cisco. Again, providing misinformation to Starfleet intelligence isn't exactly a bad idea. 
When we see the first interaction between Hajim Hadar and Sisko, it is pretty brisk. The Jim Hadar mentions many things, including the Founders, and then goes on to talk about things happening in the Alpha Quadrant, including talking about Klingons, Ferengi, humans, Batleths, and the Cardassian Treaty. This is far and above what should be known by a government that is so far away on the other side of the galaxy. How and why they know this is still somewhat of a mystery and up for debate, at least as of this meeting. We do know that the Changelings will send their own out and let them travel back, gaining information. However, given how long it would take to get to the Gamma Quadrant from the Alpha or Beta Quadrant, information of that sort wouldn't be known or would be woefully out of date. Additionally, the Jem'Hadar tells Sisko that further incursion would not be tolerated. This dialogue probably indicates that they had always known about the infractions of Starfleet. If that were true, then perhaps intelligence operations had already been conducted. The Jim Hadar even states, quote unquote, we learn more every day. Given that the Alpha Quadrant powers would not be aware of the changelings, nor how to fight or detect them, gaining information would be quite easy. I've touched on this before, but a discussion on the Dominion ethos is worthy of a rehashing here as we get into the conflict that is to come. When the wormhole is open, ships from the Alpha and Beta Quadrant start flooding in. Initially, the Dominion didn't do anything, as noted, presumably just gaining information and intel. We do know that some ships would go missing and were probably destroyed. And then, all of a sudden, the Dominion become extremely aggressive. They capture Sisko, destroy a Bajoran colony, and transport it onto DS9 while the shields were up. The Jim Hadar that would be transported onto DS9 would walk right through a containment field that was meant to stop him like it's nothing and threatens that no other ship should come through. I'm going to grant that this is an overreaction by the Dominion. It is extremely aggressive and unnecessary. However, it's important to remember that this might not be illegal or immoral necessarily. Starfleet, and indeed other powers, all just started waltzing into the Gamma Quadrant and colonizing. And here's the thing with that. This makes it partially the Federation's fault. Starfleet didn't do any in-depth analysis of the area they were going into. They assumed that the politics of the Gamma Quadrant were that of the Alpha and Beta Quadrant. Basically, you find it, you keep it. Starfleet has always had a you're not my supervisor and it's better to ask forgiveness than permission mentality. I think that Dax even proves my point when the Jim Hadar advises the bridge crew of DS9 that they have captured and will keep Sisko as a prisoner of war going forward Dax states that the Dominion is crazy if they think that will stop the Federation from exploring the Gamma Quadrant. As if Starfleet has any inherent right to do so. And after this is said, it is at that point that the Jim Hadar states they thought that would be the case and shows the destruction that they've already wrought. They knew the Federation wouldn't back off unless a message was sent. Now, I don't know if what they did was justified, but it does seem like it would be the only message that the Alpha and Beta Quadrant would understand. A lot of people balk at my opinion on this too, but I also don't think the capture of Commander Sisko and the removal of the Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers from Dominion Space is necessarily unwarranted. It was unnecessarily violent, granted, but then they couldn't be sure how the Alpha Quadrant powers would react either. Had they simply asked, the Alpha Quadrant powers might have bolstered their ranks, so utilizing overwhelming force to take care of the problem makes sense. Especially if you don't trust anyone who doesn't look like you as the Founders do. I will say that I think capturing Quark is unwarranted. He is a civilian. But going back to what I was talking about, Sisko is a military officer. He was found on a Dominion planet, so capturing a soldier isn't exactly a crime when they are violating your territory, even if that soldier doesn't know it. All that said, I don't exactly begrudge the Federation response to Dominion aggression either. Starfleet, Bajor, and others did walk into the Gamma Quadrant and start colonizing like they owned the place. However, when the Dominion destroyed the colonies and captured a military officer, a show of force isn't unreasonable. The use of the Odyssey, along with an escort, to try and find the Dominion and have a conversation isn't irrational. Unfortunately, it wouldn't go well and would result in conflict. Hopefully, I'll have a cool new battle breakdown for this in the future, but we're just going to have to see how things go. The reason why this video is so short and is more just an explanation of events versus lore is because I needed a bridge. Ultimately, it all comes down to the official meeting of the Dominion and the Federation. Starfleet would do what it does, explore without concern of consequence, and when told no, at least one officer would balk at that concept, and then people would die. And then even after that, Starfleet would back down and yet somehow continue to explore, and even more people would die, and people would continue to die until a war was started 
where a lot of people would die. But we'll get more into that in the upcoming videos. When the USS Odyssey crossed through the wormhole, it was a statement, a show of force. Starfleet wanted the Dominion to know how serious they were. Unfortunately, Starfleet was also spoiling for a fight and showed just how ill-prepared, if not inept, it had become. Before we get completely into the battle breakdown proper, I think it's appropriate to discuss the Dominion's claim of owning the entire Gamma Quadrant. A lot of people seem to have issues with this, and I can understand to a degree. However, owning territory is relative. Those who say the Dominion can't own a Quadrant would likely say that Starfleet can own a Parsec, Sector, or System. If they don't think any area can be owned, then we really don't have any conversation to be had. I get that a quadrant is excessive. It's like a government saying they own a hemisphere, if not the world. It doesn't mean it isn't possible. Additionally, even if we still assume you can't own a quadrant, there is no reason to believe that the Dominion does not own the area around the wormhole. Remember, there is no solidly canon map of what the universe looks like. According to the Dominion, their side of the Bajoran wormhole is claimed. In fact, I would argue that the Dominion had more right to encroach on Bajoran and Starfleet space to reinforce its newest protectorate, Cardassia, later in the series, than Starfleet does to simply explore space right now. Starfleet admits it has no rights here. But I get it. Rar rar, Dominion bad. Starfleet good. It's okay when the heroes are hypocritical. Insert joke about political agenda bias here. All that aside, for the moment, let's assume that what the Odyssey did is an encroachment into Dominion space. I think if it is, it sends a much better message by Starfleet. The Dominion has made aggressive actions, killed people unnecessarily. There is no doubt there. So Starfleet upgrading its most powerful ship of the time and sending it into Dominion space to let them know that there will be consequences for making rash decisions that's not a bad idea. Worst case scenario, when it comes to what Starfleet was originally doing, and assuming the Dominion was defending itself, Starfleet was simply being stupid. Nothing before the Odyssey was meant as an aggressive action on the side of the Federation. The United Federation of Planets and Starfleet just wanted to explore and find new worlds. However, if the Dominion thinks it can just destroy entire colonies or Starfleet ships and that the Federation will just lay down, they've severely underestimated their enemy. We've discussed it before, but Starfleet is pacifistic at this time. They'll accept a brutal negotiated peace over a prolonged war. They'll hold one hand tied behind their back as they fight even, but they just won't let you take over. And the more you push? the less they are willing to compromise. Governments really should think twice before they push the members of Starfleet to the thin ice. So, send the Odyssey with an escort through the wormhole? Starfleet would. However, as I've alluded to, while this was possibly a good message to send, Starfleet lost itself for a while as well. The Odyssey is sent to confront the Dominion. What would make sense would be to attempt diplomatic conversations. You send a ship that can take a beating and then ask to talk. However, the Odyssey didn't do this. They went in shooting. They were spoiling for a fight. From everything we see on screen, the Odyssey doesn't even attempt negotiations. It is possible they tried it off screen and we only see the battle, but it's also possible that they encountered unicorns that told them that Discovery was in canon continuity and a part of all the series and that was kept off screen as well. So I'd be careful about how often we use that excuse. Looking at the battle itself, it's actually very impressive for a Galaxy class starship. Historically, ships of this type couldn't really take a beating. They'd only be able to take one or two hits with the shields down, and that's usually game over. However, the Odyssey takes an intense amount of pounding and is only destroyed due to a kamikaze attack. The battle starts out with the USS Odyssey and two runabouts, the USS Mekong and USS Oronoko. A third runabout, the USS Rio Grande, was not able to fight due to plot. Initially, the Odyssey would try to provide a screen so that the runabout, again the USS Rio Grande, could get away. However, the Rio Grande was diverted in an attempt to find Captain Sisko. The Odyssey and its support craft would buy the Rio Grande 10 minutes. I've alluded to it before, but this fight doesn't exactly go half bad for the Odyssey. The ship is woefully ill-prepared, true, and we'll get to that, but it does take an absolute beating. Given how much damage this thing takes, I wonder if it was given a blade of armor. They do say that the Galaxy class had had some upgrades to it. Regardless of whether it did or not, when the Jemadar ships are in range, the Odyssey's captain orders attack formation Delta. The Jemadar get the initial shots in on the Odyssey, hitting its primary hull and nacelle. Jemhadar weaponry is able to bypass the shields and the Odyssey can't adapt. The captain, rightfully, reroutes all power from shields to weapons. 
If they can't use the shields, there's no reason in keeping them up. With this new problem, the Odyssey still gives the Rio Grande five minutes. The Jemadar continue focusing on the nacelles, preventing the Odyssey from engaging warp. Both runabouts in the fight attempt to defend the Odyssey, but the Dominion ships are simply more maneuverable. The Jemadar are able to not only disable the Mekong, but they also destroy the Odyssey's weapons. The Rio Grande reports that they have Cisco and Captain Keo of the Odyssey orders to get warp drive back online and a general retreat. And, of course, the Odyssey would try to escape, and a Jemadar ship would kamikaze into it, destroying the vessel. There would be at least 900 to over 1,000 souls lost. One thing I rarely see talked about during this battle is the overall tactics. I sincerely believe that we see the Jemadar pounding at the nacelle because they always intended to destroy the Odyssey, one way or the other. In fact, you could argue that the destruction of a big target like a Galaxy class was the plan all along. We know that the Jemadar never intended to keep Sisko a prisoner, so the thought that they may be able to lure the Odyssey out to destroy it and send a message isn't out there. Perhaps one of the admirals was a changeling that ordered the Odyssey out, the whole thing being staged. Another piece that is rarely ever talked about is the crew of the Odyssey and its captain. They were heroes. They engaged the Dominion and bought enough time for Sisko to escape. When the battle was going poorly, the captain could have ordered the Rio Grande off and made their escape, but they didn't. They chose to stay and fight, and they paid for it with their lives. I truly feel that the crew of the Odyssey and its captain honored Starfleet, and truly ensured that many would remember the name Odyssey. Also, let me address something here. I have historically talked about how ill-prepared Starfleet was, how they got those people killed, how the Galaxy class couldn't stand up to what was brought before it. This confuses a lot of people. Commenters will state the obvious, that the Jem'Hadar could bypass the shields. But yeah, that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make. The weapons that the Jem'Hadar use aren't unknown to Starfleet, and Starfleet admitted they didn't like to make ships of war. It is possible that had Starfleet actually considered itself a military and built ships with that notion, this wouldn't have happened. The most powerful ship of the fleet couldn't stand up to Jim Hadar fighters. And we know that Starfleet will be able to innovate to defend against these weapons. It's not like they didn't know how. And I truly believe that part of this is due to the fact that Starfleet stopped innovating. They forgot they were a military organization. A lot of people think I'm somehow an apologist for the Dominion, being edgy to be edgy or trying to rewrite history. You know, it's really easy to judge something when you know how the story ends and you're biased towards the good guys. Up to this point, the series tries to tell us that the Dominion is evil, and that they will end all things. However, I'm judging them by what we've seen so far and no further. Is the Dominion evil? Probably. Authoritarian? Definitely. Xenophobic? You bet. But I'm doing no favors if I pretend the Federation and Starfleet haven't made mistakes. If I don't hold them to the same standards, I hold the Dominion. Starfleet botched this entire affair, from beginning to the destruction of the Odyssey and on, and their near incompetence would lead to events that would lead to events that would result in events that almost cost them the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. However, we'll get more into that next time as we take a look at the Dominion Cold War. When we consider the Dominion, it is both simultaneously an apathetic and brutal authoritarian regime. After the destruction of the USS Odyssey, the Dominion would not make many known moves against the Federation for a while. In fact, we wouldn't see the Dominion again until the Federation sent what it would claim to be its first ship of war into the Gamma Quadrant. Because nothing says respecting a government's territory like sneaking in with a ship specifically made to fight and kill those who oppose you. As has been stated, after the destruction of the USS Odyssey, there wasn't a lot that occurred. Generally, each season in DS9 is considered to be a year, so if we keep with that convention, it will be roughly a little shy of a full year since the loss of the Odyssey. However, even though it seemed like the Dominion wasn't an immediate threat, investigating what they were up to was vital. They would need to find some way to investigate who the Founders were and make contact with them. To accomplish this goal, Starfleet opted to recommission the USS Defiant, bringing it out of mothballs. This ship would be classified as a, wait for it, Defiant class vessel. And it was originally designed to defeat and kill the Borg. I've done no less than two videos on both the USS Defiant specifically and the Defiant class. I'm going to look back at those videos and determine if they withstand the test of time. And if they do, I'll simply add them to the lore series. If not, I'll redo them. Regardless, both videos are linked below. However, in this discussion, I more want to break down the idea of sending the Defiant for this envoy of peace. 
Remember, Starfleet had sent what it considered to be the most powerful ship it had available. That vessel was destroyed, something that probably shocked other Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers, if we're thinking about it. So then, Starfleet decides to send a modern ship that was designed for war. The introduction of the Defiant provides both a continuity tie-in and a continuity inconsistency. Ironically, the ship leads back to the next generation, where they discuss creating vessels and new weapons to fight the Borg that weren't ready at the time. But it's inconsistent in that Starfleet did have ships of war. Anyone who says that Starfleet didn't hasn't watched Undiscovered Country. They quite clearly discuss the dismantling of the battle fleet while exploration and scientific divisions would remain in place. This, leading to its very logical conclusion, would mean that Starfleet had ships of war. You can even see it reflected in the original series television show. It could be argued that these ships may have been more akin to that of olden times, where governments would have naval battleships that did double duty, but they were battleships. That said, I do know what the writers were going for. At this point, Deep Space Nine was still keeping with the TNG retcon that Starfleet was never really a military power. This given most likely that you had a new generation that grew up with TNG and not the original series. I can really see why they would do this. But that aside, the more interesting piece is the idea that Starfleet would send a cloaked warship into Dominion space. To talk. To get it out of the way, this would have been an excellent time to utilize the Phase Cloak as a top secret option versus the Romulan Star Empire's tech. That way, there wouldn't be guys like me that are going to rip this to shreds in future videos, and I wouldn't have to note about anything, and I would just go so crazy with how they kept continuity together. It would help especially when I discussed the Romulan Star Empire and their quote-unquote alliance with the Dominion, or at least non-aggression treaty. Though, to be fair, I have an interesting conspiracy theory on why they would have a Romulan Star Empire cloak and the Romulans not care. We'll talk about that a little later. Let's consider the original premise, though. They are taking the Defiant, cloaked, into Dominion space to locate the Founders. From the Dominion standpoint, after the destruction and removal of all Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers from the Gamma Quadrant, they now become aware of alliances between the Alpha and Beta powers. The Romulans, hostile at best with the Federation, are now providing a government they consider an enemy? Cloaking devices. And this enemy is using that tech to get into Dominion territory without detection. This presents a very clear and present danger, if not a justification for why the belief that the Alpha and Beta Quadrants should be conquered. Additionally, Starfleet is specifically bribing member states of the Dominion in order to find the Founders. They get information from a client state, hack Dominion technology, and make for the coordinates of the Dominion's power base. If we reversed this situation, it would be considered a vast conspiracy. If the Cardassian Union were trying to buy off Beta Z to get vital information on Starfleet and Federation assets, and then use information gained to hack and gain coordinates from an unmanned Starfleet satellite, this would be something that would be required to be stopped. It would be a huge deal. But because it's the Dominion on the receiving end, that's okay, apparently. I bring up this incursion to really point out one thing. As I've been presenting this, it's been painting a very bad picture of the Federation. I have noticed that there has been some scoffing at future writing when the Romulans and other powers decide to ally with the Dominion. But if you consider how everything right now looks, being allies with the Dominion, or at least not fighting the Dominion, seems like a good idea. The Dominion propaganda machine would be pumping out this information far and wide. Starfleet definitively looks like the aggressor here, but I think there's possibly more to this. Starfleet, and indeed the Federation, are acting wildly out of character. Generally, they would send peace envoys, ambassadors, not ships of war. We'll discuss my thoughts and more on how this all could have been a Dominion ploy after this. So after all of these discussions of Starfleet's intrusion into Dominion space and only deepening what would become the Dominion Cold War, there are a couple of questions that are left. First, as has been noted, these interactions are wholly inconsistent with the modus operandi of the Federation and Starfleet. Now, it could be that the Admiralty are running scared, to quote Cisco, desperate times, desperate measures. But the Romulans giving cloaking technology to Starfleet is insanely unlikely, even at this point. The Romulans covet their technology, and this would have been something thought unthinkable. However, we do know that the Dominion would already have its tendrils within the Romulan Star Empire and the Cardassian Union at this point. So, what if it's the case that the Dominion's influence within the Federation and the Romulan Star Empire pushed all of this? 
That changelings ensured that an agreement would be brokered between the Star Empire and Starfleet to give a cloaking device. Then the changelings pushed for the recommissioning of a warship and the Defiant would enter into Dominion territory. The Defiant would then be captured and this would allow the Dominion to not only test the crew of the Defiant to see if they'd be willing for a takeover, but to study and analyze the technology of Starfleet. Remember, the Dominion did have the USS Defiant for an extended period of time. They know all of its secrets. This would allow them to get a real good look at what Starfleet thought would be a good match against their technology. The only real hiccup was that when the founders decided to let them go due to Odo's request, though they would still have all of the information that they had garnered. Additionally, the Tal Shiar, realizing that they had been tricked and that the Federation now had a cloaking device, might have decided to classify and kill off anyone that was involved in those negotiations. This would explain the disappearance of the Romulan officer and how the Romulans never brought it up, because officially, they never gave a cloak to Starfleet. All of this is of course theory, but that's my best take on how the operations got off the ground and why it's never brought up again. So with that out of the way, we'll discuss the felled attack on the Dominion homeworld and a Starfleet that will stand back and allow genocide to happen to ensure they survive. And you thought Discovery lacked morals. It's a shame that early episodes of Deep Space Nine with the Dominion paint the Federation, and Starfleet specifically, into such a negative light. Many think, due to recent series, that I'm against the Federation and even Starfleet. I'm actually not. I've been a huge fan, but the fact is, Starfleet in the early years when dealing with the Dominion has either been egotistical, aggressive, or in this case, apathetic to the genocide of an entire people. A travesty of this series is that it is focused solely on the Dominion War and any subplots within the war specifically. The DS9 episodes that I will be discussing include Improbable Cause and The Die is Cast. There are wonderful subplots that accompany these episodes not related to the Dominion War that are worth discussing at a later point and definitely worth watching. We just won't be covering them here. In the two episodes, the bulk of the conversation will be centered around the attempt to destroy the Dominion homeworld by the Romulan Tal Shiar and Cardassian Obsidian Order. Long story short, the Tal Shiar and Obsidian Order combine their efforts and take a cloaked fleet into the Gamma Quadrant. It's funny how the Romulans, who coveted their technology and would die before it fell into enemy hands, was giving it out like candy by this time. Interestingly, both fleets would send messages back to their respective governments, which claim that they are acting independently and not working for either of those governments. I say this is interesting because it feels like an incredibly stupid idea. By sending a message back, you are giving a heads up to the Dominion. You could say that these messages were sent in secret, but the dialogue indicate that both governments have given public denials and disavowalment of the action. Also, if Starfleet intercepted it, I really have trouble believing the Dominion agents wouldn't be able to as well. I would think that this would put the Dominion on high alert and possibly could have a preemptive attack occur before the fleets get to their destination. Now obviously we know all of this is orchestrated by the Dominion, but the bulk of the fleet doesn't know that, and neither do we, so no one considered this as a bad idea? At least to send the messages? I was also pretty startled by the response of Starfleet. Ultimately, the Admiralty decided to sit back and just let it happen. Starfleet assets on DS9 are ordered to protect Bajor in Deep Space Nine. Beyond that, they just need to see what happens. The thought is that the genocide would end a Dominion War pretty decisively. I obviously have issues with this decision by the military arm of the Federation. Not because I think it's necessarily a bad idea, but because I don't think Starfleet would do it. Many people forget that through the first three or four seasons of DS9, we are still dealing with the Starfleet of the Next Generation era. In fact, we even see Sisko discuss how a negotiated peace is better than a war with Eddington when they are discussing the Maquis and what they should have done with the Cardassians. This action, to sit back and allow genocide, is so far away from what Starfleet would do at this point in time, it's mind-boggling. Picard would never sit back and let this happen, and most other captains wouldn't either. So how do I think they should react? Well, it's pretty easy. The Admiralty, or at least Captain Sisko, would alert the Dominion and send ships to stop the Romulans and Cardassians. 
even if it meant the Dominion might defeat them in the Alpha Quadrant at a later point. Starfleet is supposed to be an ideal. They aren't like the pragmatic 21st century beings that we see today. These are evolved humans, and we have seen time and again where Starfleet would willingly let people die to uphold this sense of morality. Do I personally agree with this sense of morality? Do I think that they should be doing this? Personally, no. I'm more pragmatic, but it's looking at how Starfleet would act in-universe, what's actually supposed to be happening. However, there's a chance that all of this may have been pre-planned. Land. Starfleet's actions could also be explained away by Section 31, but more on that later. So pushing Section 31 aside for a second, I've discussed how it is possible that the Federation would have been manipulated by the Changelings. This would be similar to how the Romulans and Cardassians were manipulated in this affair. That the sit back and watch attitude was more orchestrated by Changelings. So with that in mind, it's possible that it isn't so egregious if we assume that either Section 31 or Changelings were manipulating Starfleet. I'll also say this, my honest to god major issue is with the DS9 crew, that they never pushed back at this order. A way to have saved the episode, or at least the heart of the Federation in my opinion, is to make one quick change. When told that they are to sit back and do nothing, Instead of having Sisko being indignant and ordering the Defiant to go back to the Gamma Quadrant to save Odo, I would have actually had him disobey orders in an attempt to stop the attack. This would be very Federation, as I've discussed. Captain Sisko asks for volunteers, state that there is a good chance people will die and that everyone will be court-martialed, but that all of this is worth preventing a war and trying to maintain a peace with the Dominion. Then have everything happen like it did before, even with them saving Odo. But that's just my opinion on the change. What are your thoughts? Continuing on with the episode itself, the combined Romulan and Cardassian fleet assault the Dominion homeworld. Surprise, surprise, there's no one on it. It's been evacuated. Interestingly, every resource I've found states that this planet was the true homeworld of the Changelings. Personally, I always thought this planet was never actually their homeworld, but simply was used as a guise to trick the Alpha Quadrant powers. If the Dominion had always intended to let Sisko escape in previous episodes, like we know they did, then they could have pretended that this planet was their homeworld when it was actually just an outpost. Also, when they led Odo to believe that it was also the homeworld, it wouldn't be the first time that they lied to him. Now, I understand that some will say that Odo wanted to return to the nebula, but once more, this could be a precaution. After all, you might have some that have the ideas of Odo that want to help the solids. So not giving them the homeworld when they're sent out isn't exactly a bad idea. Again, all just speculation, but it's a thought. As I've discussed, the Romulans and Cardassian forces assault the planet only to find that it has been abandoned. The fleet is then ambushed in a surprise attack by the Dominion forces and destroyed. This would mean the destruction of the Obsidian Order and crippling of the Tal Shiar. The entire affair, as I've noted, was a Dominion trick all along. This had devastating consequences. Without the Obsidian Order, a more powerful government by Cardassian citizens would rise up on Cardassia. Ultimately, this would lead to the Klingon infiltrator pushing for war and chasing the Cardassians into the loving arms of the Dominion. The Romulans, reeling from such a loss, would take a step back and begin peace talks with the Dominion. However, there was an unintended consequence. By crippling the Tal Shiar, Starfleet Intelligence would be able to infiltrate the organization, not only within the organization itself, but placing a mole in charge of it. Starfleet would then place this Romulan traitor in a seat of power to ensure the Romulans would never leave the war, and probably for other endeavors. Here's a thought. What if Section 31 was working in the background as well, that the Dominion was being helped by an ally they had no idea was helping them? Certainly, Section 31 might have seen the advantages of a destroyed Obsidian Order and weakened Tal Shiar. It would definitely explain why the Federation was apathetic and why nothing was ever done. Again, it really makes sense. Section 31 knows that this will probably fail and push for it as well as hold back the Federation. This would allow them to be basically the uncontested Black Ops of the Alpha Quadrant. The last piece I want to discuss is, well, how this makes the Dominion look. I know this is going to make a lot of people mad, but consider, publicly the Dominion has yet to make any move into the Alpha Quadrant. They've had Starfleet incursions, Starfleet ships of war sent in, and an attempt to destroy the Changelings by the Romulans and Cardassians. Yet, the Dominion doesn't publicly respond at all. They are showing amazing restraint. Publicly, there is no reason not to be on the side of the Dominion at this moment. The Alpha Quadrant appears to be every bit as war-hungry as they are feared to be. 
And while we know that they are working in the background with changelings and infiltrators, we really can't blame it all on that. These people, these infiltrators, nudge here and there, but ultimately, the empires, the federation, all of them are doing what they do. Others could stand up against the admirals, they could stand up against the Tal Shiar, against the Obsidian Order, but they opt not to. At this point, I think that the Alpha Quadrant is making quite the case for why they cannot be trusted and why they must be oppressed, but all of that is due to change in the near future. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, or so Edmund Burke would have you believe. I often wonder if we shouldn't attribute this saying to the Federation, at least during the Dominion Cold War. Unlike other videos in the series, this will be a more freeform discussion than one based on any specific episode. The reason I've decided to go this route is because there is a consistent theme being brought up in my previous videos that I've done. That is to say, people are discussing how awesome Starfleet is and how biased the previous videos have been against Starfleet and for the Dominion. I'm being called edgy for edgy's sake or a product of the current times and just wanting a dystopia. Honestly, when people first started saying this, it caught me by surprise as I was basically just doing the series following the war. I wasn't including what was in the future, just looking at what we knew now and what was possibly going on in the background but hadn't been confirmed. Honestly, my most consistent message has been something that I got from Dickens. I've been describing events and episodes as they've happened, that they are what they are, do not blame me. But by breaking it down this way and doing so, I had unintentionally showed the weaknesses of Starfleet and the Federation, as well as the Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers. The truth is, while the Dominion is definitively menacing, we don't have any real evidence to show them as the aggressors. The worst thing that they've done is use their military to destroy colonies that they claim were in their space. While this is definitely horrendous, it's not exactly unjustifiable to want the removal of something you claim to be in your territory. Some have tried to argue that these colonies may have not been in their space. After all, Starfleet had been there for years coming out of the wormhole before they showed up, but we have no way to know. Starfleet nor the Federation never followed up with the Dominion, never clarified where their borders were. They just accepted it, and yet we're not supposed to. The Dominion could have done things to negate this, they could have put up buoys or had ships there. I'm not saying that the Dominion isn't sketchy on this. I'm just saying that they're never challenged. And because of that, we do have to give some benefit of the doubt. And anything else that people bring up that the Dominion did is a reaction. The Odyssey was destroyed when they attempted to free a prisoner in Dominion space. The destruction of the Cardassian and Romulan fleet was because that fleet wanted to kill the Changelings. That's by definition an act of war. And as I've stated, we know in the background that there were Changeling infiltrators that pushed this, but honestly, there were tons of officers, tons of admirals, tons of soldiers that could have stepped up and said no, but they went along with it. And Starfleet is acting so out of character that in my opinion, it only makes sense to have ideas or thoughts of Changeling involvement or a conspiracy theory around Section 31's inclusion. And while I do find it likely that Changelings have already infiltrated Starfleet, or Section 31 has something to do with it, we never see it on screen. Which leaves a lot of open questions for Starfleet itself. I suppose what is most disturbing, to me at least, is that even if we assume that Section 31 or the Changelings had a hand in it, so many people would stand by what they decided to do. The DS9 crew, the crew of the Enterprise, thousands to tens of thousands of officers who could, at some point, have seen what was happening and moved to stop it. If we take a look at Discovery, and it's okay guys, Discovery had some things that they did well. If we look at their argument that perhaps these Starfleet officers didn't know that so many orders would be given that they couldn't understand where or how it's coming from, and certainly this would be supported from the TNG episode Conspiracy, then what does it say about Starfleet if they can't detect when they're being manipulated? And given that we see it in Discovery, we see it in The Next Generation, we see it in Deep Space Nine, is this somehow by design at some level? Now I'm being pretty hard on Starfleet, but this does leave out some key factors. The Maquis were becoming more of an issue, the Borg had obliterated a fleet like it was nothing, and the Romulans had been an ever-encroaching threat. Was Starfleet just paralyzed in a universe where it was realizing other players didn't follow by their rules? The only counter to that is that we know that the Starfleet of the original series lived in the same circumstances, but the current one couldn't handle it? Had Starfleet, had the Federation become so soft? The next few videos will be discussing the Maquis, Klingon Cardassian War, Klingon Federation War, and Changeling Infiltrators. This is definitively where the Dominion shows their stripes, where they go to being definitely evil. But here's my question. 
What if the Dominion had attacked and started the war right now, right where I've stopped in the series? Would they have been justified? This video was more a question, more me challenging you and wanting your thoughts on it. I really think it would have been a more interesting story had they attacked at this point because I don't think the Dominion were necessarily the aggressors. But I'm going to leave that question up to you guys to let me know where I'm wrong. I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded. As we discussed, had the Dominion declared war on at least the Cardassians and Romulans, we could have arguably discussed that it would have been justified, even with changeling infiltration. However, let's go ahead and break down the day the Dominion finally became Manifest Evil. When investigating the Dominion Cold War, we'll be analyzing the Deep Space Nine episode, The Adversary. I'm not going to be doing a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown of the episode specifically, but more a deconstruction of the events and its impact. It begins with Commander Sisko finally being promoted to captain. During the ceremony, an ambassador arrives and advises him that there has been a coup on the Zenkithi homeworld. The captain is advised that the Defiant is ordered to patrol the border as a show of strength. Naturally, Sisko justifies Starfleet's decision to promote him by verifying with command the orders of the Defiant. Verifies there is actually unrest on Zinkethi. Questions why an ambassador is giving an order and not an admiral. Questions the situation overall in any way. Or he just goes along with it. Charming. When the Defiant is underway, surprise, surprise, it is discovered that the Ambassador is a Changeling Infiltrator. The Changeling is able to commandeer the Defiant, and then orders the Defiant to go to the Zinkethi homeworld for an attack to ultimately plunge the Federation into a war with their former enemy. The crew would be able to regain control of the ship and stop the Dominion Infiltrator, but not before the Changeling left them with one message. To be succinct, the ominous message was, it's too late, we're everywhere. When I researched DS9's The Adversary and then the follow-up two-parter Way of the Warrior, I can't help but be reminded of the domino scene in V for Vendetta. If I had the time, I would perfectly recreate that moment where you would have a detective talking, they would discuss the attack on the Changeling homeworld, the attempt to plunge the Federation into a war with the Zenkethi, the outrage we see with the Klingons as they push around Odo and Garrick, the concern of the Federation crew, the civil strife, and then the domino scene intercut with the violence that we see. As I stated, we know that the citizens of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants themselves are becoming nervous. They are beginning to turn on each other. When we look at the governments, it gets much, much worse. Cardassia has shut down its borders, not allowing anyone in or out. With the destruction of the Obsidian Order, there are rumors of a coup d'etat that threatens to overthrow the entirety of the Cardassian Union. While we don't see it right now, we know in the background factions and battlegrounds are beginning to form within Starfleet. There are personnel that believe a military government must be installed in order to combat the Dominion threat. That democracy has its place, but that place is not right now. The Romulans are doing what they always do when they lose a major battle, withdrawing to their borders, becoming more elusive. And with the Klingons, with everything that has now occurred and the fear that runs through the Empire, the Klingons have started reverting back to a time when they were little more than bullies, like we see in the original series. And really, the damning thing is that as far as we know, there are two confirmed changelings for sure, and possibly a third, that has caused a lot of this. Remember, it is theorized that the dissident movement in Cardassia is so successful due to changelings, that the civilian council, the ones that will be in charge, are in fact changelings themselves. This is never disproven either, even after they are tested. Remember, the changeling infiltrator Martok passed the test and appeared to bleed in front of Sisko and Kuro. And looking at the confirmed changelings, we do have the changeling Martok and the confirmed ambassador. This throws the Alpha and Beta Quadrant into complete disarray. All of this would come to a head when a fleet of ships by the Klingon Empire decloaks right outside of Deep Space Nine. Almost instantly, the Klingons, again under the changeling Martok, would begin to make trouble, insulting Odo and eventually assaulting a Cardassian citizen, Garrick. Though to be fair, the Klingons would lose this battle as his superior wit would insult their ego so bad that the Klingons would never be seen again. So score one for the defunct Obsidian Order. The Federation would determine that the Klingons had decided that the Cardassians were now under the control of the Dominion and that the Empire had planned a preemptive attack. The Federation, and indeed Starfleet, would not condone this action and Chancellor Galron would expel all Federation citizens withdraw his diplomats, and the Klingon Empire would pull out of the Kittimer Accords. The fleet would then make for Cardassia, and the Federation would have a choice. Help the Cardassians and face possible war, or do nothing and become a possible target. Stay tuned, as these videos are about to get a lot longer and a lot more in-depth as we look at the prelude, genesis, and ultimate breakdown of the Klingon-Cardassian War. 
In this series, many have stated that I hate Starfleet or that I'm trying to be an edgy boy. The truth is, I look at Starfleet the way it was presented to me by Picard in The Next Generation. I see it in Anton Mount's Pike, and I see it in Cisco. Well, Cisco generally. Starfleet is a promise. It's what we should all strive to be. The best you that you can be. Making hard decisions, but the moral ones. It's defending someone when you know you will lose, but doing it because that's what you do. Your Starfleet. Honestly, I'm looking forward to this breakdown because I think it epitomizes what I feel Starfleet should be. Let's take a look at the first battle of Deep Space Nine. Before we get into the battle proper, a look at the preparations is necessary. First, the dialogue indicates that O'Brien is thankful that the station was upgraded due to the Dominion threat. It would give them a fighting chance against the Klingons. My question is, if there was such a threat from the Dominion, why don't they at least have a small task force of ships also surrounding the station? You're telling me that Starfleet was so worried that it completely refit a space station, but didn't leave any other vessels around it? I guess they hoped that the Dominion wouldn't just bypass Deep Space Nine. I mean, I know the station is next to the wormhole, but they can only hit so many vessels before the rest would get by. Even taking moderate damage, a Dominion fleet could bypass the station and cause massive havoc. And I know there are some of those who would say, well, they just couldn't afford the CGI budget, stop being so nitpicking, but there are ways you can write a task force in and not show them. Even a few lines of dialogue explaining why the defense fleet couldn't be there would make all the difference. Something like, Sir, will we have the picket ships with us? No, they are pulling back to the planet as a contingent of Klingon ships are engaging in a direct assault of Bajor. It's not perfect dialogue, I'll grant, but it does get the job done. Regardless, Starfleet would continue to not station vessels around one of the most critical beachheads it has. But again, it would still be considered so important that they would outfit it with Starfleet security personnel and presumably Starfleet defensive equipment. Looking at the prelude to the war, it begins with the Defiant having saved the Datapa Council, the ruling body of Cardassia, from the Klingons. Check the last episode for a breakdown of that affair. This of course being an act of war against the Klingons, the Defiant would be chased by Klingon vessels all the way to Deep Space Nine. Once on board the station, Sisko would order battle stations and the Klingon fleet would be set to advance. The first battle of Deep Space Nine would take a large toll on both sides. Unfortunately, we don't see the preparations for the Klingons, but we do see some for Deep Space Nine. The station is, of course, as noted, at battle stations, and remaining civilians and non-essential personnel are locked into rooms behind a reinforced door that has force fields and guards. While this seems like a good idea, if the power goes out and the doors can't be opened, it would make it pretty hard to get to escape pods. That said, I don't think this is a bad idea necessarily, just a concern if I was on the other side of the door that had to be unlocked. Guards are being posted at critical positions and Odo wants to put a security detail at medbay. Bashir declines because he states that he doesn't want to firefight while trying to heal people. I suppose the doctor just wants the sick and injured to have no defense and be slaughtered. Because that's the only reason not to have security stationed at that area. Klingons look at the infirmed as a detriment and think it's dishonorable for them to be in their beds. They think they are doing a favor to the sick if they kill them. The people die like warriors. Also, medbay is critical to winning this battle. If you don't have medical personnel, you're going to likely lose the battle overall. But at least he seems like a true hero in the clip that he says it. I mean, screw impacts to the rest of the crew, am I right? Interestingly, the defense of the Datapa Council would involve at least two security officers, because that's how important, I guess, Starfleet treats them, Garrick and Dukat. I guess that the room that the Council is in somehow prevents transporters from working, or perhaps they are using scramblers. Later, it would seem like the Klingons have to go through a hallway just to get to them. So... I guess they're protected. I do wonder why this technology or bulkhead reinforcement isn't used in operations, med bays, or other critical areas, I guess we'll never know. Plot armor is funny that way. Speaking of operations, personal handheld weapons are being distributed, and during this time, the head ship of the Klingon Defense Force, the Negvar, hails the station. The conversation is brief. Sisko tells Martok, not knowing he's a changeling infiltrator, that the Tatapa Council has been tested and are not changelings. It's actually Galron that steps up from behind him, stating it doesn't matter, that the Alpha Quadrant would be safer if the Cardassians were removed. This is where the Klingons firmly become the bad guys. There is no reason to push into Cardassia if you don't believe the Founders have co-opted them. And if you want to have a bulkhead between the Alpha Quadrant and the Dominion, then why don't you attack Bajor? I get that it would be an attack on Starfleet, but we know how the Federation will operate. The Klingons take Bajor, and the Federation Council will probably be years before they have a resolution or move to take it back. And it's not like, you know, they aren't about to attack Starfleet right now, and guess what the Federation does? Jack all about it in the future. 
But back to the battle specifically, Sisko warns that they have prepared and the station has 5,000 photon torpedoes. Galron does pause at this, but Martok says that it's a trick. This is a fun piece of continuity. Martok states that the crew of DS9 are projecting Thoron fields and Duranium shadows. This is a callback when they actually did that to try to trick the Cardassians. Didn't work out well for Starfleet in that instance either. Galron then speaks in Klingon, and apparently the Universal Translators know when it would be more impactful for the story for them not to translate, since, assumedly, everyone is speaking their own language anyway. Unless you're telling me the Klingon Empire speaks Federation Standard, which is apparently English, but anyway. Galron states that it is a good day to die, and now we're off to the races. Let me pause a moment to say that this is Starfleet to me. Sisko is risking the lives of himself, his crew, and civilians to protect people that can't defend themselves. The reason why I am so critical of Starfleet generally is because they have set this standard. This is what Starfleet is supposed to be. This is what TNG, early DS9, hell, the original series tells me what Starfleet officers do. And when they meet this standard, they do it in spades. This battle is one of the most heroic actions of Starfleet in my opinion. Not because it's Cisco or DS9, but because it's what Starfleet is. This is the promise that Anton Mount's Pike talks about. So I'll briefly be going over the fleet strengths. However, I won't be doing a complete analysis of each individual ship like I've done in previous iterations. I will include the links to the individual ship breakdowns as well as my complete Star Trek ship breakdown playlist in the links below. If you want a complete overview of any of the bases mentioned or ships, take a look there. Starfleet and Bajoran assets include the upgraded Deep Space Nine, Cardassian Nor type. The base can hold anywhere from 300 to 2,000 officers. It was completely crewed and had both Bajoran and security personnel that we know of. In theory, they would also have a Defiant-class starship that had received moderate to critical damage before this battle. We can't be sure if the Defiant was used or not. We know that it docked before the battle, but looking at the battle footage, the Defiant-class is not seen doctor otherwise. It is possible that due to the extent of what had happened to it, the vessel was not able to fight. It could also be we don't see it because it was in the midst of combat. Given that there was no dialogue about the updates of the Defiant in the battle, it's probably a safe bet that the ship was down due to repairs. Starfleet reinforcements that were on the way consist of a Galaxy class, two Excelsior class, one Miranda class, and two other of unknown type. The Klingons would fill at least 52 ships. This includes a Negvar class, six Vorcha, 11 Katinga class, and 34 Birds of Prey. Looking at the tactics, with Deep Space Nine being a stationary target and no other ships that are confirmed fighting, Klingon forces would quickly move to surround the station and begin firing disruptors. We also see Birds of Prey firing disruptors off in the distance at nothing. It doesn't appear that they are firing on Deep Space Nine. It's possible they are chasing the Defiant, though to be fair, looking at the future damage the station will be inflicting, if I were in a scout class bird of prey, I'd be reticent to attack it too. Captain Sisko orders to hold fire until the fleet has surrounded them and it was at point blank range of the starbase. The station then fired even numbered launchers, followed by odd numbered launchers, and then of course the phasers. Eight ships, or 15% of the known Klingon fleet, would be destroyed in the first volley. Sisko attempts to contact Gowron, who would ignore his communications. With the Klingons not responding to Hells, the station begins firing at will. A further three more ships, at least two of them cruisers, would be destroyed. This would mean the station has destroyed at least 21% of known Klingon assets, and those assets have yet to have any substantial damage to Deep Space Nine. Sustaining such heavy casualties would force the Negvar and at least two Vorcha-class vessels to target DS9's shield generators, bringing two down. This would allow the Klingons to bring boarding parties onto Deep Space Nine. Though a quick note here, if the Klingons were boarding, why didn't DS9 begin targeting ships that had their shields down? While ops would be overrun true, the systems were automatically targeting the fleet. Additionally, neither side decided to start beaming on photon torpedoes or even weapons that would simply take out the crew. Regardless, as we discussed, Klingons began beaming aboard ops in other areas. This being Starfleet, there would be no guards prepared for such an eventuality, requiring the bridge crew to fight the Klingons off themselves. The battle for ops would be brutal, with over a dozen Klingons beaming aboard. The bridge crew would fire on the Klingons before they could even react. Klingon tactics would be so bad that they would be stupid enough to beam in the exact same spot and the exact same two Klingons that looked exactly alike would be hit. Which is crazy when you think about it. I mean, it was done in such a way that it seems like that these were the exact same Klingons that got fired on twice. So did a ship like have only twins and they decided to send both twins at different times and then the Starfleet Federation crew decided to fire on those twins? 
But regardless of the stories of the twin Klingon ship we'll never know of, Ops would ultimately be secured with 23 Klingons subdued. Though, I now have to agree with the Klingon who was caught in the Tarsus trial. Apparently Klingon blood is made of water, given that some of the Klingons are taken out simply by being kicked. And some of them would even take notes from the guards who were protecting Snoke, not fighting until the heroes are ready, staying back when they're watching a fight happen because that just wouldn't be sporting. We don't see all of the battle on the rest of the station, but we do know that the Klingons attack the Promenade, Habitat Ring, and Lower Pylon 3 which makes a lot more sense than main engineering, weapons control, and other vital areas. Logic. It does appear that the battle happens on both levels of the promenade, with Bajoran and Starfleet forces holding the Klingons at bay. We see the previous Starfleet officers dead, and now just Dukat and Garrick holding the line as Klingons run through a hallway to try to get to the Datapa Council. After Ops is secured and the Klingons contained, the shields are restored. More Klingon reinforcements are coming, but sensors detect that the Federation task force is only 15 minutes away and closer than the Klingon reinforcements. While Galron does try to intimidate Sisko, Sisko points out that the shields can hold for an additional 15 minutes, even though technically they dropped in the first four of the battle when it began, but we'll ignore that. And that the Starfleet reinforcements will arrive sooner, as I've noted. Worf also speaks up and states the proverb given by Kalis, verbatim Worf states, destroying an empire to win a war is no victory. And Galron ends it with an ending a battle to save an empire is no defeat. Personally, I want to know what the hell kind of situation was Kalis in. This is oddly specific, almost as if written for this situation. The Changeling Martok would try to convince Galron to push the fight, which again makes sense, but Galron pulls back anyway, stating that the Federation and Klingons would no longer be allies and the Klingons won't forget what happened here. Now, a few people have been puzzled at why the Klingons would back off. At the moment, the Klingon Defense Force still has around 47 vessels against the weakened Nor type station, and Starfleet would only fill six more vessels when the reinforcements got there. However, the first counter to that is that even if Galron expected to win this battle, he knew he would lose a war with the Dominion if he continued on. Additionally, while I make no secret that I think the Galaxy class is far weaker than it should be, that doesn't mean that it still can't be a beast. We also know that Starfleet had started retrofitting its fleet, so it's very likely this was closer to a Dominion War variant Galaxy class than a TNG era one. Also, in yesterday's Enterprise, that Galaxy class can take on three Bird of Prey cruisers on its own, and that's when it's pulling its punches. Excelsior Miranda class vessels aren't exactly pushovers either, even if we see Miranda's destroyed in spades in the Dominion War. Deep Space Nine reduced the fleet by 21%, even with it damaged and a 5 to 1 advantage, the Klingon fleet would take massive casualties before they are able to defeat Starfleet and Bajoran assets. And now, they wouldn't just be dealing with a stationary object, but actual vessels that could move. Not even looking at the potential of the Dominion, this isn't a battle I think the Klingons wanted to fight if they wanted to continue to operate in that part of the Alpha Quadrant. As noted, Galron would move his forces off and the Starfleet Task Force would move in. And I'm sure from now on there would always be more than just the Defiant stationed at Deep Space Nine, Starfleet realizing how vulnerable this strategic location is. As noted, the Klingons would reinforce their troops in areas previously owned by the Cardassians, but stop forward advancement into the territory for now. After this battle, it would be only the start of the problems for the Alpha Quadrant. Stay tuned as we see how the Dominion all but destroys them before one Jim Hadar ever set foot on Cardassian territory. In the next generation, we are told about how superior humanity has become. The evolved human that is above death, above malice. All of the negative aspects of humanity, for the most part, has been bred out of those who live in this century. However, is that really true? Because the more I analyze Starfleet and their actions, I have to ask, are they the baddies? Something that I consistently see in my comments is people complaining that I portray Starfleet inaccurately. I've stated it before, but I'm simply doing a logical breakdown on the events as they occur. Not telling a story as if Picard has mounted me and wants me to sing him sweet nothings, as some appear they want me to tell the story. My two major series right now include The Dominion War and Romulan Lore. In these two, I break down the events as they occur in the timeline. This doesn't take into account future actions. It's with what is presented at the time. Now, if there are machinations in the background, behind the scenes, I do address that certainly, but if it hasn't happened yet, it's not discussed. And the analysis of the early years of these interactions on Starfleet's side is quite simple. Starfleet was either the aggressor or they were stupid. The fact is, Starfleet has never really been squeaky clean. The officers have never actually been solidly the good guys. When you look at Starfleet, 
and the citizens of the Federation, they've historically been valuable. We see this in every series. In fact, in the original series, we have racist characters, a main hero wanting war because he simply can't stand those who need his help. These people feel real, they, they are real, they make mistakes. Deep Space Nine is well renowned for pushing the envelope in this regard. You have the main hero bombing a planet that can't defend itself to catch one man, Starfleet sending warships to smuggle Federation contraband, and the character known to be the Everyman, the one who we are supposed to identify with most, coming near to committing suicide. And that's not even to bring up the senator that is murdered to bring an entire government into a war that they wouldn't have entered into as of yet. Voyager broke these rules in spades, trading Federation technology, suspending the Prime Directive, and more. Though I would argue Voyager should be considered an outlier given the circumstances, but still, it goes against the narrative that was laid down. We'll discuss how we got to a mentality where Starfleet could do no wrong after this. So where did this sense of superiority about Starfleet come from? All of this can really be tracked back to the next generation specifically its early years. Most of the mentality is centered around the first two seasons when Gene Roddenberry had almost complete control. Also the worst seasons of the next generation. Just saying. Ironically, this is one of the reasons I am exceptionally hard on Starfleet as an organization. When I was a kid, I started out watching TNG. I'd watched most of the entire series when DS9 came out and I was excited to see DS9 because of what happened in TNG. I also don't disagree that it's a nice sentiment, something to strive for. However, if you're going to set a standard and then not meet it, it's not my fault that I call you out on it. Don't hate the player, hate the game. I also think it's worth noting that the universe in which the Federation and Starfleet exist simply won't allow them to be straight-laced. In a universe with the Borg, the Cardassians, the Romulans, the Dominion, you don't have the luxury of being a superior human. It may seem nice to believe that there are people who will always be above reproach, but that simply can't exist in the real world. You know, it really is a nice breakdown between Bashir and Sloane. Bashir wanting to be the superior Starfleet and Sloane accepting the truth of the matter. Though ironically, I think Bashir comes to Sloane's way of thinking in some instances. We all have our price. That brings up another good discussion. The point of each series is to create a good story that people will watch. Star Trek creators are in it for the money partially, let's not forget. A part of writing a good story is crafting characters that humans can relate to. And we relate to drama. Unfortunately, the 21st human can't relate to what Gene Roddenberry thought should be our future. If you watch someone that has little to no flaws, you don't relate and you don't enjoy it. So with that in mind, when you look at the writing that draws in audiences, the world that Starfleet resides in, and every series with the exception of early TNG, can Starfleet be the bad guys? Can they be evil? Maybe. It's all in your perspective. In the original series, the United Federation of Planets was a regional power, moving into a superpower. They had to make moves, both diplomatically and militarily, to survive. Did Starfleet try peace first? Well, yeah, of course. Would they take chances, even if it placed them at a disadvantage, if it meant that they could get peace? Generally, yes. Would they make stupid moves resulting in the deaths of thousands? Never. Not without repercussion. The Starfleet of Kirk's time was a military that wanted peace, but wasn't afraid to utilize a massive stick. Sometimes this meant doing things that made you look like the bad guy. That all changed in the next generation and early seasons of Deep Space Nine. Starfleet was now a superpower and held back far more than they should have. They held back, even if it meant Starfleet losses and Federation citizen deaths. This Starfleet was supposed to be evolved, squeaky clean. It is because of the propaganda piece that when I talk about all of the Starfleet missteps in the Romulan and Dominion series, people get completely out of sorts. Even TNG's Starfleet would be aggressive, they would make mistakes. So it's unfortunate that this small piece of lore impacts such a larger mythos, and perhaps has changed entire opinions. I don't think Starfleet could ever be what Picard says they are in Season 1 or Season 2, even if we discount everything else. In the end, do I think Starfleet is evil? No. I think they're acting human. During the Romulan escalation, Starfleet was dealing with an entity that had an insane advantage and technology that was on par with their own. The Starfleet had no interest in a fight, but they couldn't allow the Star Empire to gain anything either. They were doing the best they could with the ideals that they had. During the Dominion Cold War, Starfleet had finally bumped up against an entity that was diplomatically and militarily as powerful as they were. The admirals and captains of a pre-Dominion era weren't accustomed to dealing with a threat that can match them in every way. So why does this keep coming up? Why do we keep having this conversation? I think we let a few seasons of both TNG and DS9 make us think Starfleet is something that it simply wasn't. And honestly, when we break it down, you don't have to be perfect to be the good guys. You can make missteps, you can be aggressive, you can make wrong calls, and overall, still be what the universe needs.
But those are my thoughts. What are yours? As I have discussed previously, the Dominion was very effective in creating fear within the Alpha Quadrant. They were efficient in inspiring movement based on this fear. The governments of the Alpha Quadrant made stupid mistakes in response to a yet unrealized threat. With the Romulans, the Klingons, and Cardassians making near-fatal errors, you could see in the background the impacts it was having on Starfleet. Today we'll take a look at the day before the day Starfleet attempted a Federation coup. This analysis will have a pretty heavy focus on the actual episodes versus discussing the meta themes that we generally do. While discussing the Dominion War, I have been postulating that we were seeing the possible impacts of the Dominion in the background to the culture of the Federation and the ethos of Starfleet. All of this came to a head in the DS9 episodes Homefront and Paradise Lost. We would finally see the superior evolved humans and the steadfast Starfleet stumble. Getting into it, the first two events of the episode Homefront include the wormhole inexplicably opening and closing, as well as the bombing of a high-level conference between the Romulan Star Empire and Starfleet. We know that both of these events will be intertwined, but let's break them down individually for a moment. First, it is theorized that the wormhole is opening and closing due to cloaked Dominion forces. The reason it's believed that the Dominion now has cloaked technology is due to the defeat of the Romulan Cardassian fleet that was equipped with the tech. Of course, as the audience, we know that the Dominion already had its claws into the quadrant and changeling infiltrators were within every major government. So in theory, the Dominion wouldn't even need the wreckage. They could have had the tech long before the attack. However, something that is honestly minor, but is never noted, is the advancement of the technology by the Dominion if they had it. In every episode prior to this one, vessels would have to decloak to enter into the wormhole, and then recloak once they had left the wormhole. This occurred with Romulan ships, Cardassian ships, and the Defiant itself. If this was a Dominion cloaked fleet, then we know that they would have had to been able to advance the systems to a state that the Alpha Quadrant powers hadn't figured out. We also know that this is unlikely, as the Dominion was not able to keep up with Starfleet engineers, but still, it would have been an interesting conversation to have. The next event that would tie in would, of course, be the terrorist attack on the Romulan Federation High-Level Conference. This would kill over 20 people. This attack literally makes no sense if we believe the Dominion is involved. While an attack against Starfleet to cause fear on Earth is definitely something the Dominion would consider, conducting an attack that would anger the Romulans and Tholians makes no diplomatic sense. The reason the Dominion is as dangerous as it is includes its ability to play the diplomatic game. This makes it different from the Borg and other species that the Federation has come up against. In fact, we know by the Dominion creating an alliance, or at least a non-aggression pact with the Romulans, the Klingons and Federation were almost completely ensured a defeat. Also, changelings could hit literally anywhere they wanted. Why attack this conference? Why not kill the president, the head of Starfleet? Instead of attacking this conference, attack Starfleet HQ or the Academy. Send a message that no matter where you are, no matter who you are, you aren't untouchable. It's just highly illogical if we assume that the Dominion did this. However, it would make a lot of sense if the attack was conducted not by the Dominion, but Admiral Layton. Think about it. This aggressive stance was important enough that it would get the attention of Starfleet. It would bolster the Romulans and possibly the Tholians to the side of the Federation, and it would allow Leighton to move forward with his plans for the coup. We also know that Leighton is not above framing the changelings when they aren't involved at all. Now, some may argue that the Dominion did it knowing it would prop up Leighton, but again, they could do so many other attacks that would be even more devastating and not risk issues with other governments. Whether by Starfleet or the Dominion, this terrorist attack would jumpstart the Starfleet coup that had already been brewing. After these attacks, Sisko and Odo are recalled to Starfleet Command to give their insights about the Dominion threat. Sisko is promoted to acting head of Starfleet security on Earth. After this, the captain would go see his father and have a discussion about Starfleet. 
I mention this because there is a small but very telling scene with Sisko's family. When Sisko interacts with his father, who will ultimately show us the civilian face of this entire affair effectively, Sisko discusses how Odo thinks it's best that Odo stays at Starfleet Command, and his father agrees. A changeling in public may not be the best idea right now. Sisko's father also states that people were as nervous as they had been during the Borg scare. This is really telling. We know that the culture of the Federation is that those on Earth are evolved humans. They had come above many of the attributes we have currently in the 21st century. However, the dialogue here only further proves that if humans have evolved, it is almost purely nurture and not nature. Don't worry, I'll go ahead and pause the video so everyone can do the quirk quote from the Siege of AR-558. This interaction is a small point, but very insightful. The discussion between Sisko, Layton, and the President of the Federation is also a great glimpse into how deluded the civilian government is. When it is suggested that security measures that are effective on DS9 be instituted on Earth, the President states that the planet isn't a military installation like DS9. First, I'm sure the Bajorans who went through decades of an occupation by a conquering race that constructed military installations all over their planet would be interested to know you consider a station they own to be a Starfleet military installation. And don't even get me started why Starfleet doesn't have a fleet at this military installation especially with the threat from the Klingons and the Dominion. But secondly, not only is Starfleet HQ, the Academy, Space Dock, where the President resides, and Utopia Planitia military installations, but Earth is at the very least a military target. You are an idiot if you don't think that Earth isn't a prime target to be attacked. Even if we assumed, like the President does, that the Antwerp terrorist attack was done by a single changeling that has now left, it still makes sense to have actual security to combat the threats to the Federation. During their conversation, Odo would appear out of nowhere, showing that the President could be easily killed and replaced with the current security standards they have on Earth. I want to take a moment to discuss the President's agreement to begin with the institution of anti-Dominion measures after this. As you can tell, I don't disagree with the attempt, in theory at least. However, I do think that this is where we see a key step towards the Starfleet coup and where the Federation would almost lose itself. It all comes down to why they are doing it. The civilian government is making these changes out of fear not out of concern or practicality. They are afraid, not trying to actually stop something through legitimate moves. If the president had done this out of legitimate conversation and debate and not fear, it would have voted much better. However, because this was done out of fear, the civilian government would make more and more mistakes, making it easier for Leighton to take over. And thank God we don't have leaders in the real world that move out of public outcry and fear. They more look at it reasonably and logically. It's really a good thing that art doesn't mimic reality in this instance. All of that aside, this would be the lead up, the build up to what was to come. Stay tuned as we discuss the institution of the security protocols and how none of it mattered. In the last episode, we discussed how elements of Starfleet convinced the civilian government to allow enhanced security to help protect against a Dominion attack. Today, we'll discuss how none of that mattered. Getting back to the episode proper, we find Sisko and Odo now assisting in calibrating wall-mounted phasers that would be able to disable a changeling that was attempting to hide as a part of the room. They would do this by identifying the correct setting, also known as blowing Odo to hell and back utilizing phasers. After the appropriate setting was determined, Starfleet would immediately begin installing the devices at Federation Headquarters, Starfleet Headquarters, and all orbital stations. During this time, several security orders would be instituted. The scary thing about this is, most of them would be signed by Sisko himself. It is very telling how powerful Starfleet has become over the Federation populace. The scope of their control over the lives of Federation citizens is startling. We'll be visiting the interaction in another video, but it's ironic that Sisko would talk about how Leighton was attempting to install a military totalitarian state, and yet, here we have him bypassing all rights of the citizens without issue. As an example of some of these new laws, Sisko signs an order that requires families of Starfleet personnel to take blood tests. No exceptions. But this isn't about you. We've got civilian families living on starships and Starfleet installations all over the Federation. 
The only way we can secure those facilities is to test everyone there, whether they wear a uniform or not. When his father stands up against this obvious illegal search and seizure order, Cisco is surprised and annoyed. He states that while it's unlikely that his father is a changeling, they have families on ships and stations that have to be secured. The only way to do that is to require blood screenings. He states that while it's unlikely that his father is a changeling, there are ships and stations with families on board. The only way to ensure the safety of these military installations is to test those families. And if you do one Starfleet family, you have to do them all. First, no, it doesn't work like that. If you are a family member on a starbase or starship, you are there by invitation and subject to rules that are not required of families that are not on Starfleet property. You can leave if you don't like it. Secondly, and I can't believe I have to keep saying this, stop having families on military installations that could be attacked or destroyed. Cisco, your wife died on a ship attacked by the Borg. How are you this stupid? Now, this may be my American values coming into play, but these measures instituted by the military and just being accepted by the populace terrifies me. These are civilians, not Starfleet officers. With the stroke of a pen, civilians must capitulate to the military arm of the Federation. And from what we can see, Starfleet is either not challenged or there is no mechanism to stop them. Sure, Sisko's father says they have rights, but he never delineates what those rights are. He glibly states that he has the right to be obstinate. It is never outright stated that the Federation protects against illegal search and seizures. And again, even if we accept he does have those rights, those rights mean jack all because he is arrested for not doing it. Dad, you'd better get down here right away. What's wrong? It's Grandpa. He's been arrested. This utopia allows the military to run the streets and begin taking the blood from whoever the hell they want for whatever the hell arbitrary reason they come up with. And by all accounts, only one old man has an issue with it. And for his obstinance, they arrest him. And when it comes to everyone else, I'm just gonna say that I hope that their stores sell really good knee pads. Starfleet appreciates when you're very, very thorough. And even with all of this, almost immediately we see these security measures are absolutely worthless. And we'll find out why after this. As stated, these security measures are just absolutely worthless. Admiral Layton himself is impersonated. Keep practicing. You'll have those birds fooled in no time. Admiral. Yes. I know that Starfleet Command has always been a little uneasy about a changeling working in their midst. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the trust you've shown in me. Thank you. You're welcome. Well done, Odo. Before I continue on with the breakdown, let me pause here a moment to consider the Changeling's intent in mimicking the Admiral for a second. Certainly we know that Changelings aren't stupid. While we will see contempt held for Odo in this scene, generally Changelings are very careful in their infiltration operations. Also, the real Admiral doesn't appear to be harmed. He didn't need to be rescued. He wasn't subdued. He was just off somewhere else. The Changeling in this instance appears sloppy. But was he? This would show Starfleet that they weren't doing enough. More had to be done. The current security measures, the phasers, the blood checks, it wasn't doing anything. By posing as Leighton, the Changeling had proven nothing worked. The Changelings not only knew he would be caught, he wanted to be. Perhaps the Changeling worried that with the new security measures, that might make Leighton feel safe enough that he wouldn't move forward. That he would put his plans on hold. So to ensure that the Admiral would stay paranoid and attempt to overthrow the Federation, the Changeling gave a little push. It would work too as Leighton would finally act. You know, it's interesting as I discuss the differences between the Romulans and the Dominion. The dialogue with the Romulans always indicated that it was a game of chess, but the Romulans were passive chess players if they were playing the game. The Dominion, in contrast, would certainly be aggressive players in this game. Just a thought. Looking back at the episode, this was a great move by the Changeling. Shortly after the Changeling imitated Leighton, Earth's entire power network would go down, including hitting Starfleet HQ. The attack would be so sophisticated that it even hit Starfleet's emergency systems. And let's pause and take a look at this for a moment. The dialogue indicates that Earth is completely helpless at this point, prime for an attack. While I would agree that Earth's entire network being knocked out is a massive concern, it's defenseless? 
First, we're never given any indication that Earth has orbital defenses. This is a huge complaint by many who watch the franchise. The lack of an orbital defense makes no sense. Additionally, was Space Dock and the surrounding ships impacted as well? We know this isn't true as they would utilize the Lakota in space to mobilize Starfleet security. It would seem to me that Earth's network is the last line of defense. You'd have to get through a lot to get there. You would still have Space Dock, starships able to move where they needed to go, the Mars defense perimeter, and more. Look, I'm not saying that this isn't a major concern, but Earth being defenseless against an incoming fleet because just the planet is down, it's just not logical. Either that or Starfleet sucks! at defending planets. It's at this point that everything comes together. Cisco, Layton, and other Starfleet officers beam into the office of the president as they are trying to figure out why the entirety of Earth is without power. Cisco is able to tie in the wormhole randomly, opening and closing with the attack on the Founder's homeworld that included the Romulans and Cardassians. Cisco notes that a cloaked Dominion fleet might be on the way and that Earth must institute martial law. Measures of this magnitude had not been in effect since the Borg scare. The president begrudgingly agrees and Leighton mobilizes Starfleet security. Starfleet begins beaming down security officers onto the street. Earth becomes a stronghold overnight under the guard and protection of Starfleet officers. Paradise would never be so well armed. During the discussion with the president, Leighton states that he had enough munitions to outfit an army. Now there are some that might try to question why Leighton was never challenged on Starfleet stockpiling weapons for an eventuality like this. I considered it, but ultimately I don't think it's unreasonable. With the Dominion a serious threat, preparing with weapons and defenses is logical. After this attack, Sisko's father turns completely around, fully accepting the blood tests. Lore Runner, another YouTuber I've mentioned in the past, has recently reviewed Homefront, which apparently also includes information from Paradise Lost, but isn't in the title. Anyway, in that video, he discusses the changes in Cisco's dad. I think his analysis is very nuanced, and I actually agree with him. Not only does the power outage encourage the more militant aspects of Starfleet to join Leighton's cause, but it pacifies the civilian element. If you are going to commit a coup, you need the citizenry behind you to some degree. This scare makes it seem like what Leighton is doing is necessary. After all, the Federation civilian government isn't doing anything about the issue. They can't stop the Dominion. But Starfleet, Leighton? He might be able to. Leighton's coup would be discovered by Sisko and Odo before he is able to overthrow the government. The two, of course, would go to the president, who is initially skeptical of their claim. The president then admits that even if he wanted to remove Leighton, he couldn't without evidence given how popular the Admiral was. The populace enjoyed being pacified. It made them feel safe. Whew, I'm glad we can't be pacified to have a leader that's not good for us, but promises to stop the incoming hordes. While attempting to gather evidence, Sisko is confronted by the Admiral. Leighton attempts to convince Sisko to join him, and of course Sisko declines and is removed as acting head of security for Earth, and told to quote unquote, go home. While thinking through what has occurred, Sisko is approached by Chief Miles O'Brien. Of course, there was no way that the Defiant had arrived to Earth by this time, and the Chief is ultimately a changeling. You're not O'Brien. Ah, luckily no. The thought of being locked in the one shape all the time, it's... Ooh. It's unnatural. Ah, don't bother calling for help. It'll only cut short our conversation, and I do enjoy your company. <laughs> if you have something to say to me, say it. Ah, oh, you solids, you are so impatient. I, I thought we could sit here for a while. Maybe go to a bar, have a pint, throw some darts. I don't think so. Let me ask you a question. How many changelings do you think are here on Earth right at this moment? I'm not going to play any guessing games with you. Ah. What if I were to tell you that there are only four on this entire planet? Huh? Uh, not counting Constable Odo, of course. Think of it. Just four of us. And look at the havoc we've wrought. The arrogant being would tell Sisko that there were only four changelings, not including Odo, on Earth and to look at what they had wrought. Interestingly, it's hard for me to really pin down why the changeling would have done this. As I've stated, generally the changelings have a game plan and don't do anything without some purpose. As I've looked into this, I can only see three reasons outside of the changeling uncharacteristically boasting. First, this isn't a changeling, but some form of hologram or illusion by Leighton to galvanize the captain into his way of thinking. Unless it's some form of Section 31 tech, though, I don't think that this was available at this time. 
The ability to project holograms in this way is outside the ability of Starfleet at this moment. It could be someone who was surgically changed to look like O'Brien, but that's a bit extreme. If it is a changeling, it's possible that he was attempting to push the captain into joining Leighton. This entire plan would ultimately result in a civil war. That's almost a certainty. Thus, by helping Leighton, it may cause Starfleet to be more powerful, but that most certainly would be temporary. On the opposite side, the changeling could have been encouraging the captain to resist. The thought, perhaps, was that by inspiring the captain to fight Leighton, you would be moving along the much-needed civil war for the Dominion. Additionally, the belief could be that either result is preferable, and this is why it was done. Regardless of the reasoning, this would be the turning point, where Captain Sisko would ultimately make his choice, and the die would be cast. In 2372, Admiral Layton's coup to overthrow the fairly elected Federation President and Council would result in the deaths of Starfleet personnel and ensured martial law was instituted on Earth. Unfortunately, these weren't his only sins. Today we will put Admiral Layton on trial. As we break down the actions of the good Admiral, it's interesting to see his slow fade from what are minor infractions, comparably at least, to what will result in a loss of life. Assuming we don't blame the terrorist attack on Leighton, which I honestly think it makes more sense if it was him, but giving him the benefit of the doubt here, Leighton's first crime is the utilization of Starfleet equipment in foreign territory to manipulate the wormhole. Remember, Deep Space Nine and the wormhole are officially in Bajoran space, so this means that he would use Starfleet assets in Bajoran space without authorization. From there, Leighton begins reassigning officers for his coup. He places Starfleet personnel he believes will be loyal to him in spots of power, which Again, when we watch the TNG episode, Conspiracy, and see the exact same thing happening, is there no oversight? Before Leighton, an alien species attempted to overthrow the Federation and got to the highest levels of Starfleet, then began doing transfers that no one picked up on. And now, after all of that, there isn't a closer eye on this kind of thing? Really? Though, that said, everything up to this point is not a career ender in my opinion at least for Starfleet. These things would go on his service record or he might just be forgiven. We've seen captains and admirals do worse and get away with it. I mean, hell, Janeway is made an admiral. The next step, in my opinion, probably is the step that would end his career. Leighton utilizes cadets to sabotage Earth's power network. There's a couple of things here. First, while I initially considered that he would be leaving the Earth defenseless and should be tried for that, he probably didn't leave it as open as we think. While you can never know with the Changelings, Leighton probably had contingencies for if a true Dominion attack occurred at this time, and felt that it likely wouldn't. He also had the Lakota and probably other assets to assist just on the off chance. So I would say that an actual Dominion attack is a risk, but a minor one, and one that he would be prepared for had they done it. While it's never stated, it's possible that he had a way of undoing everything almost instantly. Though again, that's just speculation, we can't be sure. However, focusing in, he did use cadets in an extremely risky operation. I get it, they were the best of the best for the academy. You're sending kids into a situation with well-trained and well-armed security personnel who are already on edge with the looming Dominion threat. While Starfleet security does probably have their weapons on stun, you never know what would happen. And stun settings can kill you if the weapon is close enough. If you want to do this operation, sending cadets is stupid. You're telling me that Starfleet doesn't have black ops, no officers with a ton of experience that can do the job. And you're also telling me that Leighton wouldn't be able to find experienced officers to do his bidding. If that's so, he's already failed. Secondly, we know that the power went out across all of Earth, a complete blackout. This included Starfleet backups. So what happened to the hospitals? We see in TNG that the medicine has advanced so much that some doctors don't even know the basics like how to do a splint. At least for a brief moment, apparently Crusher figured it out later. So a takedown of the power network probably caused some massive issues for those who were sick. Though, later in the episode, Sisko's father has a heart attack and EMTs are able to get there and handle the situation. So I guess it's a bit up in the air if the medical services were impacted. We just have contradictory information. For instance, Odo does state that people are in the dark and are scared. But again, hopefully Leighton's virus didn't impact the backups of the hospitals and didn't impact Starfleet Medical. Though, that would be a huge red flag if medical services weren't impacted. I don't think the Dominion would be that gracious. People would probably ask questions. I don't know, what are your thoughts? Moving on, when Sisko is about to expose the Admiral, Leighton would have him arrested on charges of being a changeling. Let's pause a second. So Leighton concocts this big show and dance that will make Sisko appear to be a changeling. 
We're going to ignore the fact that Cisco doesn't act like a changeling once caught. Again, changelings attempt to escape. However, I don't expect the president to know this, so let's go this way. Instead of sitting there and taking it, why didn't Cisco make them stun him? Think about it. He tells the president he can prove he isn't a changeling. He then demands to be shot. If they don't shoot him, he rushes one of them and they utilize their phasers to stun him. If he was a changeling, he would, you know, revert back. Him being stunned on the floor shows that Leighton is a liar. But for whatever reason, he wouldn't and would be put in jail. And alas, there wouldn't be anyone to corroborate what Sisko was saying. Leighton had ordered the cadets that he had used to be taken off planet on an extended training mission. And I'll address that real quick as well. While some have pointed out that these cadets would be stationed on the Valiant or killed during the war since they were redeployed, I don't think we can hold Leighton for these crimes. He had no way of knowing that the war would occur in the way that it did, and so this aspect is probably not his fault. It'd be like an admiral who had a Miranda class patrolling a certain zone that was overrun when the war just began. It's not his fault he didn't know the Miranda would be taking on the Dominion. Now, if I can, let's discuss the security measures. I mean, that's what this is all about, right? To make the Federation safer. But we find out that none of this really matters. Sisko is placed in confinement. However, Odo is able to get past all the security and free Sisko. Everything they were doing, all of these sacrifices Leighton was making, all of the security measures, none of it mattered. Sure, you could say that Odo knew the security protocols, but you're telling me a changeling couldn't do the exact same? Changelings are masters when it comes to infiltration. We know they've already found a way to trick the blood test and a patient enough changeling would find ways to bypass everything Starfleet security has done. He could start out as a low level security personnel and work his way up learning as he went, or hell, maybe the changeling would pretend to be one of the pieces of security equipment. And this is assuming that they don't already have a mole in Starfleet security who is looking to analyze everything that has already been done. To paraphrase Sisko's father, there's not a system created that a smart man can't find a way past. So all of this, at least at a micro level, isn't even effective at stopping the very threat that Leighton is trying to stop. People are dying for a system that at a micro level isn't working. As stated, Sisko would be freed. He would confront Leighton and advise the Admiral that the Defiant was on its way to prove his guilt. Leighton already knew of this somehow and had ordered the Lakota, a ship that he had upgraded, to intercept the Defiant and stop it. The crew of the Lakota were told that the Defiant had been replaced with Changelings, which is ridiculous. No high level officer would believe that order unless they were incredibly stupid. We know that Starfleet security at least knew a little bit about the Changelings and this is not their modus operandi. Leighton's orders would result in deaths on both sides. Even if we tried to justify everything so far, if we said everything he did was for the greater good, he ordered one Starfleet vessel to fire on another. Everything up to this point hasn't resulted in death that we know of, but now we've truly moved into a state of civil war. Let's break down everything he was trying to do. Looking at it pragmatically, it does make some sense. Save for the ordering of one ship attacking another. I don't think anyone can doubt that the warships, the attitudes, the training, and overall mental state of the Federation at the end of the Dominion War is superior when it comes to fighting threats than the mental state they had at the beginning. To be more precise, the way the Federation is at the end of the Dominion War is much better than the way they were at the beginning, at least if you don't want people to die. If the Federation, if Starfleet had had at the beginning half of the wartime economy, half of the mentality that they would ultimately have at the end, the Dominion would not have curb stomped the Alpha Quadrant so hard for most of the Dominion War. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people may have been saved if they had looked at it more like Leighton did. And that's not the only thing. The Federation was losing a PR battle with the Dominion. A lot of people forget this, but the Dominion wasn't at war with the Federation, at least not yet. People always focus on what we've seen, but all of that is behind the scenes. We know what the Changelings ultimately want, but they did a good job of keeping it quiet. The Dominion were exceptionally good at the PR game, and the Alpha Quadrant largely didn't know what Sisko and his crew knew. And, at this point, diplomatically, the Dominion had every reason to make themselves look like the Innocents being attacked by the evil Federation. The analysis I do is from a meta standpoint, not from what we see in the background and what other people wouldn't know. The Dominion, to the average Alpha Quadrant citizen, probably looks like a larger empire that just wanted to exist. And then you have all of these other Alpha Quadrant governments, the Klingon Empire, the Romulan Star Empire, the Cardassian, Starfleet. 
attacking them. The Dominion looks like the good guys. Now while this may not be true in reality, it's what most people would see. And as real life tells us, you don't always have to be the good guy to look like the good guy. So while Starfleet Command may know the truth, the galaxy sees it different, and this is a PR game they are losing. And what's interesting is, while they're losing this PR game and Leighton looks to be like the ultimate bad guy in Starfleet, the oppressive nature of Starfleet that already exists isn't much better than what Leighton wants to do. Starfleet can and does demand unreasonable search and seizure of people's blood. They begin and continue martial law, apparently indefinitely, without being challenged by any civilian entities that we know of. And from what we can tell, Starfleet, the military arm, also works as the police of Earth. And that's always a great idea. There's a reason why you separate military and the police. One fights the enemy of the state, the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, then the enemies of the state tend to become the people. What Cisco is claiming to protect against Leighton is basically a lie. Federation citizens have rights so long as Starfleet deems it so and the civilians have no real recourse that we see. And we know how easy it is to overthrow the civilian government in the Trek universe. But that's a conversation for another time. In the end, I don't think Leighton was justified. He's definitely guilty, but I don't know the answer to the problem. We know that the way that the Federation will go results in the needless death of hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know the fix. I don't know how to do this without taking people's rights. And many will quote the, if you give up freedoms in the name of security, you deserve neither quote, but that's only really effective if you're still alive at the end of the day. So that brings me to this. What would you guys do? This is an interesting episode. When I first watched it, I thought it would be one of those that I gloss over. The DS9 episode, Rules of Engagement, didn't appear to add a lot to the Dominion War mythos. However, the more I thought about it and analyzed the actual episode itself, the more I see the implications. This is before Starfleet is at war with the Klingons and prior to open hostilities with the Dominion. Starfleet is in an odd situation to say the least. They know that the war is unjust and the Cardassians are suffering. They don't want to start a war with the Klingons, but can't just leave the Cardassians to their fate. So Starfleet agrees to assist in humanitarian aid and only engages in the war when the needs of Cardassians' people are at stake. Looking at the episode proper, I was initially a bit skeptical that the Klingons would allow Starfleet to do this and wouldn't just use it as a reason to go to war with the Federation. Starfleet is not only being passive about the possible corruption of Cardassia by the Dominion at this point, but is now aiding the Klingon's enemy to a degree. However, assuming that the Klingons aren't complete idiots and that the Martok changeling isn't able to just do anything he wants, it does make some semblance of sense that the Klingons would tolerate this for right now, possibly to prepare for a war with the Federation, not just attacking to attack. So the situation isn't completely illogical. Now, for a minute, let's look at the overall plans of the Klingon Empire when it comes to this court case. The thought is that by exposing a Starfleet officer and proving that he became enraged and killed civilians without thinking and proving this to the Alpha Quadrant, that the Federation would then back off and let the Klingons continue their war unabated without issue. Starfleet would no longer help with humanitarian aid after this. Let's, for the moment, grant everything about the Starfleet officer. Which is far from the truth, but let's just say that a Starfleet officer, in the middle of battle, slaughtered civilians. No, you, you know what? No. Let's remove that aspect. Let's make it as horrible as possible. A Starfleet officer knowingly killed innocent civilians because he could. It wasn't in the midst of combat, and it wasn't justifiable in any way. So just a horrific individual. Do you really think the Cardassian mother who is watching her son starve on the streets of Cardassia gives one good damn what that one officer did? Do the governments of the Alpha Quadrant hate Starfleet so much that they would let one indiscretion change their opinion completely about the Federation? Are the admirals at Starfleet Command and politicians within the Federation so weak that they won't save people despite having one officer go off the rails? That they would allow innocent civilians die because they are embarrassed at one incident. I mean, wow. This takes Federation pacifism to a whole new level. Either the Klingon Empire gravely miscalculates the Federation or the blood of Starfleet is water by now. And remember, Sisko never counters the Klingon advocate when he claims all of this in the episode. We're left to think that this is actually what would happen. It's just ridiculous. But let's get into the case itself. 
As I discussed in the video where we put Gaius Baltar on trial, introductions in a criminal case are very interesting to watch but don't hold any weight, nor are they considered evidence. They simply paint a picture, a story. In this case, the advocate presents Worf as a Klingon warrior in the heat of combat going on to slaughter anything in his way. That Worf is quote unquote grossly negligent in his command and that it resulted in the deaths of civilians. The Klingon Empire is asking that Worf be returned to stand judgment. This is actually not a horrible opening on the side of the prosecution. Let me discuss something before we get into the defense's opening. I get that it was done for the story, but the fact that Sisko is defending Worf makes little sense. Worf should have a JAG officer representing him, which we know exists in the universe. If they wanted Sisko to be a part of the proceedings, he could have demanded to be on the legal team. I can see him doing that, but another officer who is there, who is an actual lawyer, would be a lot more logical to have, but we never see that. The defense is pretty simple. The Defiant was engaged with two different enemy vessels that were utilizing Cloak and trying to destroy the Defiant itself and the humanitarian aid vessels that the Defiant was protecting. A Klingon transport vessel wanders into the combat zone, decloaks right in front of the Defiant and is destroyed. An unfortunate accident. And again, I don't think this was a bad introduction. Both sides are doing well so far. As the court case continues, the Klingon advocate who claims to want to beat Starfleet on their own battleground in the courts states that he accepts all of the evidence presented. He accepts all of the statements of the bridge crew, keyword here all. He accepts the sensor logs and the events as presented. Cisco, of course, asks for a dismissal of the case since there isn't anything in dispute and the advocate replies that what Worf was feeling is what is at the heart of the matter. That Worf wanted to kill to kill. Here's the problem with the reply from the advocate. That is completely counter to the facts that are presented in the case. The account of the bridge crew, the sensor logs, and the events as they were described claim that it was all an accident. So you can't say that you accept the facts as presented and then go on to say these facts are an error. For someone who wants to fight on the battlefield of the Federation, you are extremely bad at this. But putting that idiocy aside, what the Klingon is actually asking for, as far as I can tell, is to prove the mens rea of Worf. What was his mental state? While I do have an associate's in criminal justice, I am no lawyer, but I will address at some point what Worf was filling to see if he actually had a guilty mind. We'll be doing that a bit later though. Moving on, the first witness to be called is Jadzia Dax, and she is called by the advocate. An interesting note here, the advocate is the one to call her to the stand as I've stated and yet is treating her like a hostile witness. You aren't allowed to ask your own witnesses leading questions. That's only allowed during the cross-examination or with a witness considered hostile to the lawyer asking the question. As he called her and has no reason to consider her hostile at this point, he should not be allowed to ask leading questions such as, wouldn't you say the Klingons are a violent warrior race? He could, however, ask, how would you describe the Klingons, or something of that nature. Again, this is probably why we need a JAG officer defending Worf instead of a man who destroys planets, entire ecosystems to take down one terrorist, but sorry, I need to stop doing that. Let me address the leading question as well. So the Klingon asks if Jadzia believes his race is a violent warrior race. She states that's an aspect of it. Honestly, I personally would disagree to that in recent times. Klingons have been violent warriors in the past, true, but in Star Trek Undiscovered Country, we saw them embrace honor and become a bit more honorable. It's not about the combat or the battle, but how that combat or battle brings honor to everything. In fact, you don't have to be a warrior to bring honor in Undiscovered Country. You could be a Klingon cook or an engineer. As long as what you did pushes the Klingon Empire forward and brings honor to your family, you are being what a Klingon should be. Now certainly we could argue that the Klingons may be falling from grace, the old ways and whatnot, but it would be worth countering this by focusing on the honor aspect. Which of course the defense, Cisco, never does. How in the hell is a critic able to better defend Worf? I'm, I'm just asking. The advocate continues and presses Jadzia, asking if she believes Klingons are a threat due to their predatory nature and Klingon bloodlust. Jadzia admits that she has seen this bloodlust in Worf's nature, but has also observed him hold back when necessary. She points out that when she fights him, she can see the quote unquote bloodlust and how he stops and pulls back before he kills her. The advocate, once again showing he is capable of fighting on the battlefield of the court systems, tries to submit into evidence private records from Worf obtained without a search warrant. Sisko objects, which is weird, he rarely does the right thing, but he points out that this is a breach of Worf's privacy. The Klingon advocate taunts Worf and asks if he has anything to hide. Worf takes the bait and allows the evidence to be submitted. 
Again, this is incredibly stupid. Just because you don't allow someone to utilize information on you that was obtained illegally doesn't mean you have anything to hide. It means that you want your rights to stay intact and not begin the slippery slope that will ultimately occur if you allow this to happen. Despite what the advocate thinks, the justice system they are employing ensures innocent people stay free. Giving up your rights is not something you should ever allow unless you are forced to do it. That doesn't make you guilty. That doesn't mean that people can't find the truth. It means that the court system is fair. But let the evidence be submitted, Worf does. The Klingon Advocate shows a holographic program where Worf plays a conqueror that defeats a city and then burns it to the ground, killing every man, woman, and child. The Advocate points out that this shows that Worf is a murderer and does not believe in the ideals of the Federation, and that the program was played the day before the convoy went out. Yet again, the amazing Cisco doesn't object, because doing so would give Worf a fighting chance. And even if we assume that this isn't a point where he should object, he should at least point out the flaws in this argument. First, Worf is playing a video game that involves him killing people. Fantastic! Welcome to the 21st century, Chief. We do that all the time and don't go on mass murdering sprees, regardless of what the media would tell you. But let's set that aside. Again, let's give as much leeway as we can. Let's say that Worf does this because of his bloodlust, that it proves that he is a violent Klingon warrior. Fine. Then the argument is easy to counter. Worf gets out all of his aggression in this video game so that he doesn't use it on the battlefield. We know that Vulcans going through Ponfar will utilize holographic simulations which help them not sexually assault other Starfleet members. The redirect here, pointing that out, is simple and logical. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a stupid argument. It's a video game we're discussing, but if you want to try it, then that is a way of him getting out his aggression so he doesn't use it. I mean, but what do I know? I'm just a dude that calls himself the lore master, so. The next witness is Captain Benjamin Sisko. The advocate is calling the legal defense as a witness, which is why you should not have Sisko as the legal defense, but whatever. The advocate asks about the mission Sisko gave to Worf. The advocate clarifies that Sisko was very clear in his orders that it was a relief mission and not a combat one. Sisko confirms that those were the orders to ensure the medical aid got to the planet. The advocate has no further questions, and when Sisko is asked if he would like to add anything to the record, he declines at this time. The next one we see is Quark. Quark explains how Worf was looking forward to the convoy mission. At the bar, Worf would come in for a drink, and Quark asked him what would happen if the Klingons came after the convoy convoy and Worf states, I hope they do. I understand that the advocate is trying to build a case, but all of this is flimsy as hell. So Commander Worf plays a video game and then hopes that the Klingons attack the convoy. Thereby, that means he is a blood-lusted Klingon that is going to kill every civilian he can find. I mean, the logic being used here is infallible. As everyone knows, SF Debris had been making Star Trek episode breakdowns for years before I started this channel. So after watching him, I begin making my own videos which are somewhat popular and it ultimately results in my ex leaving me because she discovers I had a love triangle with Ketwalski and Lore Runner. I mean, it just all makes sense. I get it. I get it. The advocate is building a case, but all of this is highly circumstantial. And even with the evidence, wouldn't meet the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, we'll talk about that in a bit. Continuing with the trial, the next witness is O'Brien, who relates the actual battle. Let's pause for a moment and discuss the battle itself. You have the Defiant against two Klingon warships. Both appear to be older vessels. There have been some complaints that the Defiant isn't able to take these ships out quickly. I definitely understand that argument, however, I'm not convinced that it holds as much weight. In a straight up battle that just has the Defiant versus these two ships with no cloaking abilities, the Defiant wins straight out. However, it is stated clearly that the two ships were committing hit and run attacks. It's also stated that they had been doing the battle for roughly five minutes. It makes little sense that the Defiant would have issues in a sustained battle, even with cloaking vessels, for five minutes, if they were that old. What is more logical is that the ships would have conducted a hit and run in every sense of the term. They swoop in, do an attack, one ship tries to pull them away, and then both run like hell. 30 seconds or more later, they come back and try again. Think about it. They do the same attack over and over and over for about five minutes. The fact that they aren't causing that much damage and haven't sustained that much either is inconsequential. The objective is not to destroy the convoy after all. So after five minutes and say two or three attacks, maybe a few more, Worf realizes what they are doing. So once they attempt again, he has them dead to rights. Unfortunately, he would destroy the transport. 
I understand that from Worf's point of view, it seems like the battle was consistent, but again, I don't think that my version is precluded. This could have been one segment of the hit and run. It's also possible, given that Starfleet wasn't at war with the Klingon Empire, that they were pulling their punches a bit. They were attempting to scare away the vessels versus destroying them. A Starfleet vessel destroying a Klingon vessel could actually start the war. So for me, the battle isn't all that unrealistic when you consider the different integers. However, this is the only way I can see it making sense, and the fact that they never question the type of vessels is beyond me. You're telling me that the Klingon Empire sends two ships it knows can't take on the Defiant, and Cisco never brings that up? Sure, the Advocate might try to argue that they were the only two ships available, but all of this is looking extremely convenient. Two old warships are the only ones available to attack the Starfleet vessel. They do hit and run attacks that are ultimately ineffective. And then all of a sudden, a transport ship just decloaks in front of the Defiant. Cause them's the breaks. The more I look at this, the more I think that the Admiral would probably question a lot of it as well. Anyway, getting back to the testimony, Sisko is the one to call O'Brien to the stand, and Miles states he stands by the decision of the commander and that they did everything they could. The Klingon advocate, rightly, notes the way O'Brien phrases his testimony. He asks if O'Brien agrees with the decision, not if he stands by it. The chief continues to try to deflect and ultimately says he wasn't in command, he can't really speak to what occurred. Personally, I completely disagree with this. It is the duty of every officer to be able to speak to their commanding officer's orders especially if that order is an illegal one. While I give the Advocate a hard time, I think he handled O'Brien excellently. The Advocate takes a different tactic and points out that Miles has been in over 200 engagements and has been decorated over 15 times. He asks to have O'Brien considered to be an expert in ship combat. Sisko, of course, doesn't object, and O'Brien is considered an expert. The Advocate then puts the Chief into a hypothetical situation where Miles is the one in charge. Before I continue, I want to say this. I don't know if the writers did this on purpose, but this was a brilliant move by the Advocate. If the Klingon had asked those questions before having O'Brien declared an expert, Sisko could have objected. However, as an expert, hypothetical questions of this nature are absolutely admissible in court. So well done, writers. He asks Miles O'Brien how the Chief would have reacted and if he would have fired on the decloaking ship. Again, Miles attempts to dodge and states the question is unfair. It didn't happen that way. The Advocate retorts that he doesn't care what Miles thinks, just what Miles would do, which is, again, the proper way to be a lawyer. The Chief ultimately admits that he wouldn't fire until it's confirmed what the ship is. The Chief Engineer is quick to point out that his opinions are after the fact, and he wasn't there. The only addition I might have added was for the Advocate to cut the Chief off again when he tries to protect Worf, that his opinion on after the fact is irrelevant. But that's more a matter of what's done in actual court versus what looks good on television. Worf is then called to the stand by Sisko, and the version of events that Worf states are given, and they are similar to O'Brien's. Though I will say, the Defiant is defending the transports with its shields down. I suppose it's possible that they did this, maybe it was to make the Defiant a more tempting target, but that just seems like a bad decision to me. The crux of the matter arrives when the discussions around the convoy going near shipping lanes is presented. Worf states that he thought the chance of a civilian ship decloaking during the battle was remote. And he's right. It's extremely unlikely and sketchy that a civilian vessel would decloak in the middle of a battle, let alone in front of a ship that was about to fire at all. The Klingon advocate lays into Worf almost immediately, pointing out how Worf is dishonored because he sided with the Federation. At first, I think there is a little leeway that could be granted for this. However, when the advocate begins talking about Worf being raised by humans, Sisko probably should have objected. There's no relevance here why Worf is considered a traitor among the Klingon Empire. It doesn't even fit to Worf's motive. How he became hated amounts to a hill of beans. How he reacts to it is important. If you want to try to make a case that he hates his people, whatever. But how he got there is unnecessary. Sisko only begins to pipe up when the Advocate speaks about how the dead don't care about Worf thinks. Though, if they're dead, the Advocate is technically right. Even with the objection, Worf yells at the Advocate, who continues to taunt him. While the judge admonishes both Worf and the Advocate as they continue, it would appear that she is as consistent with her threats as Starfleet is with winning wars, because nothing is done over the Advocate's actions. The Advocate would then ultimately threaten Worf's kid. Let me take a moment and say, while he didn't technically threaten the kid's life, he did threaten the kid's honor. Something to consider is that Worf is Klingon. 
not human. For humans, the words utilized by the advocate aren't all that impactful. However, for Worf's son to be raised thinking there is no honor for family Moog and that his father is a coward? Well, you might as well have threatened the life of the child to Worf. This is extremely grievous, and the fact that the Admiral doesn't take it into account is unfortunate. Worf then attacks the advocate, which is a reasonable reaction to what has been done for his society. And of course, what should be obvious is a mistrial but is only utilized as evidence against Worf for the furtherance of the plot. As the advocate is on the ground bleeding, he states, I thought you said you'd never attack an unarmed man. Which Worf did say, kind of, but it's out of context. Worf said it's not honorable to kill someone who can't defend themselves. The advocate should have been able to defend himself, but I guess the advocate is as strong as I am because he then states, you should have said, not unless I get angry, not unless I have something to prove when it comes to attacking someone. The advocate rests his case, which again, in theory, he should have already done. The defense doesn't generally call witnesses till after the prosecution has rested, though perhaps there is more precedent that I'm not aware of. The case would end with the deliberations. While waiting, Cisco requests that new evidence be admitted. I'll be honest, I'm not completely sure how this would be handled, so we'll give it a pass and assume that it could happen. Sisko calls the advocate to the stand as a Klingon expert to evaluate the evidence. While this obviously is out of sorts and not how a trial or any type of proceeding really would be presented, I don't know that there is any other Klingon available, so perhaps an exception might be made to allow the advocate to do so. If not, the evidence could just be presented, but that's not good drama. Sisko asks the advocate about relations between the Federation and the Klingon Empire how there wouldn't be a lot of trust between the two. The advocate would ultimately agree with Sisko. The captain then begins to talk about those who were killed on the transport, and Chapak is very boisterous about this. Sisko points out how the list presented by the Klingon Empire is of people who had died in one crash and then all got back into a different vessel and died again when it was destroyed. Now, the advocate probably should have objected at some point here as Sisko begins monologuing versus asking actual questions, but at this point, he may have been shocked that his ruse had been found out. This means that Worf would be found not guilty and the Klingon Empire would be shamed. We'll get to the speech by the ecosystem destroying captain who potentially caused the deaths of thousands to go after one man in a minute. Before that, let's pause to discuss Worf's mens rea, or his guilty mind. Some have stated that Worf is ultimately guilty because he actually did want vengeance. He wanted to punish the Klingons, but his own words point out that he wanted a reason. He didn't want to do it without provocation, and he was provoked. But at no time did Worf take an action that couldn't be justified as self-defense or due to times of war. Worf wanted to punish the Klingon Empire for what they had did to him and wanted a battle. Fine but he wanted to do it within established rules of engagement, and he did just that. So what was Worf's mens rea? What was his guilty mind? If the Klingons attack, he defends the ship and happily punishes them for what they did, but only after they fired the first shot. At no time did this filling cause him to go outside any bounds. He didn't attack fleeing ships. He didn't knowingly attack a ship that was defenseless. So the guilty mind of Worf isn't proven here at all. But sometimes that doesn't matter. While it's not a perfect analogy, an example where mens rea isn't required is if you take a wife who is watching her husband suffer due to cancer and the husband continues to ask her to die every day and she points a gun at him and kills him. She didn't really want to harm him. She wanted to stop his pain, but she's still guilty of murder. So Worf doesn't have the guilty mind the advocate said he did, fine doesn't mean he's not guilty. Is the action still justified? So let's look at his situation. Worf is in the midst of battle. Every time a ship decloaks, it fires on him. Also, Worf is not only fighting for the crew of his ship, he's fighting for the transports, the innocent civilians on them, and the people that need the medicine. If the convoy is destroyed, many more will die horrific death due to sickness. And that's not even to mention the brutal oppression the Klingon Empire will exact on that sector. Worf is defending, at least, three transports with innocent civilians. He is fighting to get medicine to people who will die if they don't get it. That includes children, by the way. And he is even trying to prevent an oppressive enemy state from harming an entire planet of people. You are damn right he had every justification, if not an obligation to fire on the ship, whether it is identified or not. Because what Sisko doesn't realize, what Sisko doesn't understand, is that if Worf makes the wrong decision and the Defiant loses in this situation, it loses big. 
I no more blame Worf for destroying a civilian transport than I would a World War II soldier who was fighting in an urban area for an extended period of time. If that soldier had to defend himself every time someone jumped out of the shadows, if he knew every time in the past he's been jumped that it was an enemy soldier wanting to kill him, and then he accidentally kills a civilian who does the same thing, then yeah, it's understandable. In fact, these things happen in real life. A lot. In 1944, a Japanese cargo ship named the Tsushima Maru traveling from Okinawa to Kagoshima was torpedoed by the USS Bofin. The ship had a total loss of 1,508 people. 767 of these were school children. There were no armaments on the cargo ship, no troops. It was transporting civilians. The crew of the Bofin had been in multiple fights with cargo ships that did have munitions. They had no idea they were targeting a civilian ship and had every reason to believe the convoy, including this vessel, was a part of a military operation. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying Worf should be lauded. I'm saying that's what happens in war. Sometimes, People die that had nothing to do with the fight, and it's not really anyone's fault, it's what happens. It's why war is awful and why we as a species should not do it. Let's address Sisko's speech. When I first listened to it, I actually liked what he had to say. I have historically used this speech to show how Janeway was slowly becoming an anti-hero. However, I think I've already shown how this isn't appropriate for the situation in which it was given. There are more extenuating circumstances other than that of a one-on-one -on -one fight. It's also funny this coming from him because he would be the one to fire a weapon that would kill people if they didn't get off a planet. I mean, it was only one engine failure away from civilians being killed, including children. I guess he got lucky that didn't happen. And we never know if he destroyed the entire ecosystem. I mean, you're telling me that animal life isn't impacted by releasing a toxin into the atmosphere? Okay. But again, let's focus on the speech itself. If Sisko were talking about a one-on-one -on -one fight with only the crew of the Starfleet ship at stake, then I honestly think it's probably one of the best Starfleet-esque speeches out there. It matches the spirit of the Federation so much, I'd almost imagine it would be coming from Picard. While in Voyager, we know there are actual regulations that allow you to do whatever it takes to save your crew, the mantra of Starfleet, the ethos, the very character, is to give your lives if it means saving others even if it means letting the bad guys win. This is the utopia we think of. So I have a love-hate relationship with the ending. While I don't think it's appropriate for the situation, I think generally it's how Starfleet should operate. Another aspect of the conversation I enjoyed was when Worf realizes he was the wrong man for the job and that he needed to be there for the troops. A part of command is smiling and making sure your men are happy even when it's the last thing you want to do. Finally, let's talk about the Klingon's ploy for a moment. It's very Romulan. Well, Romulan if the Romulans didn't know what they were doing. I suppose I would think it's realistic in that the Klingons were really, really bad at trying to fake out the Federation and Starfleet. Many have said that this is uncharacteristic of the Empire. Normally, I'd probably agree. However, there are two different arguments that can be made for this change in character. First, the Martok changeling is still in power, so this means that he might be pushing for ploys like these that would cause tensions between Starfleet and the Klingon Empire. Whether the ploy fails or not, the Dominion wins. Additionally, we know that the Klingon Empire is falling, that they are becoming dishonorable. So this could be a clue towards that aspect. It is discussed at the end of the series. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? You know, it always intrigues me when I do these breakdowns. Because I'm so meticulous and discuss everything in great detail, people assume that I hate the episode. Personally, if you turn off the logical part of your brain, I think it's actually a, a great episode. The style it was done in, the way it comes out, the court-esque back and forth, I really appreciate it more now that I've studied it. It's always curious how people think if you analyze something, you hate it. Additionally, I nearly fell out of my chair when I realized how many accidental civilian deaths happen in the real world during war. That's just startling. It is interesting to watch the beginning of the DS9 episode to the death and analyze the implications of it. Let's even take a look at the beginning of the episode where we find the Defiant returning to DS9 after an attack. Apparently, one of the upper pylons is completely destroyed by a Jem'Hadar boarding party. According to Kira, the Jem'Hadar strike team was in and out before anyone knew what was going on. The Jem'Hadar utilized a transport ship so they wouldn't be caught and beamed on board to steal what they had to steal. My problem is that, by this point, the station had been attacked by a Cardassian war fleet, had been attacked by a Klingon fleet, was near the border where the Cardassians and Klingons were slugging it out, and is ground zero should there be a Dominion assault. So when the Defiant is out on a mission, like it was for this episode, they have no other vessels to protect the station. We know there are no other ships because Sisko orders Kira to tell Starfleet to actually get vessels there. 
And then the Defiant Bridge crew begin to debate whether the Defiant should always be at the station or not. <sighs> Look, I'm not mad that you continually show how idiotic Starfleet is from a military aspect, Deep Space Nine episode. I'm just not surprised, and I'm disappointed. Bad episode. Like previous videos, I won't be doing a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown. I'll be analyzing the significance of what we see that has context to the Dominion Gold War that ultimately will lead to the Dominion War itself. I feel this episode is significant in some ways, not because the Dominion are in it. Indeed, I've skipped over episodes that have the Dominion in them because they don't play any real role in what I'm trying to do. But I feel this episode gives the true mentality of the Federation at this time. While a definitive shift is occurring, we still see vestiges of the Starfleet past pacifism that I am so fond of discussing from TNG. A synopsis of this episode is pretty easy. While hunting the Jem'Hadar that attacked the station, Sisko and his crew run into a Dominion patrol that they will team up with to kill the rogue Jem'Hadar before said Jem'Hadar can destroy both governments. This alliance that we see throughout this interaction only further proves to me that Starfleet's morals stop at the door if it involves them getting their hands dirty. Even if we assume that this is a special case, that Sisko teams up with bad guys to take out even worse people, they still are teaming up with the Dominion and we get to see what kind of empire that really is. And we also see how Starfleet isn't going to do anything really after this episode, not until a while later. Anyway, back to it. As I've stated, the Defiant finds a disabled Jem'Hadar ship about to explode and saves those on it. The Vorta, a little person by the name of Weyun that won't amount to much so just ignore him, will talk to Sisko and both sides realize they are after the same group of criminals. The conversation between Sisko and the little known character is extremely insightful into future events. Weyun first butters up Sisko and offers to give him ultimate control over Starfleet. Sisko, of course, declines and they move on to the business at hand. Weyun states that he knows where the rogue Jem'Hadar are, but needs Sisko to help eliminate them. Another word for kill. Sisko never declines to help assassinate the rogue Jem'Hadar, but is confused why Weyun doesn't do it himself. After all, the power of the Dominion is vast, they could have hundreds of ships there. Weyun retorts that they don't have enough time. It is discovered that the rogue Jem'Hadar have control of Iconian tech that would be able to destroy the Dominion, and then ultimately even the Federation. To be fair, Sisko does initially act like the destruction of the Dominion isn't his problem, but even if we remove the fact that they would attack the Federation, I believe that he was most likely bluffing. I don't believe that he would sit back and allow that to happen. After all, a lot of the Dominion are innocent member states. The plan is pretty easy. Blow the Iconian gateway to hell and back with bombs. Unfortunately, the facility is unable to be breached with quantum torpedoes. Apparently, the structure is made with stuff that can withstand quantum attacks. Luckily, the Dominion never thought to put that metal on their ships. We see the stark difference between the two sides, with the Dominion soldiers believing they should stay and die to ensure the Iconian gateway is destroyed when the operation occurs, and the crew of the Defiant wanting to live. In order to better facilitate the attack, they decide to integrate both crews, and that's intriguing. We see the Jem'Hadar and the Vorta walking around with no armed escort. Both the Federation and Dominion appear to get to know each other a lot better. In fact, Jem'Hadar are allowed on the bridge of the Defiant. Which is crazy to me. I understand that they're working together, but to allow the Jem'Hadar on the Defiant's bridge is a huge risk. We also learn about the vital necessity of the narcotics that are used to keep the Jem'Hadar in line. These peaceful relations wouldn't last as both Worf and a Jem'Hadar are continuously antagonistic with each other throughout the episode. This culminates to a brawl in the mess hall and ultimately the Jem'Hadar first would kill the Jem'Hadar that Worf had been having a lover's quarrel with. Because Sisko isn't absolutely insane, he simply restricts Worf to his quarters. Both the murderous Jem'Hadar first and Sisko would have an argument on how to appropriately discipline their men ending with Sisko being threatened by the first. Ultimately, the mission would be successful, the Dominion soldiers and Starfleet officers fighting valiantly together, Sisko even risking his life for the first. The first Jem'Hadar, who had threatened Sisko, kills Weyun for the Vorta doubting that the first and his men would be loyal to the Dominion. The interaction ends with the first telling Sisko that Sisko did fight well, but the next time they meet, both would be enemies, foreshadowing for the win. Let's analyze what we have learned from the Dominion here. The Jem'Hadar, a cloned slave race, is not 100% loyal to their cloned masters. The Dominion utilizes narcotics to keep them in line. Some of the Jem'Hadar wish to be free. The Jem'Hadar will also kill one of their own for disobeying simple orders. Moving even more into the Jem'Hadar not being completely blinded is the fact that some of the Jem'Hadar look at Odo with disdain that he is a traitor. His god status is not of concern to some. This is never observed from the Vorta, at least not in this episode. The Jem'Hadar appear to have more freedom of thought, as I've discussed. 
That would be interesting information for Starfleet. The Vorta, even now, offered to try and bribe a Starfleet officer, wanting to give him ultimate control over Starfleet in an attempt to overthrow the democratically elected officials of the Federation. The Vorta are additionally cloned as well, programmed to love their Dominion masters. And even with all of this information, we know that Starfleet would continue to want peaceful resolutions with the Dominion. They, in effect, would be okay with the slavery that was occurring because they didn't want a war with the Dominion, even though there are some slaves that want to break free. Here's the thing that people get so mad at me about. They don't understand my problems here. I'm not necessarily saying that it's a bad idea from a pragmatic standpoint to not do anything. Starfleet will barely be able to take out the Dominion in the Alpha Quadrant when that war happens. Can you imagine a war when the full industrial might of the Gamma Quadrant is included? But pragmatism is not something that Starfleet is known for at this point. The Starfleet ethos, everything we have learned from the next generation and even from Deep Space Nine up to this point is that Starfleet is the pinnacle of brightness that fights against oppression, even if it comes at the cost of themselves and their lives. So their willingness to do nothing about this, to step back. It's the smart move, but it's incredibly on Starfleet. While I did consider that perhaps they would try to culturally change the Dominion, that the point was to let their values seep over, this, again, is not how Starfleet operates. Now this happens, we know that Starfleet ultimately infects other cultures to their benefit and causes all kinds of problems, but their claim is that they don't do that on purpose, that they're not trying to. Remember Sisko's speech to the wormhole aliens, that they aren't there to overthrow someone with ideas, but to learn from them and share those ideas to become better. The fact that the Federation still seeks peace with the Dominion is, in my opinion, a betrayal of the values we learned from the time of the next generation till now. But I don't know that it isn't the right choice. A war with the Dominion, especially an attempt to overthrow them, is idiocy. Attempting peaceful relations is the best choice for the survival of the United Federation of Planets at least at this time. The last piece I want to discuss here is Sisko's reaction. A Jem'Hadar raiding party attacks. They go after the Jem'Hadar only to find out that these Jem'Hadar are rogue and don't want to be a part of the Dominion. They want to overthrow the Dominion. Sisko just takes Weyun's word for it that these Jem'Hadar will attack the Federation. He never seeks them out. He never attempts negotiations. This seems like the best chance to have a better Dominion. Now, people will scream Prime Directive when it comes to this, but this isn't the first time Starfleet has done something of this nature. And after all, if the Dominion is evil, what is better than helping the slaves become the masters? I don't know, though. I think that's worth another video at some point, but all of these are my opinions. What are yours? Okay, finally, the Dominion is doing something outwardly evil. We get to talk about it. Are you happy? Are you happy? Like previous episodes of the series, the Dominion have finally started to do something evil versus just saying that they are evil. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's talk about DS9's The Quickening and Apocalypse Rising. While, at some point, I do intend to do a thorough breakdown of the episode The Quickening, for the purposes of this series, I'll only note that we finally observe an action by the Dominion that can't really be justified, namely, utilizing biological agents to win a war. They had no reason to actually do this. The Jem'Hadar could have won the war, but the Founders, again, just wanted to set an example. In the next episode, Apocalypse Rising, the Klingon Empire has officially declared war upon the Federation, and Starfleet is getting the absolute living hell beat out of it. I've discussed this before, but it amazes me how badly Starfleet is getting the living hell beat out of them. This is even with forewarning. Galron specifically states that he will be attacking the Federation. They have a couple of days to prepare, and Starfleet is caught completely off guard. They are just getting absolutely pulverized. Looking at the war proper, most areas in or around the Klingon border are dangerous for Starfleet personnel. This includes the Bajoran sector, apparently. And while I'm not surprised, it is curious to see the Klingons not respect Bajoran borders. It makes sense that, unlike the Dominion, the Klingon Empire would not distinguish between Bajor and the Federation. I wish we would have seen the political fallout of Klingon hostilities on Bajoran politics, though. Maybe have Bajoran politicians move for Starfleet to withdraw as shipping lanes are put in harm's way. Perhaps Kira arguing they have to stand behind Starfleet because Sisko is basically Bajoran Jesus. But alas, it's not meant to be. Thanks to Odo, Starfleet Intelligence has determined that Galron, the head of the Klingon Empire, is, in fact, a changeling. A 
Starfleet infiltration team is dispatched to prove Gowron is a spy. With an entire federation spanning hundreds of planets, species that have the ability to read minds, and even some that are good with deception, of course Starfleet would send the captain of Deep Space Nine, its chief engineer, a former changeling, and someone considered traitor to the Klingon Empire. Because when you're Starfleet, you think sending someone with intricate and detailed tactical knowledge of the Bajoran system, one of the best engineers Starfleet has, the only changeling on your side, and a traitor is a great idea. <coughs> and yeah, I know, Odo is a solid right now, but he would still be considered a changeling in the eyes of the Klingons. With the team in place, they are given modified Polaron emitters. The radiation from these emitters would revert any changeling back to their gelatinous form. Sisko seeks out Dakot, who has a captured bird of prey, to sneak past enemy lines and use the experimental devices. One curious point here. While on their way, they elaborate on how the spies will get in. Namely, the computer systems of the Klingons will be hacked and information inserted. This is the command center and will include Gowron and the Klingon High Command, and it can be accessed by a stolen bird of prey that is ran by Cardassians? While consistent with the nature of Klingons, I'll grant, it makes me wonder why Starfleet isn't corrupting Klingon computer systems all across the galaxy. The infiltration team would determine that Martok, not Gowron, was the changeling only after the near assassination of the Chancellor, but who's really paying attention. While the war would not officially end, a ceasefire would occur and negotiations begin. In my original version of the Dominion War, I tried to stretch this out, but honestly, this episode more tells and not shows. We don't see a lot of the Dominion War. We don't know exactly what is going on, but we do know that Starfleet is losing. That said, there is an episode that really breaks down how just horrific the Klingons are being here. So stay tuned for next time when we take a look at Nor the Battle Too Strong. While this is out of order, I felt that it would be important to follow the Dominion War series with a look at DS9's Nor the Battle Too Strong. I find it to be an interesting look at how the Klingons act as well as a wonderful piece on war. Let's just get into it. One of the things I love about this episode is its focus on Jake. We rarely get to see a story that's focused on this character specifically, which is unfortunate. The character is largely used as a prop for Benjamin Sisko, a supporting character in almost every sense of the word. And I hate that because I think Sirik Lofton is quite a good actor. The episode begins with Jake trying to write a bio of Bashir for a news outlet and finds that it's not as easy as it looks. This, to me, shows that Jake is really new to being a journalist as he feels like he needs a plague or a war to make it interesting. We find out that this is his first writing gig, which is kind of comforting to know that news agencies of the future are just like now. They're not worried about journalists who have a background or can actually do the job, just someone that can write a puff piece. While Jake and Bashir are on their way back to the station, the Klingon War breaks out again. Agilon Prime is under siege, with Klingon troops landing and invading settlements, and the main hospital has already been hit hard. We can't be sure why Agilon Prime was attacked, whether it was a strategic move or the first thing the Klingons could find. We also can't be sure why the Klingons renege on the peace negotiations, though given what we know of the species at this point, it doesn't really take much to set them off. What we do know is that the Federation forces are taking an absolute beating. It looks as if the colony is going to fall with two settlements already under Klingon control. What I think is odd is that the Klingons are clearly in control over both the planet and the space around it. They are able to get troops on the ground and the Federation can't stop them. The colonists are even moving things underground to protect against attacks, so why aren't Klingon ships orbiting the planet? The runabout comes in and is able to orbit the planet unopposed and set down somewhere. It's possible the Klingons left, maybe they are back to a blitzkrieg mentality, attacking a planet, setting down troops, and then moving on, but that seems short-sighted. That said, it really is the only plausible explanation I have, however, so let me know if you guys can think of anything else. Regardless, the shuttle sets down and finally Jake gets to see what war really looks like. Namely, that there are a lot of hurt people and as many, if not more, dead people. And that's the summation of war in a nutshell, isn't it? Soldiers, usually young, running into battle and being brought back behind the lines in stretchers or in body bags. And unfortunately, it's not just the soldiers that pay the price, we see children as well. It's one of the first sobering events that Jake experiences. The writing of the episode at this point, I think, is done very well. As we see almost immediately after a child being comforted and moved away, a man stumbling in, claiming to be hit in the leg with a disruptor. It's discovered that he wasn't hit with a disruptor, 
but a phaser. Interestingly, everyone assumes that the man did it to himself, which he did. However, it is possible that a Klingon had utilized a phaser in the midst of combat, and the man just described a disruptor because it's war and things get confusing. Though, as stated, he actually did do it to himself, and I won't be revisiting his story specifically, but the attitudes of how he is attended to are both natural and telling. The man is treated as if he has betrayed his uniform. First, it shows how understanding and sympathetic the evolved humans are to look at him as lesser, but it's also understandable that they do. People are dying out there, every day. Entire settlements are struggling for their freedom, and here he was, trying to get out of it by shooting himself in the leg. What's sad is that we can all see ourselves in this man, not wanting to die, but we all hope that we're better than him. Jake is pulled into service and becomes one of the orderlies that assists with the living and the dead. He helps to take the deceased to the morgue to get the wounded on bio beds, and he sees what happens in war when someone dies. They are put into a body bag and thrown in a pile, anklets attached so it's shown who they are. As Jake continues to assist, he doesn't even notice that his uniform is becoming more and more covered in blood. Everyone in the hospital was waiting for Starfleet to come and save them. Unfortunately, relief wouldn't come to Agilon Prime as the USS Farragut, a ship tasked with saving them, is caught off guard and destroyed. Let's pause a moment. Once Sisko realizes the Farragut has been destroyed, he takes the Defiant to go and assist. We'll ignore the fact that previously he didn't want the vessel moved from the station for any reason due to the Klingon War originally, and now is okay with it because it's his son. We'll give him that, again it's his son. But in a military structure, generally you have to get approval to make movements of valued military assets. Especially if you are moving the only ship from a very strategic and vital place to one that is arguably not as important. We have no indication that Sisko ever got approval and it's clear he is doing it to ensure his son is safe. How does he not get in trouble for this? Yeah, it's a nitpick I'll grant, but it's worth discussing. Moving on with the episode, I can't help but chuckle a bit. In my past video, a couple of people stated that the Klingons never took Arcanus, and yet, in this episode, it's clearly stated that the Federations pull out. Now, you could argue that they hadn't pulled out before, but even then, the hold on the Arcanus sector had to be pretty weak. Insert sexual joke here. We see a nice little piece between Bashir and another doctor who discusses who is heading up the effort to retake the Arcanus sector, including the USS Tecumseh. Her husband is aboard the ship, he's a science officer, and we see that the war is much bigger than just those who are in the series. The episode moves back to Jake, working as a grunt. He's approached by one of the orderlies who discusses how badly the fight is going. One of the security personnel estimate that the colony will be overran and the Klingons will take it in a day or so. This terrifies Jake and he even talks about it in his article. He discusses how it felt different being on a planet versus when he's on Deep Space Nine and that station is under attack. He considers how it may be due to his father not being there, but I have to agree with the first theory that he states. He's actually seeing what war real war is like. When you're on a station behind a barrier and you don't see the death, the carnage, it's not as real. Everything changes when you have to look a man in the eyes who's dead. That's not to say there isn't misery when the station is attacked, but to be more in a situation where it is completely hopeless and you don't have a large space station with big weapons on it, it's dissimilar to say the least. Jake doesn't even realize how screwed he is just yet. As Jake and the others sleep, a massive explosion rocks their location. The Klingons have hit the main power source of the facility, and both he and Bashir must travel to the runabout to get generators so that they can keep the power on. If they don't, people are going to die. Jake and Bashir can't utilize transporters due to the shielding, and there aren't any other generators available in the facility. So they'll have to travel about a kilometer away. For those, like me, who don't utilize kilometers, that's just shy of a mile, roughly about 0.62 of a mile to be exact. Here's a question, why did they land the runabout so far away? I mean, it's possible it's the closest place, but the area they came out of seems to have plenty of landing area. Additionally, the runabout would likely grant a huge advantage. Sure, the Klingons are shooting hoppers left and right out of the sky, but from what we understand in dialogue, a runabout is much stronger than a hopper ever could be, and the Klingons have no ships in space. Or at least they didn't. You could utilize the shuttle for orbital bombardment, perhaps to take out those jammers that are preventing transport, or to give covering fire for the settlements. Again, I'm sure we could come up with reasons why it's not there, but that's doing the work for the writers at this point. Back to the episode, Bashir and Jake make their way towards the runabout and come under shelling. Bashir is hit right in front of Jake, and now, with chaos happening all around him, watching what appears to be his protector and guardian on the ground, possibly dead, the evolved human Jake turns around and runs. He runs even though he knows that half of the people in the medical ward will die if he doesn't get that generator. 
that people are counting on him. While some may judge Jake for this, I honestly don't. He's only acting human. It's really easy to judge someone when you're not in that situation. Jake races in random directions, finding himself falling over dead Klingons with red blood, apparently. He has somehow stumbled onto a battlefield, and while continuing on even faster after seeing that, he runs over a hill and is hit with the butt of a blaster rifle to his face. He finds a dying security officer, the man that assaulted him because he thought Jake was a Klingon. The security personnel asks for a hypo, and Jake passes it to him. The officer is hurt, his uniform in tatters and blood everywhere. He demands that Jake helps set him up. He wants to die looking into the sky. His duty had been simple. He was to defend and assist his platoon so that they could get in a hopper and get off the ground. Given the lack of wreckage, it would seem that they were successful, though we never find out whether it was or wasn't for sure. The evolved human Jake tries to justify to himself why he abandoned all those people to their deaths at the medical ward. He ultimately is able to talk himself into believing that there is a higher purpose for him running, to find the security officer and bring him back. Given that a large majority, if not all, Terrans don't believe in a god or gods, the security officer doesn't let him get away with it. The officer would die telling him that he made the wrong choice, and life doesn't grant absolution in that way. Jake, horrified at what he's seen and what he's done, runs back to the hospital. I'll say this, dude has some stamina on him and is crazy fit. Everyone is happy to see him. He would come to find that Bashir got back to the compound by himself with the generator. A job that was meant for two people was done by him. Though in future episodes, we find out that he is superhuman, so not as big of a feat. When Bashir sees Jake, he's relieved and apologetic for leaving him behind, which only makes Jake feel worse. Now, I've given Jake a lot of guff throughout this analysis, calling him an evolved human as a way of mocking him, but at roughly the 33 minute mark, Jake admits that he is a coward and is afraid, that he doesn't feel that he can be relied on. While some may find this pathetic, I think it's probably one of the more admirable traits. I say this unironically when I think that this is what an evolved human would do. Jake is facing who and what he is, which is more than what we do today, dealing with much less. The last point when Jake would be reminded of his mortality without having to defend himself would be when his friends start joking about the deaths that they would be facing. We don't see them again and that's a shame. I would have loved to seen them reading his article and how they felt about it. However, to hone in on the piece and not talk about what wouldn't be, all of them are joking and relaxed as I've mentioned. This again is something natural and even human, though some of them aren't that said species. Laughter is a great way to deal with peril and the ending of your life. In fact, let it be said now that when I die at my funeral, I want there to be a comedian there and I want there to be someone making balloon animals if any kids come. I mean, how cool would that be? Comedy is a coping mechanism like anything else. Unfortunately, Jake's guilt prevents him from allowing them to have that. He yells at them and brings reality down crashing on them. All of that would be brief and wouldn't last though as the next thing Jake knows, the compound is being attacked. People are trying to get the wounded out as the Klingons assault the hospital directly. Jake finds himself under a table until he can't stay there any longer and is forced back with the security personnel who attempt to defend him and the others. They pay it with their lives. With both officers killed and no other real option, Jake picks up a phaser rifle and begins firing on the Klingons. Though he uses the rifle wildly, the charge is causing the cave to fall in. By bringing the ceiling down and sealing off the cave entrance, the entirety of the hospital staff and their patients are able to get away. He saved everyone. The writer would be called a hero, though Jake didn't consider himself such. In my mind, I do think he was one though. Whether we do an act out of cowardice, fear, or bravery to save a person, the result is the same. People are saved. Our emotions don't necessarily have to be negative when used appropriately. Jake picked up a phaser because he didn't want to die, and people were saved. Do you think those patients gave a damn that he did it out of fear? And honestly, should we? I don't think so. The attack on Agilon Prime, its uselessness, and the Klingons going after a medical facility will be discussed in another video. Ultimately, I think that this was a great episode on how civilians, even evolved ones, deal in these scenarios. But those are my thoughts. What are yours? What's up, Lore Masters? This is a supplemental video to my previous episode, The Civilian View of the Klingon and Dominion War. Ultimately, there are a few things that I wanted to expand on as they address questions that DS9's Nor the Battle Too Strong bring up. First is the attack on Agilon Prime. This can be perplexing. Agilon Prime, as far as the research I can find, is near the Klingon Federation border. Now let's think about that. This means that the Federation had some sort of medical conference that was halfway across the galaxy. 
Additionally, both Jake and Bashir decided to attend it for one reason or another. This conference, again, being right next to a largely aggressive government that the Federation was currently at war with, but respecting a ceasefire. Also, apparently, you can get from DS9 to the Klingon Federation border in three days. For the record, we can't get mad at the DS9 writers for this. It was actually a Discovery episode and map that places Agilon Prime in the location that it's found. Unless there are two Agilon Primes, which, I guess if I'm being charitable, it's possible after the Klingon War of 2256 and 2257 that the colonists moved to the opposite end of the Federation, packed up all their bags and all that. The naming of the new planet as the exact same as the old is... Kind of odd, though. Now let's discuss the Klingon attack of the hospital. We know that, at least from the Federation's view, Klingons attack medical centers. I even was pretty critical of Bashir for turning down guards at the first battle of Deep Space Nine. However, the more I research the Klingons, the more confusing I find the race to be. In the original series, the television series specifically, the Klingons were mustache twirling villains that would do anything to win. In the original series movies, most movies at least, they were a culture that was focused on honor. Not honor defined as you have to be in battle or combat or something stupid like that, but honor for the Empire. If you were a scientist, a warrior, a cook, the guy who mopped the floors, as long as you did it for the glory of the Empire and you did it to the best of your abilities, you brought honor to your family. In TNG, DS9, and Voyager, Klingons were warriors that equated honor with battle, sometimes just bloodthirsty killing, sometimes actual honorable combat, if such a thing exists. In Enterprise, the Klingons were bloodthirsty, not united, and weird. Discovery would try to talk about honor, but really the Klingons were effectively the television toss era Klingons just in worse makeup and also probably sexual deviants that arguably committed sexual assault. So the attacks on the settlement and then moving to attack the hospital for the Klingons here is in character it would seem. The Klingons justify it to themselves that by killing those in their bed in combat, they are giving them an honorable death, and they're probably doing the same for all of the different staff just neutralizing combatants. The more I watch and study the Dominion War arc, which includes the Klingon War, the less impressed with the Klingons I am during this era. You can truly see the corruption and decay of the Empire. Honestly, even though it disappoints me, it's really good writing because it does make me feel something. In fact, the entire war, all of this death, is needless and useless as we've discussed. Many attribute this war to the pride of Galron, but I think that's wrong. It's probably that the Empire is so brittle, its infrastructure so weak, that Galron knows if he has to admit that the war with the Federation was a mistake, he would be dethroned. So, he has to continue the war to stay in power, because the Empire can't stand a leader that made the best choice for the Alpha Quadrant in the end, if it means that leader was wrong. Another theory that I recently read from a commenter is that the ceasefire was broken by a rival house of Galron wishing to weaken his stance. Which, while there's evidence that Galron has rivals that would do this and want to depose him, we don't have confirmed evidence of it. That said, I don't hate the idea. It may be the case and would be an interesting expansion on the story if CBS decided to do it. As I stated before, this war was not only useless, but it hurt the Federation and the Klingon Empire. Because of this, they would be much less likely to defeat the Dominion. It was wonderfully played by the villains. And as I said, in retrospect, it's honestly a really well done arc. One that makes me hate the Dominion, become disappointed in the Klingons, and fear for the Federation. Which is what episodes like this should do. But all of this is my opinion. What's yours? Let me know in the comments below. What's up, Lore Masters? So before we begin, let me say that there was a really good reason that I put off doing DS9's Hippocratic Oath and not breaking it down in sequence like I have done for most of the Dominion War series. The reason definitely isn't that I thought it happened later in the series, so don't even think that. Just shut up, and if you can do a better job, make your own channel. With that out of the way, let's just get into it. For this breakdown, we are only going to be focusing on Dr. Bashir and Chief O'Brien's interaction with the Jim Hadar and the White. I won't be focusing on any of the other nuances, at least for this video. The episode begins with Julian Bashir and Chief O'Brien returning from a biological survey. Because if there's one person you want to do a survey of biological entities, it's a chief engineer that is trained to fix machines. As the two are returning, earlier than expected, to DS9, they engage in a conversation about O'Brien and his issues with his wife, Keiko. Oh, fun fact, during the run of the series, the Bajoran language would change a little bit, which was pretty cool. The Bajorans would begin to utilize the name Keiko to mean nag, an unreasonable human being. It's always fun when they incorporate and show how one culture is impacting the other, especially when using a supporting character. 
Looking at the ongoing issues that O'Brien has with his wife, it would seem that the trouble is he set up a shop so that he can work on machines in their bedroom. He didn't think this would be a big deal since Keiko doesn't live there apparently and even by his own words only visits him. Well of course, the person who doesn't live there and only daylights as a wife would have issues with it even though it barely impacts her. Bashir is understanding at first and O'Brien states that he wishes Keiko was more like a man and then becomes physically uncomfortable with the prospect. So the everyman that people associate with has issues with women having male attributes. And then the doctor mildly mocks him about how funny it'd be for O'Brien to be with a man. Let's hope Discovery fans don't ever watch this episode. I mean, the episode explores deep concepts and it doesn't make half the country feel like they aren't worth anything, so I doubt they'll be watching it, but you never know. The conversation is cut short as sensors detect a magneton pulse, possibly indicating a damaged warp core which could lead to someone being in trouble. While investigating, the runabout is hit with an energy surge, draining the power and pulling the runabout down. O'Brien is able to quote unquote crash land without anyone getting hurt. However, they are captured by the Jem'Hadar and the Jem'Hadar state that they are prisoners of the Jem'Hadar. Not the Dominion, but the Jem'Hadar. Interesting. Another piece, we never get definitively what brought the runabout down. It can be inferred, since the Jemadar are already there, that it was them, but it's never outright stated. Also, curiously, this is the first time we ever see and hear someone say that the Chief is actually a quote-unquote non-com. Well, at least to my knowledge, I don't think they ever called other officers that before, or, well, I mean, since TNG they haven't. The two Starfleet officers are about to be executed by the Jemadar when they learn Julian Bashir is a doctor. On that score, Julian is extremely chatty and giving off information to the Jemadar left and right, telling them how they found the planet, which allows the Jemadar to now hide their signature, making it harder for the two to be found, advising that there aren't any other officers aboard and honestly Julian could really learn from LaForge about protocol once captured. O'Brien, having past military experience, even advises Bashir as such when they are left alone, he tells him not to help the Jem'Hadar any further than he has as it does weaken them. The Jem'Hadar first would have Bashir brought before him and has an odd request. He wants the doctor to help the Jem'Hadar free themselves from the Ketra Cell White so they won't be burdened by the Vorta. After being forced to see the Jem'Hadar suffer, Bashir agrees to assist. Of course, he says that he will need O'Brien's assistance to get this done. The two Starfleet officers make plans to escape, which is ultimately foiled and ends up in destroying the leg of one of the Jem'Hadar. Instead of killing the injured man, the Jem'Hadar first takes him back to the ship and tries to heal him, stating that they are not bound by the ways of the Vorta. This is interesting and somewhat compelling, honestly. It does show that the first may be sincere about wanting to change and that they could cure the Jem'Hadar. After this foiled attempt at escape, Julian sits down and talks in earnest with the first. He learns of the first's disdain for the Vorta and even the founders. The First even shows the Doctor he is not addicted to the White himself. Julian becomes convinced that the First does want to be free and that he wants to take his own Jim Hadar and live peaceably. When he conveys this to O'Brien, the Chief counters how free Jim Hadar could be more dangerous than even what the Dominion have. Without the Founder's control, the Jim Hadar could begin to make their own nation or even attack the Federation. Miles refuses to help but is ordered by Julian to get the components from the runabout so that the good doctor can earnestly try to cure all of them. However, even with his orders, O'Brien is able to escape his Jem'Hadar guard with a tricorder by pretending to assist them but actually activating the transporter and being able to beam away. This causes the Jem'Hadar that are still addicted to the white to turn on the first. They begin searching for O'Brien intent on murdering him regardless of being ordered just to take him alive. The first goes out to protect O'Brien on the condition that Julian will stay behind and continue to work, which he does. Ultimately, O'Brien is able to outwit one of the addicted Jim Hadar and takes his weapon. The engineer finds Julian alone and tries to talk him into getting to the runabout so they can escape. The doctor refuses, saying he will stay and help them. O'Brien points out, rightly, that the men are out for blood and are going to kill both of them if they stay. Julian tries to counter that the first will protect them, but O'Brien doesn't believe him and has no choice but to destroy Julian's equipment and force him to leave at gunpoint. Before they can get away, the first returns, disarming O'Brien and forces them to begin walking towards the runabout. The Jemadar second is actually at the runabout, looking for O'Brien and is executed by the Jemadar first. He tells them both to leave while he goes to kill his men before they can succumb to the torture that is having no Ketracel White. 
Interestingly, the ship can leave with absolutely no problems, and that's never discussed again. So you're telling me that the addicted Jim Hadar won't try to stop them again and just pull the ship right back down? Does the energy replenish in the runabout? It was all supposedly drained, so I'm not completely sure how they were able to get away. There are a lot of themes in this episode that are worthy of exploring, but for the Dominion lore specifically, it's Julian's actions and the responses of O'Brien I want to discuss. I'll circle back to this episode one day to look at the rest. Ultimately, it comes down to Julian wanting to help and believing that the freed Jim Hadar would be peaceable and not want war. He wants to free the slaves. This would also cripple the Dominion. However, O'Brien counters that they have no way of knowing how the Jim Hadar would react and that at least the Dominion were keeping them in check. Remember, there was no official war right now. The only thing stopping the Jim Hadar from murdering everyone in the Alpha Quadrant, in theory at least, was the Founders. In the end, I believe that Chief O'Brien was in the right. Julian was correct when he stated Miles made a choice to destroy the equipment, stop the studies, and condemn every one of those Jim Hadar to death. However, it wasn't the call of Julian nor O'Brien to decide to free the Jim Hadar. They have no idea what repercussions that would bring. To bring up a future point, for every genetically modified human you have, yes, you're going to have a Bashir, but you're also going to have a Khan. These decisions can't be made so flippantly. Now, I know, I know, this video will cause a lot of people to try and point out some form of hypocrisy on my part. How I talk about the Federation Starfleet willing to work with the Dominion even though they have slave labor, and now I'm saying that Julian was in the wrong to free them. Hell, I'm sure someone's going to bring up how I talked about my feelings when it comes to the Vidians and how they should have probably gotten replicator tech and utilized it in that episode. And I'm sure they'll say that that is somehow hypocritical. But here's the thing, I like being nuanced. I'm not saying that Starfleet shouldn't try to free the Jim Hadar. I'm saying that it shouldn't be the decision of one man, and it should be done with a lot more care. Janeway was in a different situation, where unilateral decisions was all she had. And the pros of that decision were probably better than the cons. In this instance, Bashir helping unilaterally has far more cons than it does pros. Bashir had the opportunity to try to take these men back to Starfleet Medical, or at least take back the studies. He chose not to. He chose to stay there and try to help that way. But honestly, Starfleet was there and he should have utilized them. But those are my thoughts. What are yours? In early 2373, the Federation, Klingon, and Romulan Star Empire stood together to defeat the oncoming Dominion fleet. Before the war had even begun, Klingons, Romulans, and the varied races of Starfleet prepared to fight and die together to save their people. And this one brief moment of unity almost caused them to lose the entire Alpha Quadrant. Before I get too far into the DS9 episodes In Purgatory's Shadow and By Inferno's Light, I want to go back and discuss something that occurred in the DS9 episode, Hippocratic Oath. I didn't bring it up then because I didn't feel it was relevant to the purpose of that episode, but is extremely relevant here. In that episode, there is a meeting of the DS9 crew discussing the Klingon Empire's erratic and aggressive behavior. In the scene, we're told that the Klingons have attacked three Romulan outposts along the Klingon-Romulan border. Bajoran intelligence, and I assume Starfleet intelligence as well, are stating that the Klingons are looking for weakened outposts along any of their borders and attacking to gain more power and territory. This is worth noting for what is to come, but also discuss how patient both the Federation and Romulans appear to be. The Klingons are attacking anywhere they can, and neither Starfleet nor the Romulan military decide to push back. This is quite likely due to the fact that both realize the threat of the Dominion, or perhaps neither side are really in a position for a sustained war. It's also compelling because the Klingons described here, and in the episodes we will be covering, are erratic, hide behind honor in name only, and don't appear to know anything about actual military strategy. I dare say they are acting like Discovery Klingons, if not the actual original series Klingons themselves. It's just something really worth observing. Looking at the two episodes we will be focusing on, we catch yet another escalatory step by the Dominion. Previously, the totalitarian state had some clout and could at least portray the Federation as the aggressors to the Alpha Quadrant. But now, after their scheming, after all their lies with the Klingon infiltrator and getting caught causing wars, they decided that they were ready, ready to take it to the next step. 
For most of the series up to this point, the Dominion has been working in the background with subtle manipulations to tweak events. The Klingon-Cardassian War destroyed the infrastructure of the Cardassians. The Klingon Federation War weakened both the Federation and the Klingons. While we can't be sure to the extent, we know the Romulans had also been in battle and thus taken casualties and lost themselves. The attacks of the Klingons would additionally make the Romulans very distrustful of the Empire, ensuring an alliance would be unlikely between all three. And now, with all the pieces in place, the Dominion makes its move. While plans for an invasion into the Alpha Quadrant are underway, an encrypted Cardassian message is received by Deep Space Nine. Garrick is tapped to decipher the message and deceives the crew, pretending that it was something inconsequential. Of course, Julian isn't fooled and catches Garrick trying to steal a runabout. We can't be sure exactly when, but we do know that Bashir had been captured by this point and a changeling put in his place. So in effect, the entity that actually caught Garrick isn't really Bashir. Whether the real Julian would have realized what Garrick is up to or not, we'll never know. Sisko tasks Worf and Garrick to search out the distress call. Oh, that's what it actually was that Garrick had realized. It was a distress call from his mentor, meaning that there were actually survivors from the attack on the fleet we had talked about beforehand. A breakdown of the episode with Worf and Garrick will be in the near future, but isn't a part of what we're analyzing here. Though, just to note, while trying to find any survivors or prisoners, Garrick and Worf do discover the Dominion fleet on the way and are able to get a distress signal out warning the crew of DS9. The Defiant is dispatched by Cisco to confirm what was occurring and the station is set on yellow alert. As all of this is happening, listening posts in the Gamma Quadrant begin to go silent and the Defiant returns to confirm that the Dominion are on the move. Cisco calls the command staff, along with Dukat, to discuss current events. Interesting note of continuity here, even if some of it doesn't make a ton of sense. Cisco breaks down the situation, stating that the Klingons are in shambles, the Romulans not being better off, and points out that between the Klingon Federation War and the Borg attack, Starfleet is spread thin. Now the only Borg attack that he could be referencing here is the Battle of Sector 001. This confirms that the Sovereign does exist in this universe, sorry conspiracy theorists, and that Starfleet was in bad shape. However, in that battle, the Defiant was absolutely totaled. So not only did they repair the Defiant and get it back into action in an unreasonable amount of time, but also got it back to the station. Okay. The fleet strength of the Dominion is at least 50 ships. Starfleet has the station, the Defiant, and Dukat ship, with a relief fleet being two days away at maximum warp. That's also assuming the ships can sustain maximum warp for that long. Many can't. Which again, I guess I should know, why isn't there a fleet already here? Let's not even count the Bajorans having ships. Let's talk about how Starfleet constantly does not have any other ships but the Defiant and Deep Space Nine when they always knew this was a possibility. And should I really talk about all the times the station has been attacked and damaged from the Klingons, Dominion, and other species? I mean, seriously? With no way of stopping the Dominion, the plan is to close the wormhole. Kira, of course, objects to this, but Space Jesus Sisko talks about how gods always find a way to communicate and, while he doesn't want to, it's the only way to protect Bajor. If only there was some way they could talk to the prophets and have them actually stop the fleet that was incoming. But I guess that's never going to be a thing. Of course, the Changeling Bashir sabotages the equipment so that, instead of closing the wormhole, the attempt ensures it stays stable and that it cannot be closed going forward. At this point, I want to pause to discuss Dukat. This will only be in passing because I'm going to do a video dedicated to his actions here, but Dukat insists that Zial come with him. Of course, we know that in the future Dukat will betray Deep Space Nine and that he believes the station is about to be destroyed, so he insists that she comes with him. She chooses not to and he will believe that she had made her choice to be with the traitors and let her go. Here's the thing. Dukat will say that he had been in talks with the Dominion for several weeks. I wonder if one of the reasons for Bashir to be replaced is for these talks. Did Dukat know that Bashir was a changeling this entire time? Something we're going to break down in a later video. As stated, Zyal would decline going with him and Dukat leaves without her. All of the listening posts in the Gamma Quadrant would go dark. And then after a few minutes, dozens of Dominion warships would begin screaming out of the wormhole to face one lone Bajoran station with the Defiant. Last time we discussed the Dominion War, dozens of Jim'Hadar ships were screaming out of the wormhole. The only defenses the Federation and Bajorans had was Deep Space Nine, the Defiant, and a bird of prey. Those on the station expected this to be the last stand for them. What actually occurred was, arguably, far, far worse.
If you haven't yet, please watch the video in the description or click in the top right hand corner as a lot of the two episodes we are covering today have been already addressed there. Continuing on with the analyzation of In Purgatory's Shadow and By Inferno's Light, we have already discussed how everything up to this point ensured that a Dominion fleet of around 50 ships are able to enter into the Alpha Quadrant. Once arriving, the Dominion would not engage the station but turn and set course for Cardassia. Dukat's ship falls into formation with it, but not before being ordered back when Kira mistakes his movements for an attack run. Dukat advises Kira that Cardassia had, in fact, joined the Dominion. And then, Kira decides that, screw the fact that they had all just survived, she was angry at Dukat, and by God, she's going to hurt him. Even if it means getting every man, woman, and child killed on Deep Space Nine, she orders the Defiant to attack Dukat's ship. Jadzia retorts that the ship was already out of range, and I'm sure praying that Kira wouldn't realize that they could technically use Impulse or Warp to catch up. I'm going to pause a moment here and actually discuss Dukat's decision, as well as some of the Cardassian governments, I'm sure at least some of the upper echelon had to agree to this, to join the Dominion. If you've watched me for a measure of time, you probably know how I feel, but for those who haven't gotten mad because I understand how things work realistically, I honestly cannot fault the Cardassians for joining the Dominion. The Klingons attack the U Union for no reason, claiming the Cardassians were under the control of the Dominion. The Federation didn't buy this, of course, and saved the leader, sure, but didn't help the Cardassians militarily. The infrastructure of the Cardassian Union was destroyed and they were barely able to survive. So if they are going to be blamed for being Dominion puppets, might as well reap the benefits of actually being said puppets. Sisko and the others look at this as some big betrayal, but it honestly isn't. I dare say the Vulcans would call it logical. While I understand that all of this was orchestrated by the Dominion to a degree, you have to remember that the Klingons didn't exactly give up their territory or raids after Martok was found to be a changeling. And even after Starfleet proved that Martok was a changeling, what did the Federation do? Nothing. Additionally, we know that the Maquis began attacking the Cardassians in earnest and the Federation was so busy with other things, they no longer kept them in control. Remember, the Maquis were winning the war as pseudo-allies of the Klingons, a topic we will get into in the near future, worry not. The Cardassians didn't fail the Alpha Quadrant, the Alpha Quadrant failed the Cardassians. So with the Federation arguably tacitly allowing the attacks on Cardassian space and the Klingon seemingly unstoppable, the Dominion is the best option for the survival of the Cardassian people. And so, with the Union's joining of the Dominion, the Founders have a foothold within the Alpha Quadrant. While I wanted to point out the hostile nature of sending dozens of warships into Bajoran space, it's not like the Federation really observed the borders of the Dominion. They even balked at the idea of not being allowed to go wherever they wanted in some episodes. So I guess we'll just call it even for the Dominion doing it here given how much infringement the Federation is known for. But I will say, this is an extremely aggressive action by the Dominion and one not to be taken lightly. However, even with this move, technically the Founders haven't done anything wrong publicly. Yet. They've moved ships into Cardassian space, but given that Cardassia is now a member state, it makes sense. The real concern is when Dukat's speech says he will be retaking everything that was lost by Cardassia and then reaches out to Sisko. He encourages Sisko to push the Federation to join the Dominion. However, Sisko declines and Dukat states that he intends to retake everything that was lost, including Deep Space Nine. The captain tells the leader of Cardassia to come and get it. While DS9 prepares for the inevitable attack, the Changeling Bashir advises they should start blood screenings immediately, only proving that this methodology doesn't work. To be fair, most of the crew doesn't know that it doesn't work, so they will continue forward. It wouldn't be long into the preparations when a Klingon fleet arrives from Cardassia in space. The ships request assistance for aid as the vessels are badly damaged and there are many wounded Klingons. Galron explains how the Empire has been defeated in Cardassian space. His plan is to pull all of his assets back to their borders and make one final stand against the Dominion, for the Empire to go out in a blaze of glory. Sisko, and ironically the Changeling Bashir, convinces Galron to sign the Kittimer Peace Accords again, creating a buffer zone between the Dominion and the Klingon Empire. Curiously, the Dominion and the Cardassians would not pursue the Klingons into Federation space, only removing them from Cardassian territory. Which, again, isn't unreasonable and in fact does add some credibility to the fact that the Dominion just wants to help. In theory, just looking at it from the perspective of someone who is in the Alpha Quadrant, the Dominion arrives with 50 or so warships, 
and heads for Cardassian space to help them rebuild. We know they had a changeling infiltrator in the Klingon Empire, but the propaganda machine from the Dominion might try to spin that as them stopping the Klingons from harming more Cardassians. Again, we, as the audience, know that the Dominion is evil. We know better, but from a random person only reading the news from both sides, it's not as cut and dry. Especially when the Dominion just stops at the borders of Cardassia, at least for the moment. While all of this is going on, the Changeling Infiltrator continues working to sabotage Deep Space Nine, utilizing an industrial replicator. When the crew discovers the replicator's use, they have security begin pulling double shifts and Sisko asks the Klingons for help. Interestingly, Kira notes how times have changed with the Klingon Empire helping. For those of us who have come from the TNG era, we know the Klingons to be the allies of the Federation for longer than not. But from a Bajoran perspective, the Klingons had been the enemy, attacking and harming the people of Bajor. And now they were helping to protect it. It's a nice piece that adds to the universe and could be missed if you are someone who watches all the series. Then we come to the final confrontation. Dukat has stated that he will be retaking the station. A combined fleet of Klingon ships, Starfleet ships, runabouts, and Deep Space Nine stand ready to fight the Dominion. Suddenly, a Romulan fleet decloaks requesting permission to defend Deep Space Nine. As the defenders of Bajor stand ready, none of them are able to lock on to the incoming Dominion forces. Unfortunately, their targeting sensors can't find any actual ships out there. At this time, the station receives an emergency message from the Gamma Quadrant, from the Doctor. Given that the Doctor was supposedly on the station, Sisko realizes what has occurred and they are able to determine that the Changeling has commandeered the Yukon. Sisko orders the Defiant to destroy the runabout, but the Changeling was able to modify the vessel so the Defiant isn't able to destroy it. So apparently the Dominion are able to modify the shields of a glorified bus so that weapons designed to kill Borg can't impact it. Okay. A bit of a continuity gaffe with this as well. If you remember, Kira ordered the Defiant open fire on Dukat's Bird of Prey, and Dax says that he was out of range. And yet, they are able to attack the Yukon. The wormhole is much closer than the sun to the station. There's really no way the Bird of Prey could have been out of weapons range. I think this really confirms my theory that Dax was lying to Kira because she didn't want to die, nor want all the people on the station to die either. With no options left, Kira takes the Defiant to warp in a solar system, which is completely ludicrous, and we don't have dozens of examples of them doing this exact thing in other episodes, where sometimes it's a crazy big deal and sometimes it's not. The Defiant locks a tractor beam onto the Yukon, with the Yukon still having its shields up apparently, and is able to ensure that the ship won't reach the sun, which was the designated target of the Changeling to create a supernova that would destroy Bajor and the station, but somehow not the wormhole. The Changeling and all three Starfleet officers on board are killed. Somehow, Sisko instantly knows what was occurring, even though the Defiant hasn't let him know, and a scan for the Dominion fleet shows that the warp signatures that had been there were actually faked. This would be, in my opinion, the second largest and public mistake and action of war that an ordinary citizen in the Alpha Quadrant would be able to observe. The Dominion were willing to destroy an entire planet to take out the Federation and Klingons. Romulans were just the icing on the cake. This one action would show the Dominion going from being benefactors only wanting to help to showing their real bloody nature. And after all of this, we see that Sisko and the Federation agree to allow a permanent Klingon contingent on the station on Deep Space Nine, which is totally insane and couldn't happen. I am constantly told there isn't a fleet at Deep Space Nine because the Bajorans would never allow it. And the Federation doesn't get to decide what happens to Deep Space Nine. Except they're allowing the Klingons to stay here and deciding what happens on Deep Space Nine, and we would see ships there from now on. And just to put a finer point on this, the government that was attacking and slaughtering Bajorans and was known to be bloodthirsty is now the ones protecting them. But the Bajorans get to decide who's on the station. It is important to remember that technically, the Dominion War hasn't started yet. But the Dominion Cold War was about to heat up, and it would heat up fast. But that's a few episodes away. Stay tuned as next time we discuss the betrayal of Dukat and the Maquis question. What's up, Lore Masters? So I thought I'd take a moment to discuss the realization I had while breaking down the latest Dominion War episodes. I really want to delve into some of the intricacies about what may have occurred behind the scenes. We know that Bashir had been replaced for at least a month and that Dukat returned to the station due to quote-unquote battle damage to his ship. We can't be sure, but he could have stayed anywhere from a few days to just over a week before the attempted destruction of most everything in the Bajoran system due to the Dominion's attempt to destroy the Bajoran sun. Additionally, we're aware that Dukat Dukat pushes to get Zial off the station itself. He was almost trying to force her to board a transport that was meant for Cardassia. 
When she decides to stay and wait for Garrick, her father gives up on the woman, deciding that she had made her choice, which is an interesting decision given what we'll see in the future. Here's the question. Did Dukat actually return to the station so that he could finish negotiations with the Bashir changeling? Did he know about the infiltrator the entire time? It would make sense if Dukat had actually been in contact via subspace and then finished everything out with a face-to-face -face meeting. And what's a better way to meet up with a changeling than for him to go to Deep Space Nine? The changeling could also rely on Dukat to assist in any way that he could with the destruction of the Federation and Klingon fleets. Honestly, the more I think about it, the more I really break down the events, the more sense it makes. Also, just to address Dakot himself for a moment, many see him as a villain. I'll often see memes about him being chaotic evil on a scale with Dungeons and Dragons. I honestly believe that if we had to place Dakot within a framework, in this case Dungeons and Dragons, he would either be chaotic neutral, neutral, neutral evil, or lawful evil. For me, I'd probably place him at the beginning of the series as lawful evil following the laws of his culture. He would then move to neutral evil during the klingon cardassian War and stay that way for most of the series. I honestly don't believe he becomes chaotic evil until the writers decide to destroy his character later in the series. We'll talk on that in later episodes. But it's important to remember that when we look at people in a story, we will often classify these characters in terms of hero and villain. Another way to position it is protagonist and antagonist. Dukat is an antagonist, ultimately a villain, but he's not a villain because he's evil, at least initially. He's a villain because he has a flaw that he won't overcome, he won't change. Dukat is selfish and narcissistic. He believes that the Cardassians are a superior species and that he, as a Cardassian, is superior to others as well. Sometimes this narcissism lines up with a hero, such as when we see him during the Maquis issues, Klingon Cardassian War and Klingon Federation War, and sometimes it doesn't, such as in the first season and then during the Dominion War. The fact the fact is, Dukat was never evil to be evil, he always had a goal. He wasn't above betrayal of any one or any government if it assisted in furthering his beliefs that Cardassia should be in charge. It's because of these things that we can at least understand where he was coming from, perhaps even empathize in some situations. At least until the writers decided they hated that people could sympathize with a villain, god forbid that. But those are my opinions. What are yours? What's up, lore masters? This is going to be a pretty short video, but I want to discuss the agreement between the United Federation of Planets and the Bajoran Provisional Government regarding Deep Space Nine. Amazingly, there's not a lot of information regarding what the Federation's role was. Even in the first episode, it glosses over the finer details. We know that after the Cardassians left, the Federation was invited in almost immediately and Starfleet was welcomed to take full command of the station with the option of the command staff comprising only Starfleet personnel. The only reason Kuro was the XO and Odo, the security chief, was because Sisko and the Starfleet Admiral wanted them there. Sisko says as much about Kira in the first episode, and Odo is replaced with Eddington later in the series when Starfleet stops trusting Odo. So, at a minimum, we know that the station the Provisional Government invited the Federation to was to be completely under the command of Starfleet in its entirety. We can also infer that ultimately the Provisional Government wanted to join the Federation and that they just had to get their affairs in order to do so. It's ironic because basically, the Provisional Government wanted to cede their power for Federation citizens citizenship almost immediately. The reason why any of this is important is because I am constantly told time and again that the reason Deep Space Nine doesn't have a fleet around the station, at least until Sisko helps to re-sign the Kitamar Accords placing Klingon troops on Deep Space Nine, is due to Bajor not wanting foreign ships in their territory. Everything we see throughout the series indicates Bajor badly wants to be a part of the United Federation of Planets, or at least the leaders in charge do. There are certain individuals that aren't fans, Kura being one of them in the beginning, and even certain factions open openly rebelling against the Provisional Government and Starfleet. But on the whole, Starfleet appears to be a staple of Bajor, something welcomed. And here's my question. If the government is so keen on Starfleet, why not allow at least one or two ships stationed? You have the Defiant, what's one or two more? Even if we assume that it would cause too much of an internal conflict, certainly after the Cardassians attack the station, within the first week of Starfleet arriving, and then a Jem'Hadar terrorist attack, and after that, the first battle of Deep Space Nine, you'd think they'd be able to justify politically why a contingent of ships should be near. 
And if it's unrealistic that those events would change the minds of the Bajorans, how the hell do they justify allowing a Klingon task force being stationed there merely weeks to about a month of Klingons being hostile in Bajoran space? Now, if I had to write this to make sense, I would probably say that the Bajoran government wanted Starfleet ships in their territory from day one, knowing the Cardassians could come back at any point. But unfortunately, internal politics and factions that wanted war meant that they had to hold back. When Cisco becomes Space Jesus, and as time goes on, the more people get used to Starfleet being there, the more lax they'd become about seeing Starfleet ships. The politicians then utilize the Dominion threat as the reason to allow more drastic changes, like, again, allowing Klingon ships in their space. And this is possibly what could have happened, but unfortunately we don't have any indication of that. Again, I'm not completely sure, and these are my opinions. During this series, there have been a few times where the Maquis were involved, but I opted not to address it and wait until now. This is because, while the Maquis have some notable actions within the arc of the Dominion War, they are largely a minor player in all of it. But today, let's break down their actions and how ultimately, the Maquis were just the useful idiots for the Dominion. The rise, fall, decay, and destruction of the Maquis is an arc that is ultimately tragic. I've done several videos regarding the quote-unquote freedom fighters, and I'll link them in the top right-hand corner as well as in the description below. But what is important here is to know that they were placed in a position where they had some reasonable grievances, and arguably were justified in resisting Cardassian and Starfleet oppression. And yes, Starfleet oppression. You can't look at what happens in the next generation and tell me Starfleet aren't the baddies in it. However, unfortunately, I truly believe they lost sight of why they were fighting towards the end. It stopped being about kicking the Cardassians out of their territory and became joining the Klingons in the annihilation of the Cardassian Union and its military from the Alpha Quadrant. A lot of the conversations in previous episodes regarding the Dominion War have revolved around the fact that the Cardassians had been put in a position where they had no real option but to join the Dominion. This was largely due to Klingon aggression and Federation inaction, all manipulated by the Dominion in the background. During this time, however, the Maquis would see their chance to free themselves of a weakened Cardassian state. The problem is that by this point, they wanted to hurt the Cardassians not be free of them. We have some indication that the Maquis cells even started turning on the Cardassian civilians, which, while the civilians were happy to have the Union do their dirty work, they didn't all hurt the Maquis colonies. There would be little justification to hurt everyone that was a Cardassian. The fatal mistake was made here, to my estimation. Instead of being content with driving out the Cardassians, or applying for statehood, and not only declaring independence, but leaving the Cardassians to their fate, they would push into Cardassian space and begin assisting their Klingon allies and, well, genocide. The information on the Klingon-Maquis alliance is horrifically vague, but we do know that the Klingons and Maquis had an intricate agreement. The alliance was so strong that the Klingon Empire shared 30 Class IV cloaking devices. This brings up some issues to my mind's eye, though. First, it appears that other governments are giving out cloaking devices like they are candy in the DS9 era. I get the argument that these devices may not be the best technology, but you can still take old technology and improve upon it. It makes me honestly think that it's likely cloaking technology was now something any empire with enough money or enough resolve or tech could have, but they chose not to for one reason or another. Secondly, from what we learn in the episode, you can apparently strap a cloak to a nuke and then hit a planet sectors away and it not be able to be stopped. Many will say, no duh, but why the hell wasn't the Dominion, Klingon Empire, and Romulan Star Empire all doing this in spades? Some scream mutually assured destruction, but the Romulans are egotistical enough to believe that they wouldn't get hit, the Klingons enjoy dying in combat, and the Dominion doesn't care about solids. Also, doesn't the Dominion have the ability to detect cloaking technology, so I'm not sure why this is a huge issue. The Federation could have alerted them and they might have been able to stop it. And we do know that in the end they know about it anyway, so I guess if I was being fair, maybe the Federation was unaware that the Dominion knew about this and didn't want to alert them, but still, it's kinda iffy. Looking back at the Maquis, as stated, they would be pushing forward and have the Cardassians on the run at least until the Dominion came in and all of them would be killed. The Dominion would be able to rout the Klingons and utterly annihilate the Maquis. With the exception of the crew of Voyager, there wouldn't be anything left. Unfortunately, the more I research this, the more I find the Maquis to ultimately be misguided in the end. They may have been freedom fighters, they may have been fighting an oppressive regime, but ultimately they were empowered by the Klingon Empire that had been manipulated by the Dominion, and the Maquis went too far. 
From the resources that I have available, the writers were just done with the Maquis and wanted them gone. I feel like this was a misstep on their part. They should have had the Maquis attempt to form their own state. Perhaps even have a few episodes where the Maquis tried to be neutral between the Dominion and the Federation. Could have had some great arcs out of this, at least in my opinion. Whether the Maquis was the good guys or not ultimately becomes pointless because in the end, for the Dominion, they were just useful idiots. Since February 25th, 2019, I have discussed the prelude to the Dominion War. From the Golden Age of the Federation that ultimately created its pacifistic nature to the destruction of the Odyssey and ultimately the Cardassian Union joining the Dominion, we have watched the trials, the follies, and indeed the triumphs of Starfleet. Like with most conflicts, things would appear slow and tense. It wouldn't be until the last few days of peace that things would speed up very, very quickly. Today, let's discuss the beginning of the Dominion War. In the DS9 episode, A Call to Arms, we see that nerves are becoming more and more strained as everyone appears to be in a holding pattern. Starfleet officers are beginning to push for their family members not just to move off Deep Space Nine, but away from Bajor completely. Chief Miles O'Brien discusses sending his family to Earth. It's interesting to see the differences between the stationed officers and the civilians at this point. From everything we can see, the civilians are going about their business as if nothing was wrong, if nothing was happening. Well, with the exception of Cork, who begins buying Yamak sauce, I'm assuming that he's hedging his bets. But ultimately, everyone is still acting as if nothing is wrong. Starfleet and Bajoran personnel, however, are all but certain the station is going to be attacked. O'Brien lamenting that he wishes the Dominion would just get it over with. On that score, certainly the Dominion was preparing for something large. They had begun signing non-aggression pacts with the Romulans, the Miradorn, and even the Tholians. These agreements ensured that the Dominion didn't have to worry about them. With these pacts and the Dominion sending at least a convoy a week through the wormhole to Cardassia, Starfleet Command determined that the Dominion forces would no longer be allowed to continue to reinforce their Alpha Quadrant strongholds. Sisko and the crew of DS9 would have to set a plan in motion to begin mining the Celestial Temple. So let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room. This is definitively an aggressive act on the side of Starfleet. On paper, Starfleet did start the war and arguably was as hostile as the Dominion in both its inaction to stop the attempted genocide of the Founders and its consistent breach of the borders that the Dominion had laid out. However, it is also disingenuous to say that the Dominion was not aiming to start the conflict and did not have designs on the Federation the entire time. Studying it from a purely third party standpoint, the devious intent was certainly on the side of the Dominion. However, I do think that these events highlight how egotistical the Federation was and how unprepared Starfleet was to deal with an enemy that was as powerful as them. So in the end, did Starfleet start the war? Yeah, they did. However, war would have always been on the horizon. It was all just a matter of time and a matter of how. Back to the episode at hand. With the idea to create cloaked, self-replicating minds in place, everyone gets to work. This brings up two points as well though. First, so Starfleet can't utilize cloaking devices unless they strap them to a mine. You're telling me the Treaty of Algeron really isn't broken with this step and the Romulans aren't going to say anything? I do want to be fair though, so while I firmly believe the utilization of cloaked mines breaks the Treaty of Algeron, as does the consistent use of cloak with the Defiant, I have a theory that I think does actually fit. I'll expand on it more at some point, but here it is in a nutshell. Was the fact that we never see the Romulans attempt to force Starfleet to keep to its agreement to not use the mines or to stop using the cloak on the Defiant? Defiant because the Romulans were secretly supporting the Federation. Hear me out. The Romulan hierarchy certainly wished to diminish the Federation's influence, but they aren't idiots. Well, usually. They knew that a Dominion presence would be a larger threat than the Federation ever would be. So while the Star Empire didn't initially intend to get into the fight, because why pass up the chance to let Starfleet get the hell beat out of it, they were never going to back the Dominion, nor stay neutral. I sincerely believe the Romulans always intended to join the war and thus allowed these infractions to occur to ensure Starfleet could survive till they did. I think they looked the other way. After all, the Federation didn't have to lose for the Romulan Star Empire to win. And ultimately, if the plan worked out, the Romulans would look like heroes to the Alpha Quadrant when they came in to save the day. It's just a thought. Secondly, it's funny that when the Klingons tried to mine the Bajoran system in the DS9 episode, Sons of Moog, that it was considered a bad and hostile action. Yet Starfleet doing it now is somehow admirable or heroic. Huh. 
As preparations for the Dominion attack are underway, Odo stops all outbound communications from the station, because a changeling cutting off access to the rest of the Alpha Quadrant is exactly what everyone would want, so why not? None of these provisions would be effective though, as the Dominion quickly finds out of Starfleet's plan and a Vorta is dispatched. Weyoun would soon arrive to the station. He's a little known character you guys will never see again, so don't worry about him. The Vorta orders Sisko to remove the minefield, or Weyoun states that the Dominion would do it for him. Sisko counters that Dominion reinforcements would not be allowed through the wormhole going forward. After it was made clear that neither side would back down, both Sisko and Weyoun would try to lull the other into a false sense of security. And of course, neither side would believe the other. So the plan was set. The Defiant would be out setting the mines while Martok and his ship would watch the border. Once the Dominion comes across, the Ritaran, that's Martok's ship, would defend the Defiant. Starfleet would not be able to send any ships as reinforcements, and we'll discuss that in a later episode. Sisko then approaches the ministers of Bajor and convinces them to sign a non-aggression pact with the Dominion. This ensures that Bajor will be neutral during the Dominion War, assisting whichever side is in control of Deep Space Nine and the wormhole. With the signing of the pact, Bajorans are forced to evacuate the station, which again, for those who want to say Starfleet isn't solely in control of Deep Space Nine, here's a question. If Bajor was to be neutral at the beginning of the series and they own the station, why didn't they force Starfleet off when they became neutral? Now, I know, I'm being a little bit disingenuous. Bajor obviously backed Starfleet, and this was largely for show, but it is interesting how Starfleet goes from being the protector and savior of the planet to a foe occupier. With the Bajoran civilians safe and Dominion forces entering into Bajoran space, Sisko calls battle stations. Stay tuned, as in the next episode of the Dominion War arc, we discuss the second battle of Deep Space Nine. What's up, Lore Masters? This video is an analysis of the second battle of Deep Space Nine and will be the first part of a two-parter where I not only break down the battle but discuss how Starfleet and the Dominion were both idiots at the end of the day. To see the prelude of how we got to this battle, check in the top right hand corner or in the description below. As we discussed before, Deep Space Nine would have all of the personnel and most all of the Bajorans evacuated completely from the station to Bajor. Those who were left would include the few Bajoran militia and engineers that stayed behind to keep the station running. A establishment owners wanting to protect their stores and restaurants, and Starfleet officers. Additionally, Starfleet security would be roaming the hallways with blaster rifles at the ready. I know that this is somewhat of a rehash, but it's interesting that in this instance, it appears that Starfleet has taken control of the station against the Bajoran's wishes. This would portray Starfleet as hypocritical and make them look like they were invaders, just like the Cardassians had been. While I'm sure the Dominion used this fact as propaganda against Starfleet to the Alpha Quadrant, the truth is Bajor only agreed to be neutral due to the request of Cisco. So behind the scenes, the attempt to stop the Federation from using the station is feeble at best. Things would begin to really heat up when a Dominion fleet enters into Bajoran space. Sisko orders Martok to take up position beside the Defiant as the Defiant still needs to place its ordnance. The minefield would have to be placed no matter what the cost, and it couldn't be activated as they go because that just wouldn't be good TV. Sisko then orders the weapons array activated. Kura, of course, protests, as I stated she would on behalf of the Bajoran militia. After Sisko says it's noted, she promptly takes her station and the crew prepares for battle. Dukat orders attack wings one through five to destroy the Defiant and the rest to directly engage Deep Space Nine. The Dominion fire on the station and, surprisingly, the shields hold. Again, we'll discuss that in another video. While the main fleet of the Dominion engages the station, the attack wings try to break through to get to the Defiant. Deep Space Nine targets targets them directly, choosing to take out those vessels versus defending itself against the bigger fleet. Even with the focus fire of DS9, however, some of the ships do get through. The remaining attack wings that get past Deep Space Nine, uh, apparently only three ships, uh, there may be more but we never see them, attack the Defiant. Martok's ship, the Rotaran, decloaks and destroys the vessels before they are able to defeat the Defiant. From this point on, the Rotaran would be able to run interference for the Defiant so that it wouldn't be bothered. After all, who says there's never a Klingon around when you need one? As the battle progresses, Dukat orders that all vessels focus their attacks on Section 17 of the Outer Docking Ring. Even with the upgraded defenses, Deep Space Nine's main power would fail with Auxiliary coming up to continue to power the shields. Luckily, the crew of DS9 wouldn't have to wait for much longer as the minefield is activated and the Defiant returns to the station. The Dominion fleet pulls back with reserves coming into Bajoran space for a final push. Sisko then orders all Starfleet personnel to evacuate. 
Before the evacuation, Cisco broadcasts to the Defiant and the station about the triumphs of Starfleet on this day. He tells everyone that their sacrifices didn't only include defending the minefield, but that while the Dominion was busy with Deep Space Nine, a Starfleet task force was able to successfully destroy the Dominion's shipyards at Taurus III. How he'd know this task force was successful as it happened during the second battle of Deep Space Nine is beyond me, but maybe he's lying and just hopes that it was successful. After the Defiant and Rotaran escape, Kura initiates one of Sisko's final programs on Deep Space Nine. It completely guts and destroys most of the station's internal systems, all but life support I'm assuming. Kira then sends out a message that Bajor welcomes the Dominion to Deep Space Nine. Dukat and Weyun, oh, you may not know Weyun, he's rarely talked about, little known character, don't even worry about him, but both he and Dukat enter onto Deep Space Nine. It would be a victory, though the dialogue appears to make it seem like a Pyrrhic one as the Dominion would lose the shipyards and have at least a loss of 50 ships for this battle. There's a lot to break down here, including the dialogue and the tactics that were used, so I'm going to stop and dedicate an entire video to it. It's definitely not because I'm unsure of how to animate this battle, so I don't know how long I'm going to be doing that, but more that I really want to break down and talk about all of the topics. That is definitely why I'm doing it. Stay tuned on the next episode where I discuss why this was an absolutely stupid play by Starfleet and the Dominion. What's up, Lore Masters? This is the second part, really third part, of the complete analysis of the second battle of Deep Space Nine. In the first video, I discussed the prelude to the war and battle. The second was, of course, the conflict itself, and now we're going to take a look at the tactics utilized by both sides. First, I want to take a moment to discuss the Dominion's decision to attack Deep Space Nine in their attempt to prevent Starfleet from mining the wormhole. It's probably one of the largest tactical mistakes they made at the beginning of the war. We know from future episodes that even with the devastating losses in the second battle of Deep Space Nine and the loss of the shipyards, the Dominion are absolutely dominating the Federation and Klingon fleets. In fact, in the next episode, at which I'll discuss thoroughly, no worries, the Dominion has pushed the Federation all the way back to the Vulcan border. You know, Vulcan, a planet at the core of the Federation and right next to Earth. So imagine if instead of focusing on Deep Space Nine, the Dominion pushed into Federation space. They attacked on all fronts with all of their assets, including those 50 ships that they would have lost in the actual battle. Additionally, since the Dominion are attacking into Federation space and not Bajoran space, Starfleet might not be able to hit the space yards, or if they decided still to do that, would have to let most of the Dominion assets steamroll Federation territory to do so. I understand that trying to secure the wormhole is critical at some point, as it will be where all of the reinforcements come from, mainly. But the Gamma Quadrant resources aren't the be-all end-all, given how well the Dominion does before. And we know the Dominion is aware of how powerful they are, because they're caught off guard when the shielding actually holds at Deep Space Nine. And dialogue at the second battle of Deep Space Nine shows us the Dominion do know how advantageous their position is. Again, if it wasn't for the ego, for the focus on the Gamma Quadrant, they probably would have won the war. Ultimately, the Dominion always had the winning cards. It would have just been harder with actual real casualties without the infrastructure of the Dominion in the Gamma Quadrant. That said, with this plan in place and knowing that the Dominion were coming, that they were going to strike Deep Space Nine, letting them take Bajor, the Bajoran system, the wormhole, is absolutely ridiculous. It is the dumbest move Starfleet could have made. While I'll admit it's hard to calculate how important those space docks were for the Dominion, we know in later episodes that Deep Space Nine stopping assets from the Gamma Quadrant entering into the Alpha Quadrant is the most critical thing for the Federation to win the war, or at least to have a chance, Slim as it may be. Additionally, given how powerful Deep Space Nine turned out to be, a victory here might have actually crippled the Dominion and put them on the defensive at the beginning of the war. Which is a great place to be, just ask the Dominion. We don't know how many ships the Dominion fielded in that battle, but we do know that a single bird of prey, the Defiant and Deep Space Nine, were able to destroy 50 ships. This includes the fact that the Defiant likely didn't fight at all. Imagine if Deep Space Nine had the support of a Sovereign, the Defiant, a few Akuras, and various other smaller ships. Based on what we see happen at the actual battle, it appears that the Dominion would not have been able to take Deep Space Nine and would have had to retreat. While Starfleet vessels would no doubt be damaged, it is still possible that they could have gotten reserves in to reinforce the fleet itself and push into Dominion territory, perhaps even destroying the space docks that they originally did in the episode. 
And I know I've stated it before, but there is no doubt Starfleet would have been in a stronger position here. This was just a bad call. I'll also finish with a thought on the cloaked self-replicating mines. Quite a few people feel that the cloaking devices on these mines were somehow legal. I still disagree, but that's neither here nor there. I'll go really in depth on this topic when we get to the profits saving the day, but I'll be honest, I'm not really a fan of the mines. They are literally a deuce ex machina that prevents the good guys from losing. Additionally, there are a lot of ways that the Dominion could have beat these mines. This includes ramming random ships into the mines by the dozens, if not hundreds. In theory, there are only so many mines, even if they self-replicate, so if you detonate them all at the same time, then you don't have an issue. And even if we assume that you can't, that you can't get every mine, send as many ships as you can through the wormhole and some will get through. Also, why not just fire photon torpedoes and detonate them all at a specific time? We know this won't destroy the wormhole, so why not? And if for some reason that fails, then let's use the idea of ramming random ships into the minefield, but let's put innocent civilians on those ships and tell the Federation that they better tell us how to stop these mines or people will die. And let's just assume that for whatever reason you can't get any ships past this minefield, which again is dubious, but let's assume that it's right. Park ships on both sides of the minefield and begin beaming people as well as ordnance from one ship to the other. Sure, you're not going to get any ships past, but you can definitely get a lot of personnel as well as equipment into the Alpha Quadrant. Again, personally, I just find the minefield to not only be ineffective, but honestly, it's magic, no better than the profits. We will discuss that when that actually happens though, so I'm gonna put that aside. And I know what this leads into. Ultimately, the question becomes, if I have all of these issues, how would I fix it? It's really easy to break things down, but what would I do to make it better? I'll be honest, right now, I don't know. The writers have painted themselves into a corner here. I'm gonna think about it and probably at a later date come up with a video, though it won't be the next one. Don't worry, this is not a four part series. I will leave it here though. How would you have done it? What's up, Lore Masters? Let's talk about the episode where Starfleet, you know, Gene Roddenberry's epitome of humanity, are losing a war so badly that they opt to bomb a drug manufacturing facility in order to cause tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, of enslaved soldiers to suffer. This suffering would of course move them into a rage where those very soldiers may kill tons of innocents and ultimately would die a very, very painful death. Let's look at our bright future, folks. Alright, now that I got most of the keyboard warriors angered and off typing their counter arguments before even watching this video, blame the algorithm, it's really good for business if I do that folks, let's break down DS9's A Time to Stand with those who are rational. As has been discussed in previous episodes of these series, the initial stages of the war were devastating to Starfleet and the Federation. After the initial successful mission to destroy Dominion space docks, the Dominion was showing to be extremely resilient and just pounding Starfleet forces. Man, glad they had this arc completely planned out. It would be a hard position to write yourself out of if the initial plan was to have Starfleet lose. I'm sure they won't have to do some extreme bending to have Starfleet win after this. Focusing on the episode proper, the Federation Alliance had been losing battle after battle for at least three months. On all fronts, Federation and Klingon forces were barely able to just hold their own to maintain the ground they were on. Generally, they would have to fall back and lose territory. Morale was at an all-time low as Starfleet personnel often began to complain about how much they were losing. And unfortunately, it would continue to just get worse. In one scene, Bashir receives word of the 7th Fleet, which was supposed to stop the Dominion forward push. Because I guess apparently doctors get news before command personnel these days, but we won't even talk about that. Bashir reports that the 7th Fleet was forced to retreat with only 14 ships surviving the battle. That's out of 112. So a little over 12% of the vessels that went to halt the Dominion advance returned. That's thousands to tens of thousands dead. Though, to be fair, even if it was very dire for the Federation, the Dominion was being impacted as well. I don't want to come off inaccurately here. They were winning the war, handedly, that's true. 
but dialogue indicates there is some concern about issues with the supply of Ketracel White. There is also mention of needing reinforcements by Wei Yun, but I feel like this is probably more the Vorta wanting to ensure there is no way Starfleet could rebound versus they were actually losing on that front. As we'll see in the future, the Dominion never really has an issue with manpower and warships until the Romulans enter into the war. Though now that I think about it, I guess we could say the same about the White as that never appears to be an issue either, though dialogue constantly makes us believe that it is. I discussed it in my teaser, but this episode is where we see another fundamental change in the Federation. Starfleet has determined that they will have to go deep into Cardassian space and destroy the main Ketracel White manufacturing facility in order to eliminate the Jem'Hadar. If they don't do this, they'll lose. I'm going to go ahead and do something that I'm rarely known for. I'm going to go ahead and play a clip. So I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there for CBS, who I know is listening. I hope you enjoy taking the money of a single dad, you stupid fuck. Starfleet Intelligence has discovered what we believe to be their main storage facility for Ketracel White in the Alpha Quadrant. Right here, deep in Cardassian space. We need to destroy it. Without the White to sustain them, the Jem'Hadar won't be able to function. Without the White, the Jem'Hadar will die. I won't shed any tears. As I've somewhat stated already, this is a fundamental change, a shift. We are talking about the genocide of a slave race. The Jim Hadar didn't choose any of this. Now, pragmatically, this is exactly the thing that should be done. It's not something you enjoy, and you'll even regret it, unless you're Dax, apparently, but it has to be done. However, we aren't dealing with a 21st century pragmatic human. We're dealing with Starfleet officers. There is... No way I could ever see Picard's Starfleet doing this. You know, it's interesting to me, and this is actually me going off the cuff and rewriting my script. In my original script, I had put how there was no way I could see Picard's Starfleet doing this. But when I was reading it, I remembered that we actually did. Starfleet Command was willing to do the exact same thing to the Boar, to destroy them with a virus. It's curious how when pushed to the ledge, the ideals of Starfleet go away. What we see here and what we saw with the Borg are completely against what we see in most episodes. This mentality, this wanting to kill all Jim Hadar, goes against Sisko's speech to Eddington about an uncomfortable peace. It goes against Sisko's speech with Worf on how officers are willing to die rather than to let innocent people die. And honestly, I'd be here all day if I started mentioning the amount of TNG episodes that it contradicts. That said, this mentality, and again that with the Borg, I think does go against what Jean had envisioned, but it is a natural progression. One that makes sense for what we see in the future. Ultimately, I think Jean was wrong. We have no evidence to believe that humanity could progress to a point that excludes anger, hatred, or fear. We have no indication that this universe isn't anything but unforgiving. We have no indication that the Trek universe, like the real universe, isn't anything but unforgiving. While the concepts are abstract, because we're talking about something that exists and isn't actually conscious, the universe is uncaring. Through the processes of evolution, an occurrence we see happen in the Trek universe and in the real world, Everything is designed for its own survival, even at the expense of other species or other things. So if humanity had been able to create creature comforts that allowed them to be open and want to be explorers and not want to kill anymore, at a base minimum, they would ultimately come up against species that would not share these values and humanity would have to adapt if they were to survive. So it makes sense, and I do think that this is the best case scenario for humanity. I'll give the writers this, even if they moved away from Gene's ideals a little bit, I think they made Gene's vision a little more real. But that's just my opinion. So, with that ramble out of the way, Starfleet would send the Jem'Hadar attack ship that they had previously captured and fly it into Dominion space. They would use it to destroy the Ketracel White manufacturing facility, again located deep within Cardassian and Dominion space. Along the way, the Jem'Hadar ship, under the command of Sisko, would run into several obstacles. The first being the USS Centaur, a Starfleet kit-bashed vessel, detecting the ship outbound of Federation space and thinking they found an errant Jem'Hadar ship trying to get back to their home. Sisko would order the vessel to get across the border, hoping his old friend, Charlie Reynolds, wouldn't follow him. Unfortunately, Charlie never was that bright. Sisko and crew would be forced to fight the Starfleet ship, attempting to disable its weapon system so that it wouldn't be left a sitting duck for other Jem'Hadar attack ships. Which was a good idea, because during the battle, additional Jem'Hadar attack ships would arrive and give chase to the Centaur. Sisko would be forced to continue his mission, leaving the Centaur to its fate. 
We never really see the fate of the Centaur, but from resources that I found, it appears that the ship does survive as it's seen in Operation Return. The destruction of the Ketracel White facility would be successful, but unfortunately, the stolen Jim'Hadar attack vessel would be damaged. We'll go more into the attack on the facility and the fate of Sisko and his crew later, but stay tuned as we break down what's going on with the civilians under Dominion rule. Spoilers, it's not actually that bad, even if dialogue tells us it is. Man, I can't wait to see the comments on that episode. But all of this is just my opinion. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. The problem with the Dominion is that they are often written extremely benign, while dialogue indicates a nefarious nature. It even could be argued that the Dominion are more than happy to let you live your life and even help you be comfortable, if you're willing to exist in a gilded cage. In a move that I'm sure will upset my American audience, let's discuss how the Dominion's totalitarian state was pretty amicable. Before we get too deep into this examination of internal Dominion politics, it should go without saying, and yet here I still have to say it because people won't get it if I don't, that all of this goodness comes at the end of a gun with little concern for well-being or loss of life. There was very little empathy if someone stepped even barely out of line. Freedom of speech, indeed freedom of thought, was outlawed. If the Dominion said jump, you and your government asked how high. So now, let me blow your minds and discuss how people so bad can actually be good for the common man. I know, it's crazy. To be fair, we don't know the complete breakdown of internal politics in regards to the member states of the Dominion. However, examining episodes that break down how these states are treated within the Gamma Quadrant, as well as those under the tender mercies of the Vorta and the Alpha Quadrant, it shows that it's not the worst life you could have. Though, a caveat worth pointing out for the Alpha Quadrant is that we know the Dominion was being exceptionally careful in how they operated so they could show the other powers, such as the Romulans, Tholians, and Breen, that they weren't going to be brutal dictators. You could argue that some of this might have been for show, but I have my doubts. When we see the member states in the Gamma Quadrant, we learn that the Dominion will either negotiate with favorable terms via the Vorta, or utilize the Jim Hadar to conquer new territories. Once under Dominion rule, the infrastructure will be modified so that the client state assists the Dominion in what it needs. This is generally through advanced technology, whether it be for ships, sensors, warp systems, or even weapons, whatever the Dominion was asking for. Once integrated, the client state is welcome to an expansive economy and able to trade as well as work with other member states within the Dominion. The state itself would be restricted from dealing with other entities outside of the Dominion infrastructure, however. So it's basically the European Union. Like, exactly. The European Union is a real-life Dominion, is what I'm saying. From everything I can tell in all of my research, it would appear that citizens are largely allowed to do whatever they want as long as they assist the Dominion when asked and play nice with the other member states. Wars, not being conducive for the internal politics of the Dominion, appear to be outlawed and all states are required to play nice with each other. That's not to say that different governments can't limit the abilities of their neighbors, even barring them from certain activities. Indeed, we see this with the Cardassians and the Bajorans. It's just that one side cannot deny the other certain rights or freedom of movement. The overall goal of the Dominion is to prevent rebellion or attack upon the Founders. To this end, as we discussed, they use the carrot and the stick. Due to this, it seems likely, and indeed we have on-screen evidence, that the Dominion will provide and prop up struggling governments to get them back on their feet, at least to a degree. But what does it look like to the civilians in their day-to-day? -day? When analyzing civilian life under the Founders, we mainly have the Alpha Quadrant to understand their modus operandi. And again, this may be a bit skewed, but the change from Starfleet protection to Dominion oppression is barely noticed to most civilians. Civilians. They're still able to trade, even between the Federation and Dominion, we see that transports still go back and forth. Initially, we see no troops on Bajor, and to my knowledge, there are only ever Vorta that are placed on the planet. There are no ghettos or internment camps like we saw with the Cardassians. There even seems to be some freedom of the press. We know that Jake is able to write about the Dominion here. Weyoun, while not willing to send it to the Federation, does seem tolerant of the fact that he keeps stating that the Dominion are being overly oppressive, when on paper, the Dominion are just allies. Now, we do know that Jake had special protections due to being kin to Space Jesus Sisko, but I still think it's worth noting that there was some tolerance. It's possible, however unlikely, that the Dominion would have completely changed after winning the war, I just don't seem to think so because we don't see this occur in the Gamma Quadrant. I find it unlikely. 
What's intriguing is how seductive the Dominion is to the Alpha Quadrant as well. Jim and Dar keep the peace, everyone plays together nicely, and the Dominion ensures no other member states hurts the other. Beyond that, everyone's allowed to do whatever they want. In fact, we even see Kira accepting the idea at one point, not questioning it anymore. And still, there would be resistance. The ability to speak your mind, to want to be free, is apparently very strong. I guess the Telosians would say that Bajorans and other races have a lot of human in them. People would protest via speeches, and some of them would be taken away, sometimes forever, and it would escalate with others killing themselves to make a point. The Dominion, from the civilian's point of view, wanted to offer normality and safety, but it would come at the cost of your thoughts. Your soul, even. The Cardassian people had been saved, they were given food, and their infrastructure fixed. The Bajorans could now peacefully coexist with the Cardassians, whether the Cardassians liked that or not. However, a gilded cage has never been something people enjoy or would stand for a long time. And most would forsake this and want conflict to be able to express themselves, as we'll see in the episodes to come. But what do you guys think? From a civilian side, and a civilian side alone, was there any negative impact? What's up, Lore Masters? Today we'll be analyzing the DS9 episode, Behind the Lines. There are effectively two plots here, but we'll be focusing on the one that was meant to be the entire story, and actually important. The other one was, I'm sure, there due to contractual obligations, as it doesn't really give us much. The B-plot, the one we won't be focusing on, is effectively Ben Sisko being made adjutant. Dax is given command of the Defiant, and they're tasked with taking out a sensor array. This array apparently has been providing the location of all Starfleet ships to the Dominion. And we know that because it was so critical to the plot, we've never had any clue of its existence in the past, never been given any reason to think that the Dominion knew where Starfleet was at all times, and don't even see the battle where they destroy the vital Dominion asset. You can be assured that I literally put as much effort into that subplot as the writers did. I will take a moment to pause and highlight something that was a nice touch in it, though. When we first see Sisko in charge of the Defiant, O'Brien brings a used power cell from the phaser array and gives it to him. He then makes a speech about fighting and that you don't throw something like that away, and it's a symbol of what they were fighting for. He places it on the wall like a trophy. The tradition is kept by Dax, and it's interesting to see how she gives the speech. It's the same, but different. It's a really nice way to see how command changes, but things stay the same. And again, the only part worth noting in the entirety of that plot. So let's move on to the important part of the episode. Before I delve into the Resistance's failure to be, well, good little terrorists, I want to take a moment to question their command structure. From what we observe, there doesn't appear to be someone in charge. Certainly Oda and Kira appear to be senior in the discussion, but it's ran like a democracy. Unfortunately, that's not the best way to run a small organization where it's key that everyone is on the same page. I mean, it's crazy we see them ultimately failing, it just boggles the mind that this kind of structure wouldn't work. Regardless, the first time we observe the terrorist cell in action, their operation appears wildly successful. Through a fortunate turn of events, Rom is able to get a data pad that discusses the possibility of poisoning the Ketracel White and killing off the Jemadar with the last batch. This, of course, if they can't find a way to secure more of the White and that's all they have left. Again, it never appears to be an issue for the Dominion. We never see them actually run out of White, but it's still something that is said in dialogue. The Jemadar find the pad due to Rom, and, of course, being regimented, brainwashed machines that are disciplined, go and confront Damar, and a fight occurs. This would push a small divide between the Jemadar and the Cardassians on the station, even though we never see them actually have any problems. Again, we're more told there are problems than were actually shown. The orchestrated attack in Quarks creates discord between Odo and Kura, Odo stating that the risk wasn't worth the small gains in disunity, and Kura obviously thinking that the risks were worth it. Additionally, Odo is upset because he said they shouldn't do it, and after he left the meeting, they all agreed that they would do it. The fight would be pretty pronounced until the arrival of the female changeling, who would change everything. Let's pause a moment, too. While I couldn't find enough material specific to the Dominion War to do a breakdown on it, I do want to briefly speak about the events in DS9's Sons and Daughters. In the episode, Kira is effectively tempted in the same way that Odo is. Zial is brought back onto the station, and through Zial, Dukat and Kira begin to work together a lot better, and she even begins to lessen on her hatred for him and the Dominion. However, when Kira realizes what she's become, the path that she is going down, she turns away. 
Looking back to this episode, Behind the Lines, Odo is tempted and would not make the same decision, but we'll get into that a bit later. After the argument between Kira and Odo, the terrace cell meets again and is wholly inefficient. Now it feels like they all have to agree before moving forward. However, the conversation is completely changed when a drunken quark stumbles in, telling them that the Cardassians have figured out a way to deactivate the minefield. This would cause a stir, and the cell would have to figure out how to stop them. Ultimately, they would find a way to tech-tech their way out of the problem. Though, here's a question. Even if we assume they are able to disable the deflector array, what's going to stop the Cardassians from fixing it? They have no follow-up plan after disabling the thing, this is just acting on emotion. Would they just keep trying to disable it until, what, ad infinitum? Starfleet is losing, so there's no hope of help from them, so what's going on? What are they doing? Also, the Dominion would be able to eventually set up security to prevent them from moving forward. I know that it's likely they're running on emotion, and would figure something out after they stop the initial attempt. It's just that the plan is too simple, and let's get into that for a moment. Rom would basically access the EPS feed and overload the systems. Odo then disables any alarms for five minutes by running a security diagnostic. So again, this plan is ill-conceived. While Odo shares some god status that would ultimately save him, the security diagnostic being run at the exact same time and impacting the exact same area is too convenient. Even if the Dominion backed off, the Cardassians would never trust Odo again, and they'd be shut out of any future attempts when it comes to utilizing Odo to help the Resistance. You could argue that they were out of options, and maybe they were, it's just... unfortunate. And alas, Kira wouldn't realize that Odo is basically the incel of the Great Link, and so once a founder cutie walks up and shares her... liquid with him, he'd become useless and not care about anything else. Due to this, Rom is captured when he attempts to access the conduit, which would have alarms all over it. This, of course, destroys the relationship between Odo and Kira, something that would take a long time to repair. And ultimately, that's how the episode would end. The minefield would be coming down, Rom would be executed, and the terrorist cell was broken on Deep Space Nine. I know this is a bit of a shorter one, but again, it's a bridge that does need to be discussed. All in all, everything was coming up Millhouse for the Dominion. Of course, things would be much, much more complicated in the near future. Stay tuned as we get into the final push for the retaking of Deep Space Nine. What's up, Lore Masters? So, due to issues on my side, the breakdown of Operation Return is going to be somewhat delayed. While I'm waiting on a few assets to finish up, thought I'd get this video out of the way. Which is namely to break down the Prophet's decision to enter into the war. Well, at least publicly show they've been in it. There's actually a larger theory that I intend to get into at a later point, but for now, we'll just discuss the outrage that sometimes is inspired by this plot point. With the minefield destroyed, oh, spoilers, I guess, the Defiant enters into the wormhole to battle the Dominion reinforcements. While in the wormhole, Sisko is confronted by the Prophets when they notice the man apparently is about to commit suicide. Unfortunately, I think Sisko's motivations are written entirely poorly here. We're never given enough information on why any of this occurs. Why did Sisko go into the wormhole? Did he know the Prophets would ask what the hell he was doing? I mean, if so, we're never given any indication that was his plan, and he seems more annoyed with them than not. Was he going to try to fight off all of the Jim Hadar? That's a waste of both his life and that of his crew. He does state that he'd be willing to die and even let his crew die if it meant stopping the Jim Adar, but this certainly wouldn't do that. This action is just throwing your life, and the life of your crew, away. If we're going to be charitable, I'd say that he, and everyone else on that ship, was running on emotion, and so that's why they decided to do something incredibly stupid and wasteful. Focusing on the Prophets, they would call Sisko out, seeing what he was doing as discussed. And for good reason, I mean, suicide isn't really the best option here. If I'm honest, the Prophets are extremely confusing in concept. We know that they aren't linear, they exist in all time and at all places, at least within the wormhole itself. However, they still have to be told what is going on. Somehow. We also see the nefarious nature of them begin to spring up here. Sisko tells them to stay out of his life, and they specifically state that they won't do that. They have a right to his life. Sisko's entire being is basically a part of some chess game the Prophets have been playing. But even though the Prophets have manipulated nearly every aspect of his life, they've ensured his birth, have made sure that he would be where he currently is, to help him, they require a penance. Because I know when I put my daughters in the middle of the road against their volition and without their consent, and then save them from getting hit by a truck, they owe me. That's just good parenting. 
We don't know for sure what the prophets mean when they require the penance, but it's most likely that Sisko will not get to enjoy his retirement on Bajor as he had planned to. The godlike beings state that Sisko is of Bajor, but will find no rest there. His paw will follow another path. Also, another interesting note here. Sisko does point out that the wormhole aliens have manipulated the Bajorans, a people that he claims to love, and yet doesn't seem angry about it. The prophets made it so the Bajorans believed that they were deities. I guess if you talk people into believing you are a god, it's now okay with Starfleet, so screw you, Toss, TNG, and Voyager. We'll get into the meta-analysis of the prophets much, much later in this series. For now, we'll take a look at what happens in the episode. Analyzing that, the Dominion ships begin to disappear from sensors once Sisko arrives back onto the Defiant. We don't know exactly what occurs to them in canon, but according to Trek Online, they are just moved in the timeline and continue to attack the station. Thanks, Prophets. I guess you really care about Bajor, huh? The last piece to discuss is that a lot of people find this plot point to be poor writing, specifically the prophets saving the day. I can understand them saying it's poor writing, but I honestly get confused if they think that the prophets are poor writing, but the self-replicating minds aren't. The thing is, both the prophets and the minds are basically the same storytelling device. They're magic. When you break them down, they accomplish the same goal and both make no sense within the universe they inhabit. There's no way that the minds could be powered enough to replicate and keep up a constant defense. There are multiple ways to penetrate the field or bypass it altogether. The prophets themselves could have helped in a multitude of ways which would have made a lot of sense. Why does it have to get to this point for them to stop the Dominion? Even if we take into account a theory I'm going to do at a later point. It makes little sense. If there's a scale of in-universe believability from 0 to 10, with 0 being completely believable and 10 being completely unbelievable, both the minds and prophets generally fall into the 7 to 8 range. They break continuity and the fourth wall, but just for different reasons. Either way, back to what I was talking about before, this is the first hint we see about the prophets already having orchestrated at least a piece of the war. We'll discuss how the prophets are basically the Borg, Q, and the worst aspects of Starfleet all combined at the end of all this. But for now, what are your opinions on the Deuce Ex Prophets? What's up, Lore Masters? In the past, we have analyzed all of the sacrifices, the death, and destruction that has occurred in so short of a time with the Dominion War. Today, we'll analyze how all of those lives may have been lost in vain and how at this point the Federation should have probably surrendered and barter for what freedoms they could have gotten out of all of this. In DS9's episode, Statistical Probabilities, we're going to break down Bashir's suggestion for the surrender of the Federation to the Dominion. It all begins when Bashir realizes that a group of genetically modified humans might be able to assist in determining the best way to defeat the Dominion. While they aren't able to socially interact in society due to the procedures that were forced upon them, they seem to have the ability to read motives behind people and even determine how minor circumstances will impact major events. And it would be determined by this group that if the Federation continued to fight, they would lose and a lot of people would die. But if they didn't, then people would live, but everyone would lose their freedom. And when it comes to that ethical dilemma, I'm honestly of two minds. In fact, I'm of two minds on the entire episode. It's also tougher to talk about given that I speak to a majority American audience that prizes dying for one's freedom of speech, or indeed freedoms overall, than living under a gracious tyrant. Better to die on your feet than live on your knees, as people would say. Let's get into it. It ultimately comes down to the fact that super geniuses whom have proven to be accurate and given immeasurably good advice have determined that no matter what happens, the Federation will lose the war. That hundreds of billions will die and it will all be for naught. Because of this, they suggest that the Federation surrender and that if they do, in five generations, a faction will rise up that will overthrow the Dominion. We see this personified in Bashir as he speaks to Sisko, telling him that the Federation should just give it all up. This is then reinforced with O'Brien. Both Sisko and O'Brien rebuff the Doctor. During these conversations, it seems that Bashir's intelligence and otherness is what's to be blamed on why he feels the way he does, but there's really no evidence for it in the debates. I'll grant there are some scenes that make it look like him being super intelligent sets him apart and makes him not think like they do, but I think that denigrates the fact that he's just being earnest. He honestly believes this and his intelligence 
doesn't necessarily play a factor. Though I would say his pride did. We'll get into that in a little bit. It's an interesting video that I intend to do when it comes to the otherness and the super genius and how some aren't allowed to serve in Starfleet, but we're going to not look at that for now. We're just going to put that aside and focus on what they're disagreeing on. Let's look at the argument between Sisko and Bashir specifically. Bashir states adamantly that Starfleet will lose and the military will take 900 billion people with them if they keep fighting. Sisko counters that all of this is based on stats and assumptions. There are two pieces to this argument. The first is that the group has shown to be correct down to the smallest detail in every instance up to now. That doesn't mean they are right here necessarily, but it does lend to their credibility. Secondly, the truth is, whether Bashir is accurate or not, whether 900 billion people will lose their lives or not, it's irrelevant to Cisco. The captain states, quote unquote, even if I knew with 100% certainty what was going to happen, I wouldn't ask an entire generation of people to voluntarily give up their freedom. That's madness. 900 billion people, nearly 10 Earths, no, over 10 Earths, probably, including men, women, and especially children, will die. All because Cisco doesn't like the thought of not having the same freedoms he had before. I'm sorry, but I hope to God we never have anyone in charge of any government that feels that way. If there is no chance of winning, please don't throw my daughter's lives away because you watched Rambo too many times. Sisko would go on to say that if the Federation was to go down, that they should go down fighting so their descendants would know what they are made of. To be frank, the only thing the descendants would be thinking is how stupid he was. To fight when you can't win and to not bide your time, well, honestly, I think Garrick would just be very disappointed in what Sisko had become, at least at this point. Don't misunderstand. I'm not against last stands. If you are backed into a corner with no way out and everyone dies one way or the other, well, let's make them earn it. If the Dominion wasn't going to let anyone live, kind of like the Minbari, then let's dance and make sure that the victory will taste like ash in their mouths. But that's simply not the case here. The Dominion is willing to negotiate. And if we can save near 1 trillion lives, again, the population of Earth times 10, then hell yes, we at least need to consider it. We need to take a serious look at that. All of this said, I'm also not a fan of Bashir either. He is so sure, so positive that things are going to happen that he won't entertain that he might be wrong. Now there is a good chance he's right, and the episode contradicts itself in the ending and doesn't really prove that he's wrong necessarily. But his pride is off the charts. Julian is blinded by the numbers. He can't see past them and assumes that everyone else is just wrong. Both he and Cisco have a very real sense of pride that is an extreme issue. And let me go ahead and address the arguments that have already been put in the comments before anyone has even gotten to this part, if they just don't stop and not listen to the rest of the video. When you make the argument, but my Nazis, but my southern states, but my insert whatever real world event here, you are missing the forest for the trees in this discussion. The equation is very easy here. If you fight, a large number of people die and you lose. If you give up, everyone lives, but you lose some freedoms. In every other circumstance you are about to provide me with, the context is different. Of course we should have fought the Nazis. We had a chance of defeating them. In fact, we did. In this instance, the proposition is that there is no hope. People are dying for nothing. And in that instance, it's a different conversation. And no one ever counters the numbers. They try to. They try to make this argument about how they stop the treason plot, what happens in the room, yada, yada, yada. But the dialogue before states about how the further out you go, the more accurate you are. So small events, especially at ground zero, could be wrong. It doesn't exactly disprove anything. So it would have been nice if they had written it where there was other evidence or other people who disagreed with them, but I'm getting off task there. And it doesn't matter. They're both wrong. These superior humans, who were a part of a superpower of the Alpha Quadrant, the Federation, a species that is so evolved that had extensive training in engineering, military tactics, command, and medicine, were all wrong and could, in this instance, be easily outwitted by simple Ferengi logic. Now, I know those of you watching this may be confused, so let me make it so simple that even a Vulcan could understand it. It all comes down to the third rule of acquisition. It clearly states, never spend more for an acquisition than you have to. The Federation wants to acquire peace. Fine, peace is good. It's good for business. But how much are they willing to pay for it? 
Cisco would say, whatever it costs. And it's that kind of irresponsible spending that causes so many businesses to fail. Cisco's forgetting the third rule, of which I know he knows. Right now, at this very moment, peace can be bought at a bargain price. They don't even realize it. The Dominion has weapons, the Federation has weapons, and in the short term, no one has a clear advantage. The price of peace is at an all-time low right now. It's the perfect time to sit down and hammer out an agreement. Any attack right now will escalate the conflict, making peace more expensive in the long run. And Cisco would find that out with a Romulan senator in the future. Truth is, after all of this, I don't agree with either of them, as I've stated. Just giving up with no terms is ridiculous. Fighting and getting people killed unnecessarily is as equally ridiculous. And you know, it's kind of funny to me. When talking with Eddington, Sisko was very harsh on the former officer. He stated that the Maquis should have had a hard negotiation. They should have had a hard-earned peace that no one would have liked completely, but they could have gotten along with. And that he should have done that instead of leading everyone to their death. Kind of funny how much of a hypocrite he becomes when he has something to actually lose. What's up, lore masters? Today we'll be breaking down the DS9 episode, The Magnificent Ferengi. Honestly, this story is really good and worthy of a complete breakdown, but for the purposes of this video, I'll be focusing on the implications when it comes to the Dominion War. The main focus will be on the capture of Ishka, Starfleet relinquishing the Vorta prisoner, the exchange, and the Ferengi double-cross. I'll be honest, the more I watch the episode, the more questions I do have, so let's just break it down. The first event that jumpstarts this entire arc is that of the capture of Ishka, mistress of the Grand Nagus and mother of Cork and Rom. A transport traveling between Vulcan and Ferenginar is apparently grabbed by a Dominion ship. This, in and of itself, is intriguing to me, as I'm not sure what they're gaining here. The Dominion has recently lost a major battle and had to retreat from Earth's doorstep back to behind the Cardassian lines. You would think that they might have other things they needed to be focusing on. One might argue that they are perhaps utilizing destabilizing tactics, hitting transports and other civilian targets in order to strike fear and cause unrest in the Federation. That's fair enough, but why would they keep the mistress of the Grand Nagus? The Ferengi Alliance hasn't joined Starfleet, not yet at least. They haven't picked a side, so why would you antagonize a neutral government. While the Ferengi aren't looked on approvingly by many, many people, they certainly have powerful technology, if TNG is to be believed, and we know that some Ferengi can be quite ingenious. You could argue that this is a power play by the Dominion to force Ferenginar to get things from Starfleet that the Dominion might not be able to, which is fair enough, I mean the ploy works, but it's definitely bad optics for the Alpha and Beta Quadrant and doesn't appear to net very much. Once they realize the value of Ishka, I'd assume they would just return her. That said, this could be subtle foreshadowing that the cracks are beginning to form within the Dominion machine. They're starting to become somewhat desperate and making mistakes. Just a thought. Then there's the fact that Starfleet releases the Vorta to Quark. I'm not going to belabor the fact that it's Quark that's acting as the agent. It seems like the governmental structure of the Ferengi Alliance is that there may not be a set hierarchy, but the Nagus just chooses who he wants. What I will question is, why did Starfleet agree to all of this? I understand that the dialogue indicates this is Kira paying Quark back for helping out during the Resistance. After all, he did play a vital role in disabling Deep Space Nine, but this seems far, far outside of Starfleet's character. First, they know the Vorta will be killed if he returns to the Dominion. This goes against what Starfleet believes, and we have seen in DS9, TNG, and the original series where Starfleet is unwilling to return someone if they know that person is going to get killed. But to be fair, Insane Way delighted on people's pain and death, so I can't really include Voyager, so I guess it comes down to which canon you want to believe. Secondly, the Vorta is a vital intelligence asset. Even if they've gotten all of the information they can about what he knows when it comes to troop deployments and such, they can investigate how he thinks, how he breaks things down, and how he is controlled by the changelings. So this seems like the loss of an asset unnecessarily. And third, while he probably won't have a ton of information, the Vorta does know a little bit about Starfleet intelligence now. Faces, interrogation techniques, and what little he's been able to glean about the facilities he's been in. At the end of the day, this just seems like a bad idea. However, it is possible they could see the potential for the operation as well. By giving up the Vorta, Starfleet is currying favor with the Ferengi Alliance. While the Ferengi are filthy capitalists, they have quite a few powerful ships and money does go a long way in this universe. So again, I'd have to say that the only way for them to justify this to themselves at night is because they need the Nagus's quote-unquote 
favor. Interesting how a people who don't rely on an economy will eventually really, really need someone who does. Now, for the most part, I don't really mind the team, but I will address one issue that I have with it. The concern is the use of Nog, if I'm being honest, and it's not because it's Nog himself, but because he keeps wearing that fracking Starfleet uniform. This becomes an issue for me when the actual deal goes down. Think about it. So the Dominion shows up. They see the Ferengi they are making a deal with, but also see that there's a Federation officer with them. What the ever-living hell. In theory, this should just inspire the Dominion to overtake the Ferengi's position. Sure, the Vorta most likely will die, but if they have a Federation officer now, even if he's a lower level officer, they still have someone of value, someone who might have information. Additionally, they can determine if there's an unknown alliance between Starfleet and the Ferengi Alliance, which this infers. And when talking about this entire ordeal, why don't the Jem'Hadar just shroud and infiltrate? They can just take them all by surprise after being literally invisible. There's a risk there, yeah, but still, I think the Jem'Hadar can take the Ferengi. I mean, I don't know, perhaps I'm underestimating the value of the Vorta here and they just don't want to risk it, but anyway, let's get back to the negotiations. Quark tells his Dominion counterpart to have a majority of the Jem'Hadar who are on the station, oh yeah, it's Impoc Noor, not Deep Space Nine, pretty long story, just watch the episode. Anyway, he tells the Jem'Hadar to go back to their ship and leave the area at Warp 9. Warp 9. That's quite a trick when we've never seen a Dominion ship travel at Warp 9 and have had instances when Dominion assets traveling at Warp 9 would have helped them in the plot. I'm going to infer that Quark just meant best possible speed and likely doesn't know how fast Dominion ships go. And there'd be no reason for the Vorta to correct him and give him accurate information. So we'll just ignore it for now. After everything is said and done, the prisoner exchange would occur. The mistress of the Nagus for a dead Vorta operative. Long story and... Well, we're not really going to get into it, it's outside of the scope of this video. The prisoner exchange is ultimately a double cross and the Ferengi kill the Dominion guards and take the Vorta prisoner, well the other Vorta prisoner, not the dead Vorta. They would ultimately decide to return him to Starfleet, and of course, when the Dominion returned to the station, they would find two dead Jem'Hadar and a zombified Vorta that looks like a sin of the gods. Again, this is just bad optics for the Ferengi and Starfleet. It would also sour future negotiations between the Ferengi and the Dominion. Perhaps these events could start the process from what we see when the Ferengi join the Federation Alliance. At the end of the day, it is a fun episode, but there are some questionable acts and things that would impact political affairs when it comes to the Alpha and Beta Quadrant, at least in my opinion. However, a lot of people like to ask how I would have changed this if given the opportunity, and I don't know that I would. I would remove Nog's uniform, but beyond that, I think it was overall well done. And while I've been pretty critical of the lore here, this episode is definitely one worth watching. But all of these are my thoughts. What are yours? The assault on Deep Space Nine to stop the disarmament of the wormhole minefield was one of the first large-scale offensive moves against the Dominion by the Federation Alliance. Codenamed Operation Return, because codenames are meant to reflect the actual offensive you are about to conduct, and not hide the overall goal in case enemy intelligence officers get the name, the plan combines Starfleet and Klingon forces in a bid that would either stall for time in the war, or be such a catastrophic loss that a Dominion victory was ensured. When analyzing the war up to this confrontation, it's easy to see that in the nearly five months of constant defeat, you had demoralized Starfleet and Klingon forces. The Federation Alliance needed a win that would not only gain momentum, but inspire the frontline soldiers to keep fighting. Ultimately, it was decided that the best strategic attack would be on Deep Space Nine. While there was some worry that this would draw forces from critical fronts, including that of the Vulcan border, Starfleet Admiralty would ultimately approve it. Before the offensive would be implemented, it was discovered that the Dominion had found a way of disabling the minefield, meaning that if Starfleet couldn't get to Deep Space Nine fast to stop them, the war would be over with no hope. This would cause the plans to be rushed, and Starfleet would have to launch without a large segment of its forces. This included the Ninth Fleet specifically, as well as their Klingon allies. So with no other option, and working in 3D space, which granted the ability to go in virtually any direction and curve around enemy vessels, allowing Starfleet to easily outrun Dominion counterparts, the Admirals would send all of their forces directly at the Dominion blockade, even though they were outnumbered 2 to 1. 
Before the overall confrontation, the Federation fleet of around 600 ships would come to a stop facing the Dominion blockade, which had around 1,254 ships. Sisko would initially order that the cruiser and Galaxy Wings come to half impulse, the Defiant taking the same position and speed as them, and then direct the attack fighters to engage with tactical pattern Theta and target only Cardassian ships. The hope being to pull Cardassian vessels out of position, thus opening up a hole that Starfleet forces could break through. The Starfleet fighters would start to absolutely pound on the Cardassian forces. Unfortunately, Starfleet fighters, being, you know, starfighters, would get absolutely decimated if even hit once by the Cardassian forces. Once doing their attack, however, they would turn around and run like hell. It's interesting to watch the tactics here. When the second wave of fighters are ordered to attack, Sisko also tells destroyer units 2 and 6 to move in, attempting to give these fighters cover fire without getting into the fight directly. However, he'd also be watching to ensure that the Dominion didn't try to move into a flanking position while they were trying to draw them out. The Federation forces would continue their antagonizing runs against the Cardassians, and ultimately it would appear to yield good fruit as some of the forces would move off after the fighters. However, Sisko recognizes Dukat's ploy almost immediately as Galore-class vessels would be set up in a position for an obvious trap. While there was now a hole in the Dominion lines, it was apparent a trap was there to lure in Starfleet forces into the breach and then close in around them, creating a kill zone for all of the vessels. Unfortunately, with no other options available, Sisko orders Galaxy Wings 9-1 and 9-3 to attempt to hold back the Galore vessels, and then the rest are to go into the breach. Once the entirety of the Federation's forces were in the kill zone, the Dominion utilizes a rotating EM pulse to shut down all communications, and Starfleet's lines absolutely crumble. Starfleet ships would begin to be shredded, and ultimately they would break off into individual fights with either one ship by itself or a few Federation ships making a last stand. Sisko had led Starfleet forces into a slaughter, and now the Dominion had split them up and were killing all of them off individually one by one. We'll get it appears that we are about to see the destruction of Starfleet's assets entirely, and it would be that if not for the arrival of the Klingon Defense Force. Though, no one knew or saw them coming for some reason. Well, until they were literally on top of both forces. I guess long-range sensors weren't working for either Starfleet nor the Dominion. Also, here's a thought. Instead of the Klingons assisting Starfleet at this battle, why didn't they just assault Deep Space Nine? DS9 was undefended and the Klingons could have simply bypassed it altogether. Again, I guess, like the long-range sensors, it just wouldn't look as good on the episode, so there we have it. The Klingon distraction would give some relief to Starfleet forces as the Dominion found itself surrounded and having to fight on two fronts. Though, even with this sudden surprise, the hole in the Dominion lines that briefly formed allowed for the Defiant to escape, but it wouldn't allow for any other ships. Any other vessel that attempted this maneuver would be destroyed. Now looking back at the battle, we don't exactly know how it ends. We know that Starfleet wins, just not how. We do know that Starfleet will take some massive hits, and personally, I think that Starfleet forces were all but obliterated when you consider that less than half of the ships would break through the lines and be making their way to Deep Space Nine after the Dominion forces were defeated. This would ultimately make it a Pyrrhic victory, but again, that all remains up for debate. We don't have a full breakdown of all the ships that were at the battle, but according to Memory Alpha, we do know of some. This would include the USS Centaur, Fate Unknown, the USS Cortez, Fate Unknown, USS Defiant, which survived, the USS Hood, which survived, the USS Magellan, Fate Unknown, USS Majestic, destroyed, the IKS Rotaran, which survived, the USS Sarek, Fate Unknown, the USS Satak, which was destroyed, the USS Trial, which survived, the USS Venture, which survived, as well as several Klingon birds of prey, including three that would be destroyed, over three Vorcha-class attack cruisers, over seven Akuras, multiple Excelsior-class starships, and over nine Galaxy-class ships. Not even to speak of the innumerable amount of Miranda-class vessels that were there. We would additionally have Steamrunner starships, Saber-class starships, and of course the Federation attack fighters that had been discussed before. On the Dominion side, we don't really know the losses there, but it would be significant, and that's not even including the 2800 ships that were definitely lost due to Deuce X profit. While definitely a significant victory, Operation Return was probably not as important as people would like to believe. It was ultimately a stalling measure at best. One that had to happen, to be sure, but... It was basically something that just kept the Dominion at bay. 
Starfleet and the Klingon Empire were still getting the holy hell beat out of them and could not sustain the war for a long time. Projections still show that they were going to lose. What's up, lore masters? Before I get into this video, let me be clear that this is not a character breakdown. Ducat will have his day, but I first have to finish Cisco and refine that series. What I'm going to be doing now is more a video that gives background and brushes up on the character. I feel like this is necessary due to the 180 of the series. This is also one of the prime reasons that I'm doing this, because Ducat will become the pawn in a larger theory that I'll be discussing much later. And, as I stated, the writing of this character changes him so drastically and impacts the story so much that if I were to continue on the series without addressing it, then the Dominion War would stop making a ton of sense. Getting down into it, Ducat, only ever known as that being his name, or Gold Ducat to signify his rank as captain, was a character intricately involved in the last stages of the Bajoran occupation. While the station goal was excessively cruel, there is some evidence to suggest that the man may have been the con of his time, being much gentler than his predecessors. Allegedly, he removed child labor, increased medical benefits, and even helped the occupational work hours. He would also claim that his responses were always measured compared to those who came before him, rarely ever taking more than one life for every life taken by the Bajoran terrorists. I've discussed this before, but when I analyze Dakot, try to classify him, I see him either as chaotic neutral or neutral evil. The goal generally goes where the winds take him and rarely lets any moral well, moral by our standards, judgments impact his actions. I do believe that he has causes that he believes in, including the superiority of the Cardassian race above all else, though these values would come at the expense of other races. Ducat would take several different roles within the series, starting as the antagonist, then moving to attempt to help fight the Maquis, then fighting the Klingons and assisting DS9, to the ultimate betrayal and joining the Dominion, and then his insanity break. The Ducat we came to know, before he went insane, does truly believe in himself, and I don't think he really had any need to want to hurt others initially. Don't misunderstand, I don't think he has any qualms with murder, he just doesn't actively have the desire. We also see the fight for his soul, if you will, as he tries to restore the Cardassia he once knew. Though, unfortunately, he would see Cardassia through nostalgic goggles, meaning that he was only ever destined to be evil. The ultimate break of Dukat would come after his daughter is killed and the losing of Tarak Nor to the Federation for a second time. This causes him to go completely insane. He gives up his command and is captured. While the doctors state that the man had fully recovered, in reality he was deeply, deeply ill. The transport ship he was on for his enrainment would be attacked and he would be able to ultimately escape. Alas, by this time, the Cardassian would begin to have mental delusions and become easily angered, even attempting to kill Sisko because the captain wouldn't consider him an old friend in the DS9 episode Waltz. The former goal and maniac would then escape and become a tool of the Paw Wraiths. Of all the things I have ever analyzed, the continuity gaps that I have mocked, this is probably one of the worst issues I've seen, and the reason it bugs me so much is that it was done so willingly. And the episode that I discussed, Waltz, is so ham-fisted at the end, it's eye-rolling. It's worth noting that this change isn't a natural progression of the story. No, Dukat was going a place that the writers didn't realize and ultimately didn't like, so they forced him into another role. It's one of the most disappointing pieces of Ira's work, if you ask me. And I'll be honest, I know this one is a little bit shorter and I'm not giving a ton of information, it is just worth noting the change in Dukat so that you guys can better understand where we'll be going in the future. That said, there is a bright spot here. This occurrence would be the second clue to a third power that had emerged as a part of this war. One that seemingly had joined the Federation, but ultimately wasn't on their side. The war between the Federation Alliance and the Dominion would ultimately become one between the Federation Alliance, the Dominion, and the Bajoran wormhole aliens. Stay tuned, things just got more conspiracy-y. What's up, lore masters? One of the oddities of the Dominion War is when people in Starfleet still consider themselves scientists first and foremost, versus that of actual soldiers. When I began watching DS9's One Little Ship, I was prepared to be critical of the mission overall, but after a rewatch, I'm not as bothered by it. Ultimately, it seems like something that Starfleet would do, wanting to return to the roots in a way, but requiring a military necessity of what they're doing. 
So when they find an anomaly that has some scientific significance, along with military pragmatic use, they send a runabout along with the Defiant to investigate it. They would use the runabout tethered via tractor beam in order to better analyze the phenomena. It would allow them to possibly create a transwarp corridor that they could use as a tactical advantage. However, they're also studying something that hasn't been observed before. It's logical and would fit both purposes. Though, Kira finding it funny when she thinks of men who are extremely small may be unfortunate for Odo, but that's another more erotic video we could discuss. What I will be critical of, however, is how the Defiant didn't pick up a Jem'Hadar warship on its long-range sensors, nor really prepared for the possibility that a Jem'Hadar warship might be there. Given what we've seen in this war, it really feels like long-range sensors are more theory than something that actually works. And yeah, yeah, I know, the dialogue tries to wave this off by making it seem like they had no way of knowing. They state that it was impossible that you could know that the Jem'Hadar were coming from a specific side of the anomaly. But for that to make sense, a couple of things had to happen. First, the Defiant would have had to be around the anomaly for a while. Certainly, when they were coming up on it, they would have been able to detect the enemy until they got right next to the phenomenon. Additionally, if they knew that there was going to be a way that could mask the warp signature, then they could have put buoys or other ships there to protect the Defiant. If they didn't know that, then they weren't going out of their way to make sure that everyone was protected. This is a time of war, and they are not looking at worst case scenarios when having a lone ship by itself. Seriously? I mean, honestly, the only reasonable deduction here is that Starfleet didn't account for sitting next to something that would allow them to be blindsided when they could have had drones or other ships there, like I've stated, and all this while in the middle of a war with an alien species that has always had an edge when it comes to weaponry. This is just top of the top minds in Starfleet right now, folks, the best they have. My rant aside, though, the Defiant would be caught off guard and take one hell of a beating. In what is, my opinion, Cisco makes a tactical mistake here as well. He keeps the Defiant prone and allows it to be constantly hit so that he can try to maintain the tractor beam on the runabout. While I'm not saying it's something to be taken lightly, the first thing that should have happened was the sacrificing of the Rubicon. The Defiant itself should have come to full alert, went to impulse, and tried to fight off the Jem'Hadar fighter. If they were caught completely off guard and couldn't defend themselves, they should have ran like hell. The Defiant and its crew are more important than the Rubicon all day, every day. But unfortunately, tactical sound decisions aren't in order, as what we would see is that the Defiant is boarded and taken over. Of course, Cisco wouldn't deactivate the computer like Riker does in TNG's Rascals, because that would make too much sense. Nope, a ship that has the most advanced weaponry and defensive systems that the Federation has ever made would be taken with no lockouts. Thanks so much, Captain. Luckily for the Starfleet crew, the Jem'Hadar would be as competent as they are, so we don't really have a lot to worry about. The introduction of the Jem'Hadar being bred from the Alpha Quadrant is shown, and through dialogue, we're led to believe that they are probably more egotistical and arrogant than even the great Sisko. Their actions, the Jem'Hadar, not Sisko, would be foolhardy compared to the knowledge and experience of the Gamma Quadrant Jem'Hadar counterparts. As we look at their plans and walk through what they intend to do, I will be honest, I'm not impressed with the thought that killing Cisco is a requirement in order to keep the ship secure. Dialogue from both the Gamma Quadrant Jem'Hadar and Cisco indicates that Cisco should have been killed, but I disagree. The captain is a high-level Starfleet officer and space Jesus to the Bajorans, of which the Jem'Hadar know. Having him in their prisons would mean that the Bajorans would do anything to get him out, including joining the Dominion, and they would get all of his tactical knowledge. If they need him removed from the field, from the game, put him in his own room or just keep him knocked out for as long as you need. Killing him is simply a waste. Though, I will say that allowing him to stay alive and trying to fix the ship with his command crew would be a fatal mistake. But again, making dumb mistakes is basically the MO for the Dominion, so none of us should be surprised. Getting back to the episode though, once the vessel has been completely taken over by the Dominion and repairs begin underway, the Jem'Hadar fighter then makes its way to Korridon, leaving the Defiant by itself, which First, you're telling me that the Dominion thinks one ship can take on a vital dilithium production planet for the Federation without any issues. And even more important, you're also telling me that neither the first 
Jem'Hadar, nor the Vorta think it important to have another vessel there to protect one of the most powerful ships the Federation has with its computer core intact. They don't escort the Defiant back home, and more importantly, they don't begin downloading everything they can from that vessel. Really? Really, really, you have got to be kid. This is ridiculous. You have a Federation computer core with all of the vital information on the Defiant and possibly the Federation. Why would you not take that first? Now, let me be honest a second. I know I've been critical, but I do enjoy some aspects of this episode and the lore. I do enjoy the back and forth between the second and Cisco, and the attempts by Cisco and his crew to retake the ship. While pretending to fix it so that it can get back to Dominion space, it's really intense and, and really well done. While I won't be doing a beat for beat of the episode, and that's for another series coming up, I will say that... Again, it's a pretty solid story, even if there are some things that don't make a lot of sense. I enjoy the feel of the episode. It does show that they still have people who are science officers who want to go out and find new civilizations and new people, but they are also soldiers and that would come first. It also showed a natural evolution of the Dominion to make Alpha Quadrant Jim Hadar and how a scenario of what would happen if the crew were caught unaware. Unfortunately, I don't think we'd ever see something like this again, and in the next few episodes we will see how Starfleet treats someone who could have saved thousands of lives, but chose his booty call over winning a war, and we're going to be introduced to Section 31. What's up, Lore Masters? When the Coalition of Planets formed into the Federation, it meant that four of the most powerful species in the Alpha Quadrant would come together in common defense in the pursuit of knowledge. This would spark the creation of the Federation's Starfleet. The primarily scientific but also militaristic organization would be defined by the Starfleet Charter, a vast document that set the standard for what effectively would define the Alliance. It would push them to boldly go where no man has gone before. Among the untold number of policies, Article 14, Section 31 was included and allows for extraordinary measures taken in times of extreme threat. However, the organization of Section 31, at least in designation, comes from the United Earth, where that specific entity worked in the shadows advocating for the betterment of humanity and its allies. They stayed in the shadows at that point and arguably would gain the bulk of their technological advantage during this time. For those who are new to the channel, I have a video that theorized the reason the Borg aren't mentioned by other species of Starfleet and that the Federation is caught completely unaware due to Section 31. This would be because they moved in and took all of the technology found in the Broken Sphere on Earth and started using it for their clandestine operations. Regardless of how they were able to though, Section 31 would live in the shadows throughout most of United Earth's history and indeed into Starfleet's history. While an updated video is definitely warranted on Section 31, especially its impact on the Federation as well as how public it was, for the purposes of this essay, it's simple enough to say that at the point of Deep Space Nine, those who worked for Section 31, the agents, were effectively able to work autonomously to one degree or another, safeguarding the Federation against the threats that would come about. However, regardless of the background, the question that consistently is debated is their very existence. Evolved humans, those who had overcome the barbaric emotions that we experience today like jealousy, hatred, and others, were taught about how much Earth and humanity had progressed. This can be best seen in Starfleet officers that decided to serve and explore. Starfleet, after all, is a promise. Officers give their life for you, you give your life for them, and nobody gets left behind. They would boldly go where no man has gone before. But if humanity was so evolved, wouldn't a clandestine organization that has humans as a part of its base be the height of hypocrisy? Does it not make the entire ethos and belief of the Federation a lie? It's an interesting ethical dilemma, one that we will discuss later, and something that can definitely be argued is continuity breaking. But the ultimate problem with the quandary is that it's unlikely the Federation would be able to exist without them. Starfleet officers think they live in a universe where common decency exists, but the truth is there are no rules of conduct, either in peace or war. Everything largely depends on circumstance. 
The need for Section 31 would be necessary long before even the Dominion. The mere existence of the Romulan Star Empire, and more importantly the formation of the Tal Shiar, meant that some Federation department without rules would be necessary, given how successful the Romulans are at not only deception, but causing discord and unity, an effective counter to their operations would be absolutely required. There are some who have questioned if Section 31 would survive in the Federation feasibly, if they'd be able to exist throughout the years without being stopped. Certainly, if they did, they would have mastered Sun Tzu, to quote him specifically, be extremely subtle even to the point of formlessness, be extremely mysterious even to the point of soundlessness. Thereby, you can be the director of the opponent's fate. While I think it would be tricky, Section 31 could exist in the shadows without detection for a long, long time. With those in Starfleet Command simply pushing the individual concerns of officers aside, Section 31 appears to be extremely careful and methodical when it decides to act, generally at least. Not every Federation ending event would be something Section 31 would step in for. They would only move in when they felt they absolutely had to. Additionally, you could argue that the institution simply gave the right push here and there so that Starfleet officers would be the one to save the day. Of course, some would theorize that this ultimately changes, which brings us to the Dominion War. After all, that's the series you're watching and you're interested in, right? From everything I can tell, the Dominion War is one of the very few instances where Section 31 became exceedingly aggressive, to the point of possible carelessness. And yes, at some point we will discuss Star Trek Discovery, but that's not for right now. Slowly, they would start tipping their hand more than they ever had before, which would only emphasize the increasing threat of the Dominion. Given how persuasive the Dominion is and what they can offer, the necessity to identify possible traitors in Starfleet and then use them to destroy the Federation from within is a real concern. To that end, Section 31 would identify those who have ultimately turned and then kill them. While Sloan states that they are subversive at that point and stay in the shadows, as I've alluded to, their actions are anything but after the Dominion began to push hard into the Federation. We see the evidence of this in DS9's Inquisition, where Julian Bashir is investigated for being a traitor to the Federation and, once he's found to be innocent, is offered to be recruited into that very same entity. Though here's a question. Did Sloan ever truly think that Julian was a Dominion spy? Is it possible that he put the entire affair together in order to indirectly show Julian the depths that Section 31 would be willing to go, the total length of espionage that they would do in order to keep the Federation safe, but then be more than willing to show him that they are the good guys, they would let the innocent go? After all, they kept his memory intact. Perhaps it was an attempt to show that while Section 31 did do things that were questionable at best, they're still the good guys. Was it all a ploy to play on Bashir's spy fantasies to bring him in and use him as an operative? While it's a bit of a stretch, I grant, it's not completely implausible. I will say though that if it's true, it was a complete miscalculation on Sloane's side. An interesting theory. Tell me what you think. However, ironically, it would not be the quiet assassinations of traitor Starfleet officers that would be the riskiest operation conducted by Section 31, at least not during the Dominion War. The largest gamble would occur in 2372, before the Dominion War, but during the growing tensions of the Dominion Cold War. Section 31 would co-op Starfleet Medical and ensure that Odo is infected with a morphogenic virus. This operation would include at least 73 people in the conspiracy. It included doctors, computer technicians, Starfleet security, and admirals. It was a massive undertaking that has so many moving parts it could not possibly be accomplished seamlessly and would leave traces of the spy organization's involvement. As of the upload of this video, we don't know if the operation was ever exposed publicly, but it certainly would be one of the smoking guns that forever exists that could be used against them if it was ever found out. We have no real way of knowing if Section 31 was ever dismantled or destroyed. I'm sure Discovery and Picard will give us some indication on that one way or the other. In the end, the question is, does Section 31 destroy any semblance of utopia that the Federation always proclaimed to have? Is the Federation, the thought that you can become better than the sum of your parts and be truly selfless, delusional? Honestly, that comes down to your core being and beliefs on what Star Trek should be. An optimist who looked at the Federation and Starfleet as being the pinnacle of what we could become if we just tried enough and that we could get over our bigotries would probably accept that the utopia is a lie. 
that all of these good measures, these principles of humanity, are only there because those who claim them are walking on a river of blood and they don't even know it. If you're pragmatic or a pessimist, then you would be willing to accept that Starfleet was always unrealistic and never would survive without men like Sloane. This specific video essay may be a bit confusing given how different from the others it is in the series. Ultimately, it's been my goal to try to make effectively a documentary, one that breaks down the events as we go through them, episode by episode, conflict by conflict. However, in order to understand how insidious Section 31 is and how impactful they will be, an understanding of the organization from the point of view of Deep Space Nine specifically was necessary. Additionally, it also shows one thing. Those Starfleet officers who believed that they were evolved humans, who thought they were the pinnacle of their species, that Starfleet could do no wrong, that the Federation was a promise, that there was no avarice, no greed, or thought of destruction or murder, ultimately lived in what is often described as a gilded cage, something that is made of beautiful metals, including gold and silver with ornate jewels. But just underneath that, beneath the shine and polish, is corroded grime that keeps it all together. What's up, Lore Masters? One of the most controversial episodes in not only DS9, but Star Trek overall, is specifically in the pale moonlight. Many have stated that this episode, this one in particular, is where the line is crossed. It distinguishes between those who are okay with their darker tones and the fundamental change of Starfleet and Star Trek, and for those who feel Roddenberry's legacy was forever impacted, and Roddenberry himself betrayed. Before we get into the pale moonlight and completely break it down with an almost mind-numbing amount of focus, I think it's important to understand that the episode is honestly just a culmination of everything that we have seen up to this point from Deep Space Nine. If indeed there was a line that could be crossed, it had already occurred long, long ago. This episode, Cisco's fall from grace, Starfleet Command being okay with getting tens to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people killed, just highlighted what the show had always been about, what it had led up to. Before we even look at anything to do with the Dominion, we have to remember that there was already signs that Jean's vision was being modified. Many forget that Kira Norris was a terrorist. She was also second in command of Deep Space Nine, meaning that Starfleet was allying itself with people that liked killing Cardassians as a part of their mating practice. Now don't misunderstand, there was obvious legitimate reason for the Bajorans to resist and Starfleet to be okay with it. But we find out that some of the things Kira did in her past are events, are actions that would have her put in jail for a long, long time. When you're a terrorist, you're still doing some pretty awful things, and sometimes to people who didn't deserve it. Not only that, but these superior humans, the ones that were the best of the best, were anything but. Cisco showed anger, jealousy, and was vengeful, to the point of using weapons of mass destruction to poison an entire planet. Chief O'Brien almost committed suicide, and these things are just off the top of my head. I haven't done any research, just what I can remember. So before we have even discussed the Dominion, we can see the cracks. And these things that had already existed are simply amplified when we get into the Dominion arc. The slow fade we see of Starfleet Command and a senior officer is spread throughout the Dominion Cold War and the war itself. Hell, even looking at the Dominion Cold War, it had gotten bad, it had amplified. We know Starfleet brazenly would intrude into what Dominion claimed to be their space, not opting to negotiate, but simply not listening. Now, to be fair, they were doing it without knowing, they were told it was a breach afterwards, but still, they decided to say, hey, you know what? Screw you, we're gonna go wherever we want. They then send an entire refit Galaxy-class starship into Dominion space to save one man who was legitimately caught in Dominion territory. That's not even to mention the day Starfleet decided to step back and allow the genocide of the Changelings, nor the attempted Starfleet coup. The truth is, the degradation of Starfleet and the Star Trek universe, it becoming more dark, becoming a dystopia compared to what TNG said it was, was always occurring in DS9. Those who get upset at this episode specifically really just hadn't put the pieces together yet. I know it may be weird to do a quick video basically recapping something that I've painfully done for the last 20-some episodes, but ironically, 
I don't think it's as obvious, even if you're watching my videos one after the other. Every time I discuss In a Pale Moonlight, there's always talk about how it was a betrayal of Gene Roddenberry's vision. I honestly think, if you believe that, if you believe that it is a betrayal of Roddenberry's vision, which is arguable, I don't think that's necessarily wrong, then all of this actually began at the beginning of DS9, and that has to be taken into account. The next few episodes of the series will be analyzing In a Pale Moonlight, and I expect that there will be a lot of debate on that. So to try to help out, or at least give a reference video when it comes up, I decided to do this one. All that said, I am interested in what you guys think. Did DS9 overall break Roddenberry's vision? Did it betray everything he was for? In my opinion, I do lean yes, but that said, I think it's a much better and much more rich universe because of it. I still think that it is a utopia. I still think that it shows the best of humanity. It's just realistic. But all of these are my opinions. What are yours? What's up, lore masters? When analyzing the Dominion War, it can be easy to get confused at how badly the war was actually going with some of the storytelling in Deep Space Nine. Remember, for the most part, Starfleet largely was losing this conflict with only brief victories here and there to push the Dominion back or stalemate them. Episode after episode, show after show, things were always getting worse and worse. While there were episodes like Sacrifice of Angels, which had major victories with the Dominion taking a major blow, it only delayed what was quite clearly the inevitable. It's in the pale moonlight that we finally see the culmination of all of the episodes prior. The war's toll on Starfleet and its members was finally starting to catch up. More and more morale was down. Every Friday, Cisco posted the casualty reports and those missing in action from what was occurring. This impacted not only him, but the entire station. Additionally, the war was going so poorly that somehow, in some way, there was always a person that would lose someone. I'll be honest, I always found the discussion at the beginning of the episode extremely curious when I watched it. We find Dax lamenting the loss of an instructor she knew at the academy and is excessively bitter that it occurs next to the Romulan border, as if blaming the Romulans for letting the Dominion walk through their territory. Not only does Dax herself justify why they would allow this, the Romulan Star Empire allowing their major enemies to slug it out in their backyard, but let's all just level set here. The Dominion crossing the Romulan border isn't the problem. Not really. Starfleet tactics, the technology disparity at the beginning of the war, and the fact that Starfleet officers hold themselves back in combat is why Starfleet is losing. If the only advantage the Dominion had was the Romulans allowing them to cross their border and conduct hit and run operations, this war, this conversation, would be much, much different. Bashir's response to all of this is also very contradictory. Remember, the man wanted everyone to surrender. He literally predicted what's happening, that they would all lose and this many people would die. But now he's wanting to pull the Romulans into the war so they can take the offensive, wanting to cause more death and ultimately lose anyway. To be fair, he believes his calculations may have been off, so perhaps he's thinking that they could make a difference. But any logical person would see that his predictions that we see in statistical probabilities are currently turning out to be prophetic. And even Starfleet would agree. As we learn later, they are attempting to barter peace, putting feelers out there to see what they could get away with. I also want to take a moment to consider Cisco's reaction after everyone has talked. It's right here and at this moment that I was going to talk about the paving of the road to hell and good intentions. But arguably, this isn't even good intentions. Sure, the Federation Alliance needs the Romulans to join in on the war or all is lost, but you're talking about bringing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Romulans into the conflict, with many of them going to die. Even if done quote unquote legitimately, I don't know that this could be considered good. Simply pragmatic. So while I do think that the first brick is laid in the road to hell and not later, as Cisco says, it's not necessarily something virtuous. However, irregardless of what the decision's moral implications are, this is definitely where the slow fade begins. Cisco wants to bring the Romulans into the war. He wants to do it quote unquote legitimately through discussion and dialogue. He is still a Starfleet officer here, after all, and that is something I truly believe. But we already start to see him moving away from that, and it'll change quite drastically. In the next scene, he's having a debate with Dax. The female Trill makes a convincing argument that there isn't much reason for the Romulans to enter the war. Personally, I believe the Romulans always intended to enter into the war, but that's a theory for another time. 
I will, however, take a moment to give a literal two to six second pause as I smile smugly when Dax quite clearly points out that the Romulan Star Empire and Dominion are allies. The dialogue could not be any clearer regardless of what anyone decides to say. As stated, after a brief back and forth, Sisko and Dax seem to believe that the Romulans will only ever be self-serving to the point of self-destruction. It's good to see Federation officers still stereotyping others. Sisko decides that he will need evidence of a future Dominion assault on the Romulan Star Empire to convince the Ryansu to join the war. For anyone who has watched the episode before, I would highly, highly suggest you watch the interactions between Sisko and Garrick in a vacuum. To be specific here, watch the conversations and only the conversations. Don't watch anything in between. If you do, I think you will plainly see how Garrick quite clearly manipulates Sisko. He plays him like a fiddle. In the first conversation, the captain asks if Garrick can retrieve top secret war plans in which Garrick responds he's not in the business of suicide missions. Whether Garrick ever truly thought Sisko wanted him to do it himself, I don't think we'll ever know. But it's Sisko who suggests that Garrick use his contacts. The next back and forth, I think, is extremely vital. Garrick says that to do what is asked, it will be an extremely bloody and messy business. Sisko states that he's already in a bloody business, but Garrick means something different. If you watch the Cardassian carefully, you can see him sizing up Sisko. I'm not convinced that Garrick ever really cared what the response from the captain was. I think he cared how the man responded. I think the former Obsidian Order agent was trying to look into the soul of the Starfleet captain. He wanted to see if Sisko would be all right with helping a killer do what needed to be done. And I do think he found what he was looking for. We also see Garrick priming the captain here, stating that the Cardassian is about to use every resource he has left, that to do this, they have to go all the way. What this means for either man is extremely different. The conversation would end with Garrick setting out to do the requested business. Of course, the war would be doing its level best to help Garrick as that night, Sisko learns that Beta Z had fallen. This means a new battle line had formed and the Dominion could strike against Vulcan, Andor, Alpha Centauri, and even Earth. This is just more evidence that the old ways weren't working. Honor, dedication, commitment, and the Federation way was failing. They had beaten back well past DS9 and the lines were pretty stark. Though, I'm not going to question how the Dominion got so far into Federation territory and yet still can't take DS9, which is literally right next to Cardassian space, but anyway. The Battle of Beta Z simply shows how incompetent Starfleet is. The fleet defending Beta Z was out of position, and the planet itself had antiquated defenses, not to mention that Starfleet intelligence was completely surprised by the attack. Even this late in the game, Starfleet was still trying to relearn how to war, and they were learning the hard way. After learning of the defeat, Sisko approaches Garrick again, and the conversation that's had is, in my mind, a piece of art. In the future, we will see Garrick coaching Sisko on how to manipulate someone. He tells the emissary to lie to Vrenak and say that quite a few Federation officers died behind the lines to bring the information to the Romulans. To make it seem dire to the Romulan senator that this was a bloody and messy affair. So is it any surprise that in the conversation with Sisko, Garrick says that he reached out to all his contacts who wanted to help destroy the Dominion, and they're all now dead. Not only are they dead, they were killed within 24 hours. I'm sure it was at least 10 good men that lost their lives. Dominion intelligence is just too good. Everyone is dying. But wait, why would you want to stop? The stakes are far too high now to even think that way. The fate of the entire Alpha and Beta, you forgot Beta, Garrick, quadrants hang in the balance. Don't you understand, Captain? We can't stop now. We have to keep going. This has to be done. People are already dead. The Federation is going to fall. I mean, that's what you said, right? You said that it was going to be bloody, and here we are seeing the consequences of that. And again, this is all your idea. You're the one that's saying Armageddon is here, so we have to take the next step. Why would you give up on your own idea? But don't despair, Captain. If we can't get the evidence ourselves, let's just make it up. It'll be easy and basically what you wanted anyway. I mean, the Dominion likely has plans to attack the Romulans, so let's just fake the evidence we know that is true somewhere. Oh, and don't worry, we can definitely make this happen. It'll barely be an inconvenience. We'll convince a senator to make a secret trip to DS9. How I knew where he was going or that he would be here is irrelevant. We'll show him a fake holographic recording where the planned invasion of Romulus is being discussed. Jin's your uncle, Dom's your aunt, and we have ourselves a war ally after all this. Let's pause a moment. If it's not abundantly clear, 
I think Garrick was lying. I don't think he ever had anyone on Cardassia that he intended to use. It's really interesting that everyone, everyone Garrick ever knew is dead after talking to them, and yet he still has a contact to get an optolithic data rod, something that can only be made on Cardassia. I sincerely believe that Garrick intended to kill the senator the very moment he was approached by the good captain. That he hatched this entire scheme to ensure that the Romulan response was all but assured. But we'll get more into that next time. What's up, lore masters? This is a multi-part series breaking down one of the most contentious episodes in all of Star Trek. -dom. Specifically, we're looking at In the Pale Moonlight. If you want to start from the beginning, which I highly suggest so you won't be confused, please check in the top right corner or by clicking in the link in the description. With that out of the way, let's just get into it. In the last video, we discussed how Garrick had manipulated Sisko. While I still stand by that analysis, it's worth noting that Sisko was someone who was completely capable of going to the point of murder on his own. That is to say, he is the type of person who could do something this evil if he had to. In fact, we've seen him do things like this in the past, albeit just indirectly. So, looking back at the episode itself and with the manipulation in full swing, Garrick and Sisko would go about the business of bringing the Romulans into the war. The first step was to free a man who was set to be executed by the Klingon Empire, a holosmith by the name of Graython. The man is at first jovial at being freed and shows himself to be a little bit of a pervert, but he sobers up completely when he realizes that Garrick is involved in their pursuits. This would be another red flag for Sisko, the man hearing the voice in the back of his head again. His conscience, which is something he doesn't hear a lot, it seems. The voice would be telling him that something was off, but ultimately he would push forward. After all, people were dying every day. And the war, like before, wasn't making it easier, constantly reminding him of everything that is being lost. Unfortunately, Graython would not be content with simply waiting in his quarters and being free. He apparently opts to assault a Dabo girl, to which the hero of the day, Quark of all people, would save her. While I do firmly believe that the first brick in the road to the destruction of Sisko's Starfleet morality was laid the moment he decided to bring the Romulans into the war, the first real betrayal of his uniform would come when Sisko bribes Quark to not press any charges as there could not be any evidence left tying Thor to DS9. Quark would be rejuvenated to know that even Starfleet officers could be corrupted. Here's an interesting side note. It's funny how Quark can decide to press charges or not, but the Dabo girl doesn't have that option. Huh. Dabo Girl aside, I keep harping on it, but the writing is so exquisite. The slow fate of Sisko is written exceptionally well. Every action he does up to this point is escalatory, but natural. It never goes too far too fast. He's just taking one step after the other. And the inner dialogue and monologue with himself, how he's just fighting what he is becoming is so excellent. The scene where he debates if he should be going forward after bribing Quark and is near quitting, but then there's that damn casualty report. It's poetry. Though, let me stop and bring up the DS9 episode, Statistical Probabilities, for a moment. There are two reasons I bring this up. The first being that a lot of people get so triggered that I point out its legitimacy. They hate the fact that sometimes you have to bend to evil to save lives. I look forward to those yummy, algo-pushing comments, so please, please hate me. And the second is to look at the two different Ciscos, which there is a stark difference. Cisco back in that episode in statistical probabilities was self-righteous. He was willing to let everyone die to go down fighting because he couldn't fathom that saving lives meant bending the knee. And now, now that he sees what that actually looks like, he's watching that decision to continue to fight, what it actually meant, that because he didn't decide to go with Bashir's plan that people are dying every day and it's happening so often that at least one person knows someone who is gone every casualty report, now he's a changed man. He's more willing to lose himself and what Starfleet means just for the possibility of winning. The possibility. The Romulans joining aren't even a sure thing. Again, we're just trying to stem the tide. Make no mistake, Bashir was partially right. Without the Romulans and some boneheaded decisions on the part of the Dominion, the Federation Alliance would have lost, and Sisko would have continued to watch thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions die. All because of his ego. 
Back to the episode, as the operation continues, more and more Cisco would be trying to find ways to justify what was happening. He would continue to lie to himself or simply ignore his gut instincts. This would all come to a head when Garrick requests another major brick to be laid. The Cardassian would state that he found a genuine optolithic rod. Let's stop briefly for a second. I believe that this is also another clue that Garrick always intended to kill the Senator. The fact that Garrick vouches for the contact but never said why he vouches and we never see the source is odd. Additionally, what the contact wants is rather interesting. He wants 200 liters of biomimetic gel. At first, Sisko scoffs and declines to give it. Garrick says without the biomimetic gel, they won't be able to continue. And Sisko is okay with that. He says that the entire operation should stop. After a few moments and realizing what that meant, Sisko would ultimately agree to let some biomimetic gel go, just not 200 liters. It's funny how quick Garrick backs down from that number and states that it's negotiable. This opens up a couple of interesting ideas. It could be that Garrick, understanding how bartering works, gave a higher number than he actually required and knew Sisko would decline in order to get the actual number he wanted. Or... What if Garrick kept the biomimetic gel? Imagine what he could trade for that given how restricted the material was. Also, if the optolithic data rods are made on Cardassia on an as-needed basis, what exactly would a high-level Cardassian officer need with such a medical marvel? It makes me wonder if Garrick didn't keep the gel for himself. You know, for a rainy day. After all, who is to say that Garrick didn't keep an optolithic rod and simply said it was someone else? You never know when you might want to manipulate a Starfleet officer to win a war, after all. Just something to consider. Cisco orders that 83 liters of biomimetic gel is packaged for interstellar transport and to be sent off. He would give the orders, in writing, to Bashir, who files an official protest. Of course, I'm sure Bashir's log, where Bashir specifically mentions this happened, won't be corrupted, the orders won't disappear, and the protest will definitely make it to Starfleet Medical. You know, that all will stay on the up and up. I feel confident of that. And... After all this, after everything that has happened, the hollow program would be made. The lie that was probably true anyway with the planned invasion of Romulus would be created. We would see the stress of it all bearing down on Sisko as he would threaten the Hollowsmith. Even inferring harm would come to the man. Though this never goes anywhere, so we won't be bringing it up again. Stay tuned as we will ultimately discuss the conclusion of this episode. When Sisko loses all of his self-respect and the Romulans enter the war. What's up, lore masters? This is going to be the second to last video breaking down DS9's In the Pale Moonlight. If you haven't seen the previous editions, click in the top right hand corner or in the description below, as the rest of this won't make a lot of sense if you don't. Let's just get into it. The last time we left off, the Holosmith had created the fake program that was going to be given to the Senator. Sisko would go about the business of preparing everything that was involved in having the Senator arrive, including getting the Optolithic Rod ready, as well as other accommodations. During this time, the Hollowsmith would be sent back to his quarters and sequestered there, Garrick stating that he was going to visit the man very shortly. If you haven't, I would suggest re-watching this episode and heavily focus on the next scene after everything up to this point. There is a very critical piece of dialogue that is often ignored. Sisko ultimately tries to console himself by admitting that, in the end, he's off the hook. Remember, Starfleet Command signed off on the entire operation. This, of course, makes sense. However, the implications of it are devastating. Think about it. Starfleet Command agreed to fool the Romulan Star Empire into believing an attack is on the way in order to ensure the Romulans enter the war. This is so that Starfleet might actually have a chance of winning. Either Starfleet Command has become extremely desperate, or Section 31 had a hand in helping out the good captain. Irregardless, this dialogue would ultimately mean that it wasn't just the soul of one officer, but that of the entirety of Starfleet Command. The entity that was created to explore new worlds, to seek out new life and civilizations, when it's pinned against the wall, it sinks into the mud and does what has to be done to ensure its own survival even at the cost of all of its values that it once held. With that dour realization out of the way, looking back at the operation, it is very telling how accustomed to espionage and underhanded scheming Sisko becomes at the end of this episode. When Garrick mentions he will be sneaking onto the Senator's ship to get information on the Dominion, Sisko doesn't bat an eye. The captain agrees to allow a former Cardassian spy to sneak onto another nation's ship, hack their systems, and gain information on another enemy. 
There's an infinite number of ways this should be raising all kinds of alarms, and we'll see them at a later point, but Cisco just misses it, or he ignores it. It's just ironic to see how the man has fallen, that he doesn't even recognize right from wrong. The meeting between Vrenak and Cisco goes as expected. The senator is excessively smug, Cisco ignoring most of his quips. The Romulan brings up fantastic reasons for why the Star Empire shouldn't enter into the war. Dominion shipyards are operating at 100% capacity, the Federation is still rebuilding. The Jemadar are being bred at an enormous rate, and Starfleet and the Klingons are having to do it the old-fashioned way. The Federation is even looking to sign peace accords, everyone sees it. Plainly stated, Starfleet is losing. Not to be overzealous here, but Bashir is showing to still be right on his suggestions in statistical probabilities. Though, after all the posturing is done, they do get down to the nitty gritty, with Sisko giving the optolithic rod to the senator, and Vrenak calling him out on it being a fake at the end of the day. The self-righteous, green-blooded individual promises to expose Starfleet for who they are and what they had done. And of course, most everyone knows how this ends. The senator's ship is destroyed. Let's pause a moment. Previously in the episode, there was a discussion on the uses of biomimetic gel, that it could be used for cloning, for medical miracles, and for bombs. Throughout this miniseries, I've been discussing how Garrick had intended to kill the senator all along. What if the biomimetic gel wasn't necessarily only for the Cardassian to barter with, but to use as that bomb? I know I discussed in the past how he may have been keeping it in a storage facility, but a commenter pointed out that some of it could have been used for such a purpose. That he intended all along to use the biomimetic gel as a weapon against the Romulans. We don't have a lot of information on the gel, but you could theorize that perhaps it's hard to scan for and thus would make a great weapon. It would explain why it can't be given out so easily by the Federation, along with the cloning and other issues. How perfect would it be that not only did Sisko help ensure the senator was killed, but supplied Garrick with all of the required elements to ensure that that assassination went smoothly? It'd almost be like poetry. After the senator was killed and Sisko realized what occurred, the captain would rush in, probably ready to put Garrick into the med bay. But the Cardassian would use his final gambit, his final argument, showing that the Romulans would ultimately enter into the war and then reminding Sisko that all of this was his idea. That Sisko knew that Garrick could do things that he couldn't, and it was all worth it. While I loathe the battle that is going to occur with CBS and myself, I'm going to go ahead and play this bit of the episode in its full measure. Let's take a look at the argument being used against someone who lied, who cheated, who covered up the crimes of other men, and someone who will ultimately be able to live with it. What's up, Lore Masters? This video is going to be the conclusion of my four-part analysis of the Deep Space Nine episode, In the Pale Moonlight. While the three previous episodes aren't necessarily required to understand this one, I would encourage you to watch them for better context. With that out of the way, let's just get into it. One of the key points of the DS9 episode is that the Romulans haven't entered the war, and that they have no intent to do so. As Dax states, the Star Empire can sit back while the Federation Alliance and Dominion slug it out. No matter who loses the war, they believe that they win. However, Allow me to disagree. I believe that this statement is based on a war-weary soldier who has a very myopic view of the Romulans that's based on Federation propaganda. Let me break it down. When you look at the Romulans objectively, things are far more nuanced than Dax lets on. While I know some disagree, I think evidence supports that the Romulans are more a paper tiger than anything else. They don't win major scale wars as we observe with their history and multiple alternate universe scenarios show they lose every time. This is why Romulan Command largely tries to stay in the background, opting to pit the allies against each other and utilize subterfuge against those who they determine to be a threat so that the wars are fought between others and not them. Their society is also extremely authoritarian with a senate and leader that uses the Tal Shiar to keep the populace and military personnel in check. Ironically, the populace of the Empire, including a lot of the soldiers, don't want war. They strive for peace and to leave the Federation alone. There's a large divide under the veneer of unity within the Star Empire. 
But irregardless of the various factions within Romulan society, something both sides would agree on and is plainly obvious is that before the Dominion, there are effectively three major powers. You have the United Federation of Planets, the Klingon Empire, and the Romulan Star Empire. The other governments and nations could not hope to stand up to what these three empires are capable of. In fact, this is one of the main concerns for the Romulans in the next generation. The Klingon Federation Alliance meant that the Romulans found themselves surrounded. Luckily for them, Starfleet Admiralty, the Federation Council, and President all required you to be an idiot for you to be a part of that infrastructure. So the danger was present, but not overly worrisome. The Federation would keep their Klingon dogs on a leash and the Romulans would make major moves, including invading a Federation founding member world and not have to worry about actual war. Additionally, the Romulans had socially evolved with the other Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers and effectively knew what they were dealing with. When the Dominion arrived, an X factor that could not be accounted for was introduced. As far as I can tell, it would appear that the authoritarian elements of the Romulan Star Empire freaked out, with the Dominion making the Romulans look damn near democratic. The Pro-Council would directly and indirectly assist the Federation and others against the Dominion. They would provide a cloaking device to the Federation, which they never complain about during the Dominion War. More on that later as well as provide fleets to assist in the defense of the Alpha Quadrant, both with the Federation and the Cardassians. This would ultimately lead up to an attack on the homeworld of the Dominion, which would be catastrophic and severely weaken the Tal Shiar, near annihilating the organization. It's at this point that the authoritarian elements are probably very weak, with moderates and liberals being able to gain more control of the Romulan Senate. The Old Guard was either destroyed or limited from what they once were. After all of this, the Romulans ultimately back off from the anti-Dominion activities, but honestly, I don't think the Star Empire is all that stupid. They have to know that no matter what the rhetoric is, there would be some penalty for the destruction of the Dominion homeworld. Even if the founders pretended that everything was fine, they couldn't be believed. You don't do that without consequence. However, all-out assaults aren't exactly effective at this point. New tactics are required. So, I think that the Romulans decided to do what they do best. They let their enemies slug it out, with the Federation Alliance, which included the Klingons, going blow to blow with the Dominion, and the Romulans just opting to stay out of it, just watch as both sides crumble. However, there was a bias of the Romulans towards the Federation, I think this is plain to see. Consider this, the cloaking device is a devastating advantage, and allowing the Federation to keep one is very convenient. Some may try to counter that the Romulans also allowed the Dominion to enter into their space to attack the Federation as a counter, which is fair enough, but here's a few possibilities about that. Remember, when you're dealing with the Romulans, you're playing chess. I'll admit, this is a theory, but what if they were observing the Dominion and getting a sense of both tactics and ship deployment? Think about it. You let the Dominion forces cross your border. You follow them, observe their battles, observe the tactics, how they go about fighting the Federation, and you watch. And you remember. Every battle tallied, every tactic calculated, every ship deployment marked. Where do the Dominion enter? Where do they leave? How do they initiate an attack? How do they deal with defeat when the Federation wins? What are their tactics for retreat? Do they retreat? Sure, the Federation is going to lose a lot for the Romulan military to conduct these experiments, but that's no skin off the Romulans' backs. Oh no, Starfleet will be weak. Whatever is a pro-council to do. I think most Romulans in the military, intelligence, and senate knew that Sisko is right. That once the Federation Alliance is destroyed, the Romulans would be surrounded and would either have to join the Dominion or go down fighting. Everything leading up to their entering into the war was just positioning to ensure that the Romulans come out as superpower. There is also one more clue that always stuck out to me. While dialogue indicates that the Romulans were more concerned with Starfleet and the Klingons, leaving the border to the Dominion open, Romulan forces struck 15 bases on the Cardassian border almost immediately. 15 bases. That is a hell of a lot of firepower. Also, when you look at the only reasonable map of the Star Trek universe, that would mean that Romulan assets were far from where Starfleet thought they were. I also wonder if the Romulans weren't consistently ready to be big damn heroes throughout the war. There are times we see where the Dominion looks like they are going to win. What if the Romulans had always been on the back burner, waiting in the shadows, ready to strike and save the day if they needed to? That entire cloaked fleets were simply sitting there until the time was right, only for their assistance to not be necessary at the last moment. Just a thought. 
Ultimately, the death of the senator would accelerate Romulan plans. The Romulans probably angry that the Dominion were so sloppy in their attempts to kill Vrenak, and not willing to believe that the Federation would do anything like this. They couldn't continue to wait because that would be extremely suspicious. So war it was. I'm sure there are some holes here, which I know, surprising for Trek, but it does seem to fit in the Romulan modus operandi. This tactic might have worked as well. Entering so late into the war would mean that a lot of their infrastructure was intact and would stay as such. They would take less losses and would still be able to look like heroes. This had the possibility of leaving the Romulan Star Empire as the last superpower. Unfortunately, this would be stopped due to two things in my opinion. First, the Breen weapon would make a ruinous event for the Romulans, forcing them to lose far more ships than they had anticipated. Additionally, the head of the Tal Shiar was now a Federation operative. This meant that the intel would be fed through Starfleet first, which might prioritize its own vessels and crew over that of Romulan military soldiers. Ultimately, it would relegate the Star Empire to rebuilding and losing any chance of being a superpower for the near future. There is a wonderful Reddit article by Keith Kincaid that mirrored some of my thoughts, as well as had some additional theories of his own. I'll include the link in the description below for those who are still interested in the topic. What's up, Lore Masters? Today we'll be analyzing DS9's Valiant. It's an interesting look at Starfleet operations as well as how Starfleet exceptionalism negatively impacts the youth of the Federation. Let's just get into it. When the episode first begins, Nog and Jake are about to take an important message from Starbase 257 to Ferenginar. There are a few things here. First off, it's inferred that the missive is specifically a proposal for Ferenginar to join the Federation Alliance. We have very little reason not to believe this, so for now, we'll go with it. We're also given reason to believe that Nog is personally delivering it due to him being the only Ferengi in Starfleet, a symbolic measure. All right. Why are they only being sent in a runabout? We know that an entire squadron, or more, of Dominion ships will assault Starbase 257 and that they are on the edge of the Federation Dominion border. Also, this vessel that they're in is woefully ill-prepared to take on that many Dominion vessels. You could argue, based on Nog's and Jake's reaction, that they weren't prepared for an attack of this magnitude, but why not? You're on the border and you know that the Dominion can hit you where you least expect it. Just ask Beta Z if you have any questions. Sending an extremely important missive on a single runabout seems folly and, unfortunately, well within the modus operandi of Starfleet. If I'm giving as much leeway as I can, maybe you could argue that they don't send communications because it could be intercepted, and they are deploying a runabout to try to keep it low-key. However, I still think that's extremely flawed, as we find out during the attack. Irregardless, the Shenandoah is sent out with Nog and Jake and, surprise, surprise, there's an assault on Starbase 257. Of course, a Starbase with critical missives that likely does have admirals on it doesn't have any other ships to defend it. That we're aware of, at least. Again, if I'm trying to give them as much as I can, the Dominion is jamming sensors and communications, so it's possible that there is a ship there protecting it, just the Shenandoah can't get a hold of them. More on that later. But with no hope of help and not able to turn around because then they'd be going with the Jin Hadar, Nog and Jake flee into Dominion territory. Let's discuss for a minute. Honestly, I think that this entire setup is the weakest part of the episode. I understand that they are at warp, but still, there's no way the runabout got that far, relatively at least, into Dominion space. Jake says that they'll eventually hit Cardassia, but I think that's unrealistic in a civilian overreacting. The ship could not have gotten that deep, if for nothing else that the closer they got to military installations, the more forces they would encounter. Which busts a hole in the entire plot because, again, the Valiant is supposed to be deep, deep into Cardassian territory. Which just can't be true. But anyway. The runabout is, of course, caught and all seems lost until the USS Valiant arrives to save the day. The cadets of the vessel are able to get the two to safety as well as defeat the Jem'Hadar ships. From here, we find something interesting. That is to say, we find the USS Valiant, a Defiant class vessel that was out on a three month training cruise. This ship had the best of the best cadets and unfortunately they were caught behind enemy lines. First, this is a tie-in which is kind of cool to Paradise Lost. After being able to successfully shut down Earth's power grid, Red Squad is moved off planet and given a mission so that Cisco can't use them to expose Leighton's treachery. But secondly, it's an interesting look at, well, Starfleet ego and exceptionalism. As Nog tells us, these are the best of the best, I've pointed that out already. They were given special 
everything. In the land of plenty, on paradise, they were given more. These cadets were constantly told that they were the top that Starfleet had to offer, and ultimately given charge of the most advanced warship that Starfleet had at the time. This would obviously cause damage to someone from an ego and mental standpoint. The cadets would have an inflated sense of who they were and what they were actually capable of. Were they extremely gifted and skilled Starfleet officers? Probably. It's quite possible that they were the best that Starfleet had to offer. Certainly the evidence of the episode suggests that, even with the catastrophic failure they have at the end. But being told from birth that they are evolved humans, and then being told at the Academy that they were better than all the other evolved humans, probably cost them their lives. Honestly, I think that these cadets show everything that is wrong with Starfleet and the ego it instilled in its officers. Certainly, this is the worst case scenario of what Starfleet did, but it does show the overall fill, especially before the Dominion War. However, egotism alone wasn't what killed them as well. Their situation is bizarre. They were on a ship that found itself behind enemy lines and all of the commissioned officers were killed. Before he died, the captain would give the cadet a filled commission and they would be told to get themselves home. But while being behind enemy lines, they would still be given a mission. The USS Valiant was to serve two different roles for Starfleet. First, they were to disrupt the Dominion when they could, and secondly, they were to attempt to gain information on the new Dominion battleship. One thing I do question about the later mission, though, it seems to show Starfleet intelligence is either idiots or excessively inefficient. We see this battleship, the one they're talking about, in Sacrifice of Angels. They've known about that vessel for months, if not longer, and still have no information on it? Okay. Now, again, to be fair, we know that the Valiant has been running without any contact to Starfleet Command, so perhaps they were given this mission before the battle or shortly after Sacrifice of Angels, and the fact that the new captain hasn't reached back out is why they think there has been no information garnered on the battleship. Either way, Nog would assist in fixing the warp drive, completely being pulled into the cult of personality that is the captain. Of course, Jake isn't fooled. He isn't fooled because... I don't know, he's not an idiot. Well, not that type of idiot. He is one, so just stay tuned, we'll talk about that. But when it comes to this idiocy, he's not an idiot. You feel me? As I've alluded to, we see the breakdown of the crew with cadets crying when they think of home and a drugged up captain who doesn't like emotion. I guess Michael Burnham does have descendants in Starfleet after all, so that's kind of a cool tie in there. Ultimately, with the fixes Nog implements, the Valiant is able to catch up to the battleship and get all of the information they needed, so they can now go home. But, of course, the captain believes that they should be the ones to destroy it. His plan isn't thought through, for a few reasons. First, this Dominion battleship is larger than a Galaxy-class starship and three times as powerful. I mean, the thing actually has armor, it's something to be scared of. Also, there is no impending threat from it. At least not that we're told about. Sure, this thing can cause harm, but as far as we know, it doesn't have a specific mission. If it was about to destroy a colony or attack a base that couldn't defend itself, maybe. Maybe it would be worth trying to destroy it, but right now, attacking it with just one ship is pointless. Also, the captain states that if they don't do it, another ship with another crew will have to. Fucking, what are you talking about? I give Starfleet a lot of guff, but I am pretty sure they wouldn't be sending only one ship. They would probably have a task force. Even if the plan was to knock out the vessel's superstructure with a close attack, they aren't going to send one vessel after another and not coordinate. This isn't Overwatch. While I don't agree with the captain, and I think that the crew are just so tired and so egotistical that they don't realize how bad of a plan it is, Jake's counter is so, so stupid. If you know my daddy, he is like great and stuff, guys. He is so super de awesome. And as his son, I know what he would do as a military officer. So, so just shut up and listen to me, okay? Oh my God, Jake, if you could just sit down, buddy. Don't get me wrong. Jake's saying they shouldn't do it because it's a dumb idea or that he thinks his dad wouldn't do it is fine. But for the journalist to sit there and say it as fact, as if he has all the information, and just because it's his dad, he knows exactly what the man would do, is... Ugh. It's just... It's a bad character trait. But engage the battleship they will, and I won't be going into the combat all that much. I only want to point out one thing in the episode. We see something that 
we generally never do, and that's the use of systems to block targeting along with the countermeasures to stop them. Effectively, ECM versus ECCM. It's a real shame that the writers only remember that this exists when it comes to a plot. It would have been interesting to see this in wider use at the Sacrifice of Angels. Especially when we consider starfighters and how they are always getting the absolute living hell beat out of them. I don't have a ton to add here except that it's nice to see, but it's completely inconsistent with the rest of the fighting. As we can plainly observe, the plan fails. They miscalculate in some way and the Valiant is destroyed. At the end, we see two sides of what had just occurred. Nog stating that it was a good crew that had a bad captain and the other woman saying that the captain was a great man and the crew failed him. Unfortunately, I think they're both wrong. This was a mission that no one should have attempted. The crew failed the captain as much as the captain failed the crew. These weren't seasoned Starfleet officers and so they couldn't identify bad decisions when they saw them. This also wasn't something that was sent from admirals or was endorsed by Starfleet Command. This was a rogue captain. There's no reason that a mutiny shouldn't have occurred. Honestly, the entire episode is just a tale of blunders and it cost the lives of most every cadet. Starfleet had not been realistic in the way that it trained its officers, nor did humans have a spirit that would cause them to take a step back. And because of this, they lost one of the most advanced ships of the fleet and some of the brightest cadets that the Federation had to offer. But all of these are my opinions. What are yours? One of the wonderful things about Deep Space Nine is perhaps how episodes that aren't directly related to the current arc and or perhaps even filler, can add such a dynamic impact to the characters and the way they act and honestly reflect the tougher times they'll have ahead. One of the best episodes to showcase this is DS9's The Sound of Her Voice. This is basically a bottle episode, but it exposes so much about the Dominion War and how it really takes a toll on the crew. In the episode, those on the Defiant are going about their business when they receive an emergency message and have to save a Starfleet captain whose ship has crash landed. The actual plot isn't relevant to my analysis here, so I won't go into it, but I will say that you should watch the episode as I think it's a good one. What I want to really focus on here is how this episode shows the heroes and how they've changed due to the war. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this story seems to be insular. We don't have a ton of evidence before or after this one that shows the effects that are implied being a real problem. But I think it's worth giving kudos to at least try to have the discussion, to address it in a way. The three characters I want to examine for just a bit are that of Julian Bashir, Miles O'Brien, and Benjamin Sisko. The first character to look at is that of Julian. We see the Doctor in a way that we really haven't ever before. He's quiet, he's distant. While this is out of character for him, the fact that he has become so isolated makes sense throughout the story. Remember, it was Julian that had pushed for a complete surrender to save lives, and now that they hadn't given up or given in to the Dominion, he was seeing firsthand the results of that choice. He would try to mend all the officers that would come due to the result of the war. He would see friends, colleagues, and even strangers all suffering, some even dying, and slowly he would start to pull away. He buries himself in his work and stops interacting with the people that mean so much to him. The rigors of war, watching as they continually lose and people consistently die, slowly starts to degrade him, to destroy him. And then, of course, there's Miles O'Brien. He's as impacted as Julian, but deals with it very differently. In front of everyone, he stays optimistic, but he hides his real feelings from them. It's morbidly consistent for the character, as we would see in another episode where the engineer would keep everything so bottled up that ultimately he tries to commit suicide. And then Cisco. It's really intriguing to see the three characters all under the same stresses, all being impacted in a similar way, but handling it vastly differently. Cisco strangely seems to be an odd mix of both Julian and Miles. He's more introverted, not wanting Cassidy on the ship and even enjoying how some of his officers are becoming more distant. He was acting, ironically, very TNG-esque. The entire crew of Deep Space Nine and the Defiant are caught within the war, not even realizing the damage that it is doing to their psyche. It takes a third party, not connected to the Dominion, to remind them that they are an actual family, which is a topic for another time, but we'll definitely get into it at some point. 
Given how short this analysis is, because there's not a lot to the episode besides how it really affects them personally, I'm going to combine it with a partial breakdown of the DS9's episode, Tears of the Prophets. Though, I am going to be omitting information regarding the wormhole aliens and wait till the end of this entire series before I really get into that. I do think that they play a substantial piece in this entire story, but we'll discuss that at the end. With that out of the way, let's take a look. In Tears of the Prophets, Starfleet Command has finally decided to assault the Dominion, this now being possible given the second front that's been opened up by the Romulans. Ultimately, Sisko is tasked with planning the invasion of Cardassia. The Emissary decides to assault Chintaka first. This system is severely weakened with the spreading out of Dominion ships. Ironically, this is one of the few times we see dialogue that shows there is an actual consequence to the wormhole being inaccessible to the Dominion. It's possible that the enemies of the Federation Alliance were finally starting to feel the strain due to the Romulan front that we've discussed, and that they finally went from more than enough ships to fight to being about on on par with the Federation Alliance. However, even with the fight now fair, the Romulans take some convincing with both those in Starfleet and the Klingon Empire not believing their allies would commit forces. Huh, it's, it's just so strange to see Romulans not being trusted as we know that they were always loved by the Federation and Starfleet. After all, if a series were to ever say that it's reasonable that Starfleet would abandon the Romulans, given who they were, those in the audience would instantly scoff and say that there's no evidence for that. That's just not how Starfleet works. Distrustful? Going other ways? Man, I guess DS9 doesn't know how to write Romulans either. It's just not my Cisco. Not my Cisco at all. As discussed, the Romulans wish to sit back and just destroy the fleets as they come out of Dominion territory, whereas the other powers want to invade and destroy the threat overall. It's a small detail, but very telling of the two different methodologies. The Romulans are always willing to wait, even to their detriment. Thankfully though, in the end, the great Sisko does convince them, and now we're off to the races. We'll go into the minutiae of the first battle of Chintaka in the next episode, but let me know. What are your thoughts on addressing the toll of war on Starfleet officers and the final decision to go into the Chintaka system? As we discussed in the last episode, the Federation Alliance had finally decided to take the fight to the Dominion. This is telling given that the war had been raging for quite a while and only now was Starfleet Admiralty considering getting serious about striking back. The perfect moment, for Starfleet at least, would come after the Romulans had entered the war. The Dominion was finally starting to feel the strain, its forces being stretched thinner and thinner. Due to this, Chintaka had become a weak point in their defenses, one discovered by Benjamin Sisko. However, while invasion plans were being devised by the Alliance, Dominion strategists had decided to counter this weakness by installing planetary defenses. These plans were discovered by the Alliance, and now the game was afoot as it was a race against the clock. The Dominion needed to finish the emplacements before Starfleet and its allies arrived, or the system would be lost. One of the main questions that persists is that of the tactics themselves. We know that the Alliance opts to do a full frontal assault, but why? If there are turrets that can't move, just use ordnance to handle the problem. There may be a couple of reasons that this didn't happen. First, they would need to set up the ships to do the long-range attack, and there were still defense forces for Chintaka. Bombing the platforms from afar could make the ships sitting ducks. Additionally, it would take time to target the individual emplacements and destroy them. This would buy time for Dominion reinforcements, something the Alliance could ill afford. Also, it probably goes against Starfleet ethos, at this time at least. Bombing someone into submission, again at this point, would still be something that officers probably found ghastly. The most likely reason is that both sides were hoping to roll the hard six. It may have been feasible to take out the emplacements from afar, but if Starfleet and its allies could get to the system before the emplacements were even active, blowing them to hell and back at close range would be much faster and would allow for ground invasions to occur. It would also explain why the Alliance would send such a large fleet. Klingons, Romulans, and Starfleet would send a massive flotilla. It consisted of at least 20 Klingon birds of prey, eight Vorcha class attack cruisers, 11 11 Dadaradex class warbirds, 5 Acura class starships, 5 Galaxy class starships, 6 Excelsior class starships, 5 Miranda class starships, and at least one Defiant class ship. This would be against 5 Jem'Hadar attack squadrons, or roughly 16 Dominion starships. The Federation Alliance had a 3 to 1 advantage. 
However, the Dominion wasn't stupid. The Klingons would be the closest to the Jemadar once arriving in the system and would move to engage. The Dominion squadrons wouldn't fight but engage in suicide runs destroying or crippling 15 Klingon vessels. 53% of the Klingon force and nearly one-fourth of the entire fleet itself for those who are keeping count. Starfleet and the Romulans would move to engage the platform specifically, causing minimal damage. Unfortunately, once the vessels were in between all of the emplacements, the Cardassian tech would activate and begin eviscerating both Romulans and humans alike. Here's an interesting theory. What if the emplacements had been operational before the fleet moved in? What if Damar waited until they were in the crossfire and then just activated the weapons? We have no definitive answers one way or the other, but it seems like a hell of a tactic and one I could see Damar doing. The weapon platforms would devastate many of the ships, and this would include Vorchas, two Akuras, one Miranda, two Excelsior, and two Dideradex ships. Probably more. Assuming these were the only losses, that meant that it would move up to 22 ships, or 36% of the overall Federation Alliance strength. The entirety of the fleet was almost lost, if not for the crew of the Defiant, who were able to trick the emplacements into thinking their own power source was an enemy ship. You know, as you do. It's interesting that the Federation Alliance's weapons couldn't penetrate the generator's shielding, and they had to rely on the Cardassian emplacements to do that. And yet those same Cardassian emplacement platforms weren't able to breach the Defiance shielding. Huh. With the weapon platforms disabled, Alliance troops would begin landing for invasions. While the end of the episode makes it feel like a great victory, ironically, it would be a constant battle for Starfleet to hold Chintaka. The Dominion would realign and Chintaka space would never firmly be in the hold of the Federation Alliance, with ships engaging and disengaging in the system and sector the entire time. Effectively, this foothold was a powder keg just waiting to happen, but that'll be discussed later. What are your thoughts on the plans to attack Chintaka? Did the Alliance play it right? What's up, lore masters? In the last video, we had discussed the battle of the Chintaka system and even noted the relative wastefulness of that action. While it felt like a major success at the beginning, as I had discussed, it was more just a morale booster than any large gain. The Federation Alliance never truly held the sector or even the Chintaka system after this battle and before it would be retaken, oh yeah, spoilers, the fighting in the system would be excessively, almost unreasonably tough. When the Klingons led an offensive to gain more territory, the Dominion inflicted at least 30% casualties and then ultimately stopped their advance. The Dominion counterattacked, of course, and this would be devastating to the Romulan Star Empire, though the Riansu would hold the line. Kind of interesting that the Romulans and the Klingons are taking the brunt of this war now that I think about it. Huh. At the end of the day, it was costing the Federation Alliance quite a bit to simply hold that system, and they weren't making any more advances. On top of that, the dialogue that is utilized here is exceptionally confusing. At the beginning of the episode, we have Worf stating that the invasion of Cardassia was stalling. While it's possible he meant the operation overall, they are so far away from Cardassia that it doesn't make a ton of sense. Unless Klingons aren't good with maps, which may actually make more sense given the Klingon war that we see in DS9, again now that I think of it. You could also argue that he was talking about the entire area as Cardassia, so the Chintaka system was Cardassia, kind of like invading Hawaii is technically invading the United States. But the problem is, they're technically invading Dominion territory. To be fair, it is only this specific piece of dialogue, and we know that Worf is under a lot of stress so we can just write it off as him not being in the right mind. His actions more showcase that things are also very, very tense behind the lines, on all fronts. As an example, Admiral Ross approaches Colonel Cura about stationing a Romulan presence on Deep Space Nine to help with wartime operations. When Cura resists, Admiral Ross advises her that he isn't asking, he's telling her. It's always fun how people constantly tell me about Starfleet and damn near yell at how they are the good guys. And if we're talking about the DS9 series specifically, they proclaim that the Federation respects Bajoran sovereignty, and they don't impose their will on them, unlike the Dominion. It just shows me that these people don't watch the show as much as I do, and yes, dear friends, that makes me a better person. Anyway, even though Kira is initially resistant, she finds herself becoming decently friendly with the Romulan liaison. The Senator requests that a Romulan medical hospital is placed on one of Bajoran's moons, specifically Derna. The current war means that it is hard for the Romulans to get medical treatment at the front lines and somewhere closer than Romulus would assist them in saving lives. 
Bajor agrees, and the Romulans, being Romulans, begin installing defensive emplacements, including 7,000 plasma torpedoes. Their treachery is found out when they deny treatment to a Vulcan medical ship to hide what they were doing, even though they claim that they didn't think that it was a big deal to install these emplacements. Intriguing. Bajor would immediately withdraw its permission and demand the Romulans evacuate immediately, and the Federation would send a formal letter to the Senate condemning the actions of the Romulans, and then not assist the Bajorans in removing a hostile actor on their territory. Starfleet would sit back and do nothing. In fact, Admiral Ross has an aw shucks moment when Kira asks him what they are going to do, and he admits there isn't anything that can be done. People get very, very confused when I discuss Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery. There shouldn't be any bewilderment here. Starfleet Admiralty has always been filled with pragmatic hypocrites. I generally always have two opinions when it comes to Starfleet ethos, the pragmatic opinion and that of the idealist. Starfleet ethos is an ideal. Now don't get me wrong, it is extremely pragmatic for the Federation, albeit probably doing it in a begrudgingly pissed off way to allow the Romulans to bully Bajor and install weapon emplacements on Bajoran territory. After all, Bajor can't really defend the Romulans. However, it is a complete betrayal of Starfleet ethos and everything they stand for. Starfleet Admiralty was more than willing to allow Bajoran blood to be spilled for the Romulans to set up military bases. If it wasn't for Ross taking unilateral action, Starfleet would have proven right here it is no better than the Dominion when push comes to shove. They would have spit in the face of Cisco's speech at the end of Rules of Engagement. And here's the ugly truth according to the writing. My dearest lore masters, Starfleet has never been better than the Dominion, at least in spirit. Individuals like Admiral Ross, Cisco, Picard, and others are better than the Dominion, and that's what made Starfleet special. That people like Picard or Cisco or Kirk or Janeway and others made a choice. And when they stopped being a part of Starfleet, as we see they have in Star Trek Picard, we see the natural conclusion. Anyway, ranting aside, Ross would say that the emplacements couldn't be removed and Bajor prepared for war. Ironically, the senator had scoffed when Kira said Bajor would guarantee the safety of the hospitals, and this incoming battle proves why that's a lie. The senator's concerns are more than justified. When Bajor has to stand by itself, it could only field impulse vessels that would have minimal armaments, while the Romulan Star Empire was sending Dideradex warbirds. Romulan leadership would believe that the colonel was bluffing, but they would quickly find out that Bajorans generally don't do that, that they are willing to die to stop something they believe to be oppressive. And, of course, during the blockade, the wormhole would suddenly open again. This would inspire Kira to get a lot of people killed, as most religious people do when they think their god is giving them commands, and yet it's unclear what is happening. And, in what will be used to prove that there was some divine providence, they got lucky as the Warbirds would ultimately pull off due to Admiral Ross threatening to remove the Romulan weapons himself. In the end, the standoff is honestly a small note. Some might even consider this a filler episode, but one who looks really sees the truth of the Romulans, the Bajorans, and even the Federation. However, the Alliance would still stand strong and persevere. They would continue to fight. What's up, Lore Masters? As I analyze the various episodes in Trek, parsing them out for every little interesting factoid, I've discovered that some episodes mention the war, but are ultimately filler. They add very little, if any, mythos. I'll generally ignore these if there isn't any substance and continue about my day. This, I find, is very true of the DS9 episode, Once More Into the Breach. The only two pieces worthy of note, and the only reason I'm talking about it here, is the fact that, well, we're late into the war, and still Starfleet seems to be holding back, while the Romulans and Klingons throw ships at the problem. Starfleet vessels stay in the background while the others do the dirty work. This is noteworthy because even at this point, the Federation Alliance is still losing. 
Which leads us into the siege of AR-558. A fan favorite now, but an episode that was seen as disrespectful when it first aired. In a rare sight, the USS Defiant is dispatched to give supplies to a little-known rock. Bet you can't guess the name. A place so important that it's given two letters and a couple of numbers to identify it. As we discussed, the victory of Chintaka was short-lived and basically just a morale boost more than anything else. The Federation Alliance never solidly controlled the area and it was never safe. The Klingons, Romulans, and Starfleet were still holding on to the area, true, but it was only for a short time as the territory is gained and lost in an instant. In fact, to highlight this, the Defiant is attacked on its way to AR-558, scaring the hell out of Quark, by the by, who was there on a fact-finding mission for the Nagus. More on that later. After fighting their way to the asteroid without a real name, Sisko beams down with the others and they are instantly fired upon. This after being granted authorization to arrive with the needed supplies. Ultimately, it's a miscommunication and shell-shocked Starfleet personnel react poorly when they see something moving. Once the defenders realize they are firing on their own, the attack of course stops. However, Sisko does realize that all isn't well in paradise. Starfleet regulation requires that personnel be rotated out every 90 days. These people had been there for roughly over 150 days or five months since they arrived. Speaking of 150, that's an unlucky number as well. The original defenders of AR-558 were 150 strong when they first got there. They had been whittled down to 43, losing roughly 71% of their fighting force. I'm going to pause here to address a common criticism that occurs for the episode. Firstly, many people get upset that Starfleet doesn't have Marines or Makos. I don't disagree honestly, however, in TNG there is dialogue that shows us that Starfleet security is supposed to be the best of the best. In theory, what may have occurred is that Makos became Starfleet security and that it's effectively the Marines. Not the best explanation, but there you have it. I bring this up because many wonder where security was for those working on AR-558. Where are their defenders? I've given this argument in the past, but I believe that they're all dead. It would make sense that a large contingent of security personnel were deployed here and that they would have given their lives for those under their care. It's not exactly unbelievable. The conditions on AR-558 are unimaginable. Constant attacks from the Jem'Hadar, every day losing people due to combat or sickness, low on supplies, no backup, and the Dominion constantly using every weapon they could to win. This is no more exemplified than with the introduction of the Houdinis, subspace mines that appear at random to kill unsuspecting victims. You could walk by a place a hundred times and nothing happens, and then on the 101st, bang. So with all of this going on, it would make sense that security put themselves in front and then they simply weren't replaced. And it's telling that Starfleet doesn't send anyone else, again to this rock with no name. A rock that has a Dominion communication beacon that could tap into all Dominion communique if they get it working. It could change the war. Yet, Starfleet, the Klingons, and Romulans are all so stretched thin that they can't afford to send anyone. Or, they have such little faith in these people that they just aren't important enough to warrant the resources. That what's happening is a shot in the dark and they hope it works out, but they don't think it will. As stated, the Defiant resupplies the base and Bashir begins assisting with the medical needs of the outpost. The people there are so critically undersupplied they wouldn't even have basic medicines that could heal them instantly. Additionally, these soldiers are shell-shocked, easily irritable. Things would be so bad, so dire, and the people so beaten down that even when Bashir is trying to treat someone, that person pulls a weapon and aims it at his head. And though there are others there watching, no one responds or tries to stop him. Insert COVID-19 joke in the state of hospitals here. However, it's understandable that this happens. As I stated, the unit had lost almost all cohesion. The crew of the Defiant were dealing with Starfleet personnel that had forgotten how to be people. The space around AR-558, like all of Chintaka, is never safe, and ships aren't able to stay for long. That's assuming that they even show up. Sisko would find this out when the Defiant is attacked and the captain opts to stay he would now have a front row seat to the devastation that was to occur. Stay tuned as we discuss what it takes to simply hold that one location and look at what they're actually fighting for. What's up, Lore Masters? In the last episode, I discussed the situation of the siege of AR-558, the perils of being in the Chintaka system, and those officers that I truly think Starfleet had left behind. 
Today we're going to finish most of this out by discussing Cisco's decision to stay and how Starfleet became the Dominion. It's really interesting in retrospect. As I go through this breakdown, I talk about the fall of Starfleet morality and their very pragmatic decisions. People get extremely upset about this, and even some call me a liberal progressive pansy because I criticize how quote-unquote Starfleet is doing what needs to be done, and this is similar to X situation today. The irony is, these people obviously don't watch Star Trek as much as they think they do. I emphasize the details I do, not because I'm upset or think that the conflict shouldn't happen the way it is, or because it's something we would do now means it's bad, but because it's something Starfleet would not do. And that's according to them, not me. The show, for years and years, has promoted how the Federation and humans were much better than we are in this day and age. They've done this from the original series on, and now, when the rubber hits the road, they are just as bloodthirsty as we ever could be, and willing to do what needs to be done regardless of what they've said in the past. Just because you didn't like the way they used to be or didn't realize how pacifistic they were, don't blame me. Anyway, focusing back on the episode, Cisco and the landing party entrench themselves and follow the one order given to them by Starfleet. Hold the line. We see that one of the largest stressors and indeed enemies of the Starfleet personnel here is simply the unknown. The Jim'Hadar know where they are, but the reverse isn't true. To be fair, neither side knows how many troops they have and both are jamming each other's sensors, but that doesn't make anyone feel better. This does present an interesting perspective about the Jim'Hadar that we don't generally see though. The drug-riddled super soldiers have historically always been shown as a blunt instrument, a hammer to a nail that won't go in. However, straightforward attacks aren't working, so we see that they begin using tactics. We observe them doing so with holograms to pinpoint the number of soldiers Starfleet has and what spots they are defending from. They also use sensor jamming equipment. And all of this ties into a type of psychological warfare as the officers now know that the Dominion have more information on them. Information that they don't have on the Jim'Hadar. It's going to make it that much easier for the Dominion to kill every last one of them. And then, immediately after realizing this, a mine goes off, killing or harming one of their very few personnel left. The Dominion was taking them apart, piece by piece, an officer at a time. It was worse than simply losing to the Dominion. It was a Dominion loss while the Dominion was taking them apart, body part by body part. And to be honest, that was it. Something had to change or they were done. In the past, a famous Andorian would say, don't push the pink skins to the thin ice. It wasn't very eloquent, but the Jim Hadar would find it to be quite prophetic. Cisco focused on two different issues, finding and identifying the base of the Jim Hadar, as well as identifying and nullifying the Houdinis, those mines that were going off randomly in the Starfleet base that was killing everyone one person at a time. To find the base, Cisco tasks two veterans and Nog. Unlike the sensors, Nog's ears worked and he would be able to find them. Then Cisco would task Esri and a soft-spoken, rugged engineer that has been given a fair amount of screen time as well as a personality and some quirks. So I'm sure he's going to be just fine and not dead by the end of the episode. The scouting mission is successful, but it comes at the expense of Nog's leg and the life of the lieutenant that had been in charge before Cisco arrived. They do identify where the Jim'Hadar are and how many soldiers were there, but while trying to get back to base, they're ambushed. They fight their way through, and upon arriving back, Nog is rushed into surgery. The results of what happens to him only showing how devastating the Dominion technology is. The weapons are designed to kill, but if they can't kill them, they'll disable the person with an anticoagulant. The poor sod either bleeds to death or loses a limb. It was devastatingly effective. And all of this for territory, an item they'll never be able to hold on to. The attempts to identify the mines do yield spectacular results. Esri and Definitely Not Gonna Die Boy are able to break through the jamming and find where the mines are. Before I get into that, can I just point out that they have been able to get a massive advantage that is never utilized beyond finding and moving the mines. I mean, are you kidding me? You now have the ability to use tricorders and the Jim'Hadar still can't use any of their equipment. It is only 100 meters that you can scan for, sure, but that is more than enough. You can get complete compositions of troop strength, what they have, and counter any attacks from 100 meters out. There will never be a surprise attack by the Jim'Hadar again, but nah, screw that. We'll find these mines and then be done with this massive advantage. 
On that score, as stated, they find the mines and decide to place them in front of the Jim'Hadar that will be coming after them and set them to be activated based on movement. Ezri has some issues with this, giving the tried and true argument, well, only the Dominion would use this weapon, and now we are. This is what I was talking about at the beginning. If you were to ask me, based on Starfleet ethos, what Starfleet claims to be, would they use personal mines like these or in this manner? Answer is absolutely not. But if Starfleet officers' backs are against the wall and they are about to lose everything and have to make some hard choices, then absolutely they'll do it. Don't misunderstand me here. Cisco makes the right call. However, this is definitively not a TNG decision, though I would argue it's possibly a toss one. Maybe we'll discuss that another time. Now, with everything in place and the decision not to use the tricorders because let's get more people killed, the defenders of Starfleet sit and wait. And while everyone is so tense, thinking every little sound is a Jim Hadar and just watching, waiting to die, the doctor starts playing music without telling anyone. Him doing this could of course have gotten people killed, but luckily it didn't and stupidity is rarely punished if it's a main cast actor doing it. I do want to point out that it was stupid because it gives away information about the base, but I really can't tell you what advantage the music blaring does except to relax the soldiers a bit when they don't need to be, as well as make it hard to hear if anything's incoming. To be honest, it wouldn't matter though. The hammer that was the Dominion rushes forward into the ravine where the mines are and they all explode. Roughly a third of the troops would be killed and then Starfleet officers would note that there's just silence. Of course, this glimmer of hope is dashed as the rest of the Jim'Hadar rush the lines of Starfleet. Dozens to hundreds of Jim'Hadar move forward on the Starfleet position. Sisko orders everyone to fire, but in less than 45 seconds, the line is overrun and broken. Crossfire begins to occur both behind Starfleet lines and in front of it. The Jim'Hadar engage many Starfleet officers in hand-to-hand -hand combat, completely infesting the Starfleet encampment, to the point that Jim'Hadar even make it to the medical area where the hurt soldiers are resting. The situation was so dire that there are no security forces protecting those who are hurt or dying in back. In fact, Quark would have to draw his own phaser and kill a Jim'Hadar himself just to stay safe. We don't know how the entire battle plays out, but we do know that it was a Starfleet victory, with most everyone, on both sides, dead or dying. The entire Starfleet entrenchment is in tatters. Of course, after the battle, the use of tricorders is authorized because they no longer posed a tactical advantage for Starfleet. From what I can see, the overall tactical plan was to hold the position and fire weapons on heavy stun or set to kill. Likely kill given how many of the Jim'Hadar were there and you can't have them waking up after a battle. There are a lot of questions about how this battle went out. For instance, why didn't they set their phasers to wide range? In the last video I did on this episode, I said it made sense because maybe you were worried about cave-ins or how effective it would be. Now I'm not so sure. It seems like the best option would have been to use it and I'm not sure why they didn't. It's beyond me. After the battle, it does seem the Jim'Hadar had expended most all of their troops and Sisko and company could hold the line. Though Kellen, the golden boy everyone loved, is dead. Surprise, surprise. The Alpha Quadrant will little note nor long remember what was done on AR-558 this day. It would be for the living to be dedicated to the unfinished work of those who were left there that could no longer do it. They had given their last full measure of devotion to the cause. But as I said, it was all useless. A waste. We'll discuss and break that down at a later point, along with Quark's wise words. On the next, Lore Reloaded. What's up, Lore Masters? This video is going to be an analysis of the DS9 episode, Inter Arma Inum Silent Legus. Unlike other episodes, I'm going to give a brief synopsis of the episode itself and then discuss the more overall arcing points. This is because the DS9 story we see here isn't necessarily a war story, but really relates to the impacts of the war on the Alpha Quadrant. Insert joke about Discovery doing the Klingon war arc wrong here. The Reader's Digest version is pretty easy. Bashir is ordered to Romulus with top dignitaries, Starfleet security, and Admiralty to be a part of a convention of sorts. This convention will break down the war from all aspects. This includes, but isn't limited to, morale, medical impact, security, and intelligence. Section 31, not wanting to be left out, tasks Bashir with gaining information on specific individuals to assess future conflicts. Bashir is resistant at first, but ultimately, after talking with Sisko, agrees to attend and work for Section 31. Let me pause a moment. A commenter posed an interesting conspiracy theory that I actually liked. 
Every time we observe Cisco when he is confronted with Section 31, he is either just throwing his hands up saying, "Oh shucks, Starfleet Command just won't get them, or ordering Bashir to just go along with it. Is it possible that Cisco was working with or was a Section 31 agent? I mean, he either seemed powerless in most instances to stop them or wanted to help. This is also a man that used biogenic weapons against defenseless people to get one person. Seems very ends justify the means to me. Regardless, Bashir goes to Romulus and teams up with Admiral Ross to capture Sloane. While this is in the works, Sloane would order Bashir to gain information on a Tal Shiar agent. Ultimately, Ross is incapacitated and Bashir left alone with no help. He reaches out to a Romulan friend who tried to help him prevent the fracture of the Romulan Federation Alliance. Everything would not be as it seems though, as Sloane is caught and identified as a spy for the Federation that had gone rogue. Sloane would try to resist and would ultimately be killed. This revelation would result in Bashir returning to DS9 and the Romulan that he had reached out to, his newfound Romulan ally, imprisoned, possibly killed. Bashir is able to put everything together and confronts Ross, discovering that the Admiralty had been in league with Section 31, and were left with one conclusion. In times of war, the law falls silent. Let's rewind and take a look at this. What I want to discuss here is the mentality of what occurred, the changing of Starfleet, and the giving up of its principles. Many focus on the Latin phrase used with Admiral Ross to highlight the episode. Probably part of that is it's the title. But I think that the discussion between Sloane and Bashir for the first time in his chambers is more succinct. Put simply, Bashir responds to Sloan with a simple sentence. This war isn't over, and you're already planning for the next. It never fails. Anytime I talk about the latter part of the Dominion War, people always say that I'm becoming too much of a Dominion apologist, that I simply hate the Federation or Starfleet. But put quite simply, to try and justify what Starfleet becomes at this point is, at best, looking at it through TNG rose-colored glasses, and at worst, simply Federation propaganda. I don't even think that Ira Bear would say that Starfleet were the good guys by the end of all this. He'd probably say they were just a much lesser evil. At this point, the Federation had seen significant loss and hadn't felt defeat this likely since the first Borg attack, or Discovery's Klingon War before that. It seems like a never-ending cycle for Starfleet, at least until the Picard series. Starfleet begins with a more hopeful outlook and an eye to the stars, scientific in nature becoming the best that they can be. They come up against enemies that they can defeat, which only makes them more egotistical. Finally, Starfleet arrives upon a bully they cannot easily fight and become more militaristic and win once they do, only to become pacifistic again. I'd be thankful that Picard broke that chain, if only it had done it well missed opportunities and all that. Anyway, Admiral Ross would ally with Section 31 to ensure an innocent Romulan patriot would go to jail or be killed so that the Federation would have a mole and ally within the Tal Shiar and on the ruling council. The Starfleet Admiralty had decided it was more important that the Federation survive than they keep their morals or even listen to the Prime Directive. After this episode, we begin the ending run of the series and the war. So buckle up, buckaroos. We got a galaxy to save. One that will never be the same. What's up, Lore Masters? At this point, we are nearing the ending of the Dominion War, though neither side know it. And additionally, as it approaches, neither side would realize how things are dramatically shifting under their feet. It's ironic because major events will occur very soon that blindsides both the Federation Alliance and the Dominion. For this analysis, I'll be focusing on the Dominion and specifically the Cardassians. This will lead up to the retaking of the Chintaka system, and in other videos, I'll discuss that as well as the responses. For all intents and purposes, the Dominion War had stalemated, though the Federation Alliance was slowly chipping away at Dominion installations and forces, and slowly encroaching further towards Cardassia. This, of course, would be unacceptable, and thusly the Vorta and Founders would go back to their usual tricks playing at diplomacy in the background. Things would need to change for the Dominion, and right quick. This transformation would come by way of an alliance with the Breen. Fresh troops would begin to reinforce the Dominion lines and stop the Federation advantage. The Breen would also bring a new weapon, the Energy Dissipators, a devastating device that could disable most any ship. Though, here is a question. 
How do none of the other powers know about the Breen weapon? Arguably, the Breen would have utilized it to protect their own borders, and we know that there have been conflicts with the nation. If it's a new weapon, why didn't the Breen use it when they attacked Earth? They are assaulting the headquarters of Starfleet and the capital of the Federation with the ability to disable every ship they come upon, and they opt not to use this vast advantage. Really? And if they did use this weapon with the attack on Earth, why weren't the Federation, Klingon, and Romulan forces at Shintaka prepared for it? Starfleet wouldn't have had a counter to it yet, sure, but they at least would have been aware of this and tried to build tactics around avoiding getting hit. The only way this really makes sense is if the Breen were in development and the weapon wasn't ready till Chintaka, which is fine, just really lucky for the Federation, I suppose. Speaking of the Breen, seeing the opportunity to seize control of Cardassian territory along with Federation Klingon and Romulan space, they ally themselves with the Dominion, becoming loyal subjects to the Founders. As stated, this would give an advantage with reinforcements even without the weapon that they brought to the table. The Alliance was probably one of the best moves by the Dominion in the late war game. However, it would precede one of the worst decisions as well, one that is confusing. The treatment of the Cardassians after the alliance with the Breen is a blunder so obvious that it defies logic. If you're an avid watcher of Lore Runner, you'll know that it makes perfect sense for the Founders to treat the Cardassians as a resource, with no care for their fillings nor their lives. Founders lacking the understanding of how solids would react to what is going on is well within reason. However, the Vorta, and especially Weyoun, aren't as naive. Weyoun has historically not been this oblivious to the impacts of the Dominion policies on the various peoples. While he isn't perfect and made mistakes, throughout the series he generally is an able diplomat and one that can identify issues when they arrive. His largest weakness is his undying devotion to what he believes to be gods, but that's a conversation for another time. How he didn't understand Cardassian's reactions to being relegated to second-class citizens is baffling. However, if I'm being kind, I guess you could argue that perhaps Weyoun lost so much respect for Damar, and after watching the unrealistic breakdown of Dakot, simply found the Cardassians to be lesser beings that he never would have imagined could be able to accomplish a successful betrayal. On that score, Damar would more and more see the diminishing of Cardassian influence. While the Cardassians weren't the Federation Alliance, they were only one step above them this late in the game. Cardassian leadership was frozen out of high military discussions, and entire Cardassian orders, at least 500,000 soldiers, would be left to die on a planet deemed not worthy of defending. This caused Damar to begin working in the background, identifying loyal Cardassian troops and preparing terrorist attacks against the Dominion. These attacks would be sprung when the Dominion was retaking Chintaka, Damar's force is striking and destroying a Dominion cloning facility in the end. This, luckily, would buy time for the Federation, as effectively only the Klingons could defend against incoming Dominion forces. I'll be going more into the new victories of the Dominion and the dire consequences the Federation Alliance found itself in later, but let me end this video reflecting on Damar's message to the Cardassians as well as the Alpha and Beta Quadrant. In his message, he said that the Cardassians had welcomed the Dominion into their space and had become occupied without firing a shot. I wonder if Damar realized how ironic that statement was. Because it was that day that Damar admitted that the Cardassian people had done the exact same thing that the Bajoran people did when the Cardassian occupation started. What's up, lore masters? As I've discussed, and alluded to in the last video. Before the Second Battle of Chintaka, things had been at basically a stalemate with the Federation Alliance ever so slowly encroaching on Dominion territory. Even with the Federation winning, marginally, it was turning out to be a very slow, very bloody affair. The Alliance was losing men and women at a startling rate and ships were often not returning after being dispatched. Remember, Chintaka was never firmly in the hands of the Federation Alliance. Attack, retreat, to attack again, an area of space would seemingly go back and forth several times before finally not being challenged again. And at the end of the day, this bloodshed was for nothing. The siege of AR-558, where we watched security officers, command officers, and engineers die for a piece of technology on a rock somewhere in space, somewhere so remote that it didn't even have a name, would ultimately be reclaimed by the Dominion. And all we watched in that episode, all of that breakdown, was for nothing. Bashir was proving to be right. 
The clues that the tide was changing were there. The first hint was the Breen assault on Starfleet Command. This attack was really interesting. In the past, I wondered why the Breen didn't just use their energy dissipators during the assault. However, a lot of people countered that these weapons were a great ace in the hole and something that one would want to keep hidden for as long as possible. So not using the device here makes sense at this point. Though I still counter that it's confusing and makes no sense that these weapons weren't known until the war. But that's neither here nor there. What is interesting to consider is the way the Breen attacked, and really it fits the modus operandi of the Dominion. I'm aware that there is dialogue that appears nefarious, but looking at the works of the Dominion as a whole, generally the way the dictators handle the various species is to gain control of the governments and militaries, pacify them, and ensure loyalty, and then ultimately give the people what they want and let them live in general peace as long as they play by the rules of the founders. People of the Dominion can enjoy whatever freedoms they wanted as long as those freedoms included bending the knee. The Dominion wasn't above punishing entire civilizations, don't get me wrong, and indeed they weren't above attacking civilian targets, we've seen that. But if they could do it without that necessity and gain popular support among the citizenry, that's the way they generally go. This is reflected in the Earth attack. As we see, and as dialogue indicates, only Starfleet Command and military installations were hit. This could serve multiple purposes, it striked fear in the populace while also appearing to be somewhat moral. After all, if they bypassed the security and were able to get so close, they could just hit softer targets than the headquarters of Starfleet, and use much more effective weapons. Remember, phasers and photon torpedoes can take out entire planets. It's just a thought. As stated, the attack on Starfleet Command was just the beginning. The combined fleets of the Dominion, Cardassians, and Breen conducted a massive counterattack, breaking through on two different fronts at Chintaka. All Allied ships were forced to retreat and meet up with reinforcements. The three powers brought as many vessels as they could muster, at least 312 Allied vessels. The Federation Alliance re-entered into the Chintaka system and did draw first blood against the Dominion fleet, firing on all fronts. However, the Breen would utilize their new weapons, disabling the fleet within minutes. 311 ships disabled or destroyed. The Founders ultimately opted not to kill the survivors as they tried to escape so that they could spread fear among the Federation, Romulan, and Klingon Empire. In the aftermath, it would be determined that there was no defense against this new weapon yet. Well, save for a Klingon design flaw that could be replicated in other Klingon ships. That would mean that only the Klingons could effectively defend against the Dominion, roughly 1,500 ships, against 30,000. Basically 20 to 1. The plan for the Klingons would be simple, but hopefully effective. Small battle groups of Klingon ships engage in hit-and-run operations, trying to keep the Dominion off balance, and to prevent an all-out attack. It was hoped that this combined with the internal struggles of the Rebellion would keep them off their feet. It might actually stop them for a while. We'll break down the Rebellion more in a later episode. Personally, this plan still seems confusing. Even if we assume that they would take significant damage, why would the Dominion care? The fleets are just assets to them, the solids are just things to be used. Attack with everything you got, even if it costs you a third of your fleet, you'd still win. The only thing that can stop you is the amount of space you have to cover and time. Remember, the Federation is a large area, but it's now uncontested for all intents and purposes. Even send olive branches to the Ferengi, the Romulans, the Klingons, and the Federation individually and see if one will turn on the other. Why the Dominion never took advantage of this seems like a massive blunder. Honestly, I see no reason for them not to push forward even with the plan to stall them. However, I guess I'll leave that to the annals of time or a YouTube comment section. Either way, stay tuned as we take an in-depth look at the Cardassian Rebellion on the next Lore Reloaded. What's up, Lore Masters? In the last two videos, I discussed the genesis of the Cardassian Rebellion and analyzed how the Dominion had turned the tide. Because things begin to intertwine heavily at this point, my videos will break down individual aspects of the overall piece when you put all of the episodes together. Case in point, this video will be discussing the life and death of the Cardassian Rebellion. Getting right into it, the first assaults of the Rebellion were successful, though only because they had the element of surprise. Damar, leader and representative of the Cardassian 
Cardassian people at the time had rallied troops from the 1st, 3rd, and 9th Orders to attack a cloning facility on Erundak 3. The former alcoholic immediately sent out a public message after Erundak had been destroyed, stating that over 7 million soldiers had died for the Dominion cause, only for the Cardassian people to be conquered by the same allies who hadn't fired a shot. However, even though this was good news for the Federation, there was a fatal flaw with Damar. The military men of Cardassia were generally by the book soldiers, used to waging open conflicts with boundaries and whatever form of rules Cardassians considered to be fair. However, this was terrorism. Damar had no idea how to wage such a conflict. He needed help. To that end, Starfleet would dispatch operatives to assist Damar in organizing the dastardly network for maximum efficiency. And so, with dozens to hundreds of planets and hundreds to thousands of species within the Federation and an alliance with the Romulans, Starfleet opts to send a Bajoran that killed Cardassians for fun, a traitor that used his abilities to get tens of thousands of Cardassians killed in the current war, and Odo. Charming. While I imagine you can make an argument that both Garrick and Kura have advantages given their extensive history with the Cardassians and their understanding of Cardassian operations, you can't tell me there aren't less antagonistic operatives that could have been tapped that were just as experienced. And if we're worried about the amount of time for them to arrive, just take comfort that warp drives had been enhanced to the speed of plot at this point. So I don't see the problem personally. But in the end, we don't have to worry about anything. They're going to put Kura in a Starfleet uniform, so I guess all's forgiven. Yep, no problems going forward. While I'm giving Starfleet a hard time, and indeed believe that other operatives would have been preferable, Kira and Garrick do provide invaluable advice. Both the Bajoran Resistance and Obsidian Order worked in cells, ironically using a lot of the same methods. They would have groups of 10 to 20 operatives so that if one is caught, it only compromises that small group. This suggestion, of course, would meet resistance from veteran officers, but Damar would be more open-minded and started instituting the changes. A far harder sell was the suggestion to attack installations that had Cardassians stationed there. Ultimately, Damar would be convinced that the Dominion would begin stationing Cardassians at outposts to prevent attacks if they knew that the Rebellion wouldn't attack Cardassians. Unfortunately, there would be many that resists the idea of attacking other Cardassians, creating a schism within the Cardassian ranks. While this type of animosity and infighting continued to occur, operations to slow down the Dominion was successful. However, during the entire time, mistakes continued to be made. The rebel leaders failed to understand the problems since the attacks were ultimately successful, but both Kira and Garrick warned that this was due to luck and that orders needed to be followed exactly as given. This would ensure that these successes continued forward. The real strife to occur would be between Damar and his second in command. Analyzing these two is quite interesting, especially when you contrast it against how a lot of people look at the Cardassians. Many fans will say that the Cardassians are underhanded and not trustworthy. Obsidian Order is often used as an example. Ultimately, races like the Cardassians are the reason that Section 31 exists. This isn't wholly undeserved, don't get me wrong, but there are many facets to the Cardassian society when you break it down. One of them being the strong militaristic leader that is proud of his people and doesn't enjoy fighting in the shadows. There's also the man who's willing to change to save his people, though I'll admit it's rare. This is the difference we see between the second in command, the officer seeing the Cardassians as a proud people who won't listen to those who would save them, and the leader, Damar, the pragmatic man who's not going to get everyone killed. Well, in theory. I can't think of a better example of who Damar is than when he finds out his family has been killed. His family, his wife and children, were innocent people. They had nothing to do with this rebellion. And while Damar is grieving and wondering how the Dominion could have done this to him, Kira points out that Cardassians had done the same thing during the occupation. She mainly did this because she's a bit. The schism between Damar's methodology and his second-in-command comes to a head when he agrees to help the Federation by stealing a brain energy dissipator. Damar realizing that if the Federation succeeds, so does the Rebellion. Something Damar's second wholly disagrees with. However, the operation to steal the weapon by hijacking one of the Jem'Hadar's ships is... confusing. Okay, so they have a team of five that's going to infiltrate, and this group includes... Damar the former leader of all Cardassia and most wanted man by the Dominion. This seems outrageously stupid on several different levels. 
In fact, they are lucky that the Cardassian that confiscates their weapons is a sympathizer, as he instantly recognizes the former leader. And I'm also surprised that every Jim Hadar isn't required to recognize Damar's face when they see him. Again, just incredibly lucky, and the Dominion is incredibly stupid. The operation to take the Jemadar warship is successful, though there are a few hiccups. The main one being Damar's second in command pulling a weapon on Kira, wanting to kill her so that the rebellion can keep the Breen weapon for themselves. Damar would choose to kill his second in command, claiming that the man's Cardassia had died and that a new one would need to rise. The rebels would return to Deep Space Nine and allow plot magic engineers from Plottington Lane that lived in the land of Plot Convenienceville to do what they do best and near instantly find a way to counter the weapon. Though this does bring up an interesting question. We know the Klingons were outmatched 20 to 1, making the Dominion forces at around 30,000 ships. Does that mean that the rest of the Federation Alliance that was waiting behind these Klingon ships was near 28,000 vessels? Or does the Dominion make such haphazard ships that it's not an issue? To be fair, numbers is not generally the forte of DS9 writers. Starfleet would let the Rebellion keep the ship, and the Rebellion would continue to move forward and grow. Damar would put the Dominion vessel to great use. Unfortunately, he wouldn't completely heed the advice of Cura on isolating the different cells. The entire leadership of the Rebellion made their way to Cardassia to meet up with Gal Revik and Legate Goris in order to gain over half a million soldiers, and perhaps a hundred thousand more if the Sultan decides to join. Unfortunately, this was a trap, Revik killing Goris and the other sympathizers. The entire organization would be co-opted and destroyed and thus would mark the end of the formalized rebellion, but not the rebellion within the citizenry. Stay tuned as we look at the Section 31 plague that basically changed everything Starfleet was. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded. Hey guys, I want to thank you so much for staying until the end. As you know, the apocalypse that's happening outside is hitting advertisers pretty hard, which means YouTubers are getting hit too. A lot of you guys have really stepped up and I am so thankful. If less than 1% of all the views I get in a month were to give just $1, I'd never have to worry about YouTube advertising again. Again, I thank everyone who's already joined and please consider it by going to patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or becoming a member by just hitting the member button below. It should be join or something of that nature. Every little bit helps and I just want to say thank you for the last time. I'll catch you guys later. What's up, lore masters? This analysis may be a little odd, as I'm going to combine the play-by-play -play of a few episodes and also discuss the pragmatic realities of the situation. I know it's always curious when you click on my videos, as you never know if you're just going to get a by-the-book explanation of what happens or a moral debate, but hey, that's probably why you subscribe. That and it's always fun to laugh at the kid who never made anything of himself and is trying to be popular, so we got that. Looking at the genesis of the morphogenic virus, we first get a hint of its existence in DS9's When It Rains, Part 5. Bashir has reached out to Odo so he can do a morphogenic enzyme analysis on the changeling. The hope is to find some way to mimic changeling physiology to create replacement organs either during combat or in surgery. Having tissue that could simply become what you need it to would be critical in saving lives. Though if you're like Picard, you'll just take the mechanical counterpart, thank you very much. While doing his experiments, Ezri and Bashir are experiencing bad romantic writing that won't go anywhere for quite a while. This is thankfully interrupted when the doctor discovers that Odo has been infected with the same virus that the changelings are suffering from. Bashir requests that Odo's medical files be sent to him from Starfleet Medical, only to get a pushback that the files are classified and require Sigma-9 clearance to get them. It's really interesting to see how Starfleet Medical responds to the doctor, stating that they won't be sending the files over nor helping him because he was trying to cure someone who was quote-unquote known to consort with the enemy. They also feared that the cure may fall into the hands of the enemy. Now I'm sure that at this point, many would think I'm going to discuss and condemn the creation of the virus, and how specifically this is the undoing of Starfleet and Starfleet's ethos. For me, I think it's a little bit deeper than that. I don't know if the creation of the virus really destroyed what Starfleet stood for. Because even if the virus had been created, the infrastructure to allow it to be introduced into Odo, and ultimately the changelings, had been there for quite a while. Starfleet Medical not wanting to assist with finding a cure is extremely pragmatic and possibly even the right move if they want to win the war. 
But even by our own standards, this is extremely morally questionable, and it is definitively not the Starfleet that entered the war or that of the next generation. As far as we know, this mentality, not wanting to help the Dominion, isn't caused by Section 31 agents, but may be caused by Section 31's culture. Bashir is talking to people that don't want to help the enemy because Starfleet officers and Federation citizens are out there dying every day. And to do this might betray those who had lost their lives and possibly result in a Dominion victory. Quite simply, Starfleet Medical at this point, and for a while, is looking at the ends and seeing if they're justified by the means. Assisting the Dominion could result in the changelings getting better, and that is something that Starfleet Medical won't do, even if it's the right thing by Starfleet standards. Now let me be clear, the Dominion would have no qualms about any of this either. I'm not saying that they are great or the good guys. In fact, they are quite evil. If they could get the cure, they would use it and then continue to try to take over the Alpha and Beta Quadrants, and they'd be doing so even stronger than they were. It would be unlikely that the Dominion would ever consider that the cure came from their enemies. They'd just see it as weakness. It is possible that they might have some sympathy if the Solids assisted Odo, but then again they could just see it as the Solids' requirement to do so. And honestly, the Federation just isn't smart enough to know how to leverage this to show that they aren't the bad guys the Changelings think they are. But then again, even though we know how the Dominion would respond, that it is to the detriment of Starfleet, that's irrelevant. This isn't current day governments, this is Starfleet. And time and again, we are told Starfleet is above the fold. We see it in DS9's rules of engagement and most all of the next generation. We have been told since the beginning of the next generation that humans are better than the sums of their parts. We see a lot of that in the original series as well, though not to the extent TNG takes it. Again, we're told that Earth and a lot of the planets are paradise and that everyone strives to be better than who they are and that they're willing to help the enemy even if that gets them killed. I am not a huge fan of Star Trek Picard, and I would have written that show, and Starfleet specifically, a lot different. But the decay of paradise isn't something that is unreasonable in future Star Trek series. In fact, I'm not sure that paradise is sustainable in this universe the way it's written, in both TNG and DS9. Even if we remove DS9 and we look at TNG only, we start to see the cracks. I know that people prefer Star Trek to be upbeat and show humanity at its best light and always be a fun romp, and that's fine. It's simply not what the writing is at this point. We've seen the decline of that type of mentality, again, probably since the Borg. And this is assuming that you ignore all of the original series that had a much more nuanced view on humanity and how things worked, but that's a conversation for another time. Either way, Bashir would receive pushback, as we've discussed, and be denied saying that he needs the Sigma-9 clearance. We see a scene where Bashir talks about how Sisko had Sigma-9 clearance and that he wished he could see the surprise look on the officer's face. However, this was actually a scene that had been added in post. There was other footage that showed the captain discussing the issue with Starfleet Command. Sisko had, according to this deleted footage, been on Earth at the time and was with an admiral going over security concerns. I do have the footage, unfortunately the video is a bit grainy, but you can still have the audio. I'm going to take the hit to content ID so you guys can listen to what they really had planned. Let's take a look at it. Oh, well, give me a moment to go and do a little negotiating with the Ambassador. Hey, After receiving the documents, Julian realizes Starfleet Medical sent fake files to try and stunt his progress. Both Julian and O'Brien believe that Starfleet Medical would never do this, but they believe Section 31 would. Again, I disagree because Starfleet Medical did send the wrong files. At some level, probably multiple levels, they had to be complicit in doing this action. Even with the setback, Bashir would still try to figure out what's going on. He would still do research and go back as far as he could. He would discover that the virus was injected into Odo at Starfleet Medical, before the war had even occurred. Let's be absolutely clear here. While it was evident to everyone that war was coming, that it would happen, no conflict had begun at this time. No open declaration of hostilities as far as the Federation was concerned. In fact, Starfleet was dealing with its own coup. And during this time, during this time of quote unquote peace, during the Dominion Cold War, Federation citizens and ultimately sanctioned officers that are arguably a part of Starfleet to one degree or another, created a morphogenic virus and committed an act of terrorism and genocide against another power. 
This was an act of war. This is no different than the Dominion utilizing the quickening, except for the fact that it was done in secret and the Dominion were proud of what they had done to that other race. The Dominion didn't want to hide the fact that they had used biogenic weapons. Starfleet did. If you include computer experts, doctors, security officers, admirals, clerks, and more, it would mean that at least 73 people had to be involved. Bashir described Section 31 as a sickness that had slithered into the Federation and was infecting it. I disagree. I think we were now dealing with a culture that simply thought Section 31 was right. Ultimately, Starfleet would have a public and a private opinion on the matter. Now, with all of that said, let me take a moment from destroying your childhood and say something surprising. In Sloan's and Section 31's own twisted way, I think they are still keeping to the spirit of the Federation. It's just in a very dark form. When we look at the virus and how long it took to impact Odo, as well as the fact that I sincerely believe that Sloan felt bad for the changeling and didn't want him to die, I don't ever think that the constable was the target. He was just being used as a form of typhoid Mary. I think that they wanted him to live, but did want to destroy the founders. Additionally, Section 31 only targeted the changelings. They could have also tried to infect the Jem'Hadar and Vorta, but didn't. We know that there were prisoners of war that included both Vorta and Jem'Hadar, so they had people that could be carriers. They just wanted to take out the authoritarian despots, not those who were ultimately victims themselves. They couldn't have known that Odo would go through the changes that he did or have so much contact with the female changeling. The fact he began to show symptoms and became infected was probably a very unlucky accident. I know it doesn't take the bitterness out of your mouth, but I sincerely believe that's what occurred. I also think that this is the difference between Deep Space Nine writing and Star Trek Picard writing. Bashir, with the blessing of Sisko, ironically, would capture Sloane. Sloane would try to commit suicide with both Bashir and O'Brien going into his head and getting the information. Yeah. Bashir and O'Brien do find the cure, Though I will say this, Bashir sets up the machinery to bring them back when he raises his blood pressure. But they both know that the man will die in 43 minutes. Why not have two different fell safes, or three? Have it so that if he raises his blood pressure, it'll bring them back. If it looks like Sloane is going to die for sure, it'll bring them back. Or have it set for 40 minutes to bring them back. I'm just saying, but we'll discuss that at another time. And in another funny coincidence, the cure would require human DNA, human enzymes. I really can't help but see this as some form of a slight against the founders, an F you, if you will. But with Odo cured, the Dominion being in disarray would never get the cure. And I'm not convinced that had they gotten it, it would have helped anyway. But we'll discuss that on the next Lore Reloaded. What's up, Lore Masters? Today we'll be discussing if Sisko actually ordered Worf to kill Chancellor Galron towards the end of the Dominion War. This is a theory that I've honestly never given any credibility or credence. Before we discuss whether Sisko actually did do this dirty act, tell Worf to kill a man or not, we do need to analyze the Klingon Empire itself. One of the early things you learn when you're going through film school is that both movies and television are literally genie magic. A movie or episode tells you what they want you to see, not what you're actually seeing. If there's one thing I can say about the Star Trek writers, it's that they are experts at telling Trek fans what to think, what to feel, and what's the truth. This is probably why people get so angry at me when I literally just relate the actions of Starfleet and show how any reasonable person would see how immoral the organization can be. I bring this up because I believe that's exactly what has happened with the Klingons. When we're first introduced to the species, in real life, not according to the Trek timeline, they are cads and cliched villains. They don't have honor, in fact quite the opposite, they're literal mustache twirlers. However, during the TOS movies, the Klingons are rewritten to have quite an in-depth honor code and rich cultural history. In the movies, every Klingon follows what they consider to be honorable. They are bound by it. It doesn't matter what a Klingon does, as long as it brings glory to the Empire, they are in some way glorious. From a janitor to a warrior, they all will bring honor to their family. 
This changes a bit in the next generation, as Klingons are more and more portrayed as a people who largely define honor as that which can be obtained in combat, and not much else. They even decide to make the society sexist and anti-science, even though this is contradictory to what we see in the TOS movies, but Trek being contradictory is a requirement in writing, so... I guess I really can't complain. From TNG to DS9 to Voyager and Enterprise, the focus on making Klingons honor bound and tying that honor directly to combat becomes the norm. There are offshoot episodes here and there where honor of different sorts is discussed or even exemplified, but those are the exception not the rule. I bring this up because when we look at the Klingon Empire from a storytelling perspective, they're rarely honorable, even though that's what we're told time and again. If I was to explain this thematically, why it would appear that they're honorable in DS9 and generally aren't, I'd probably say that the reasoning is due to a mix of the Klingon culture and where the Klingon Empire is located. The Klingons had to dedicate a large portion of their resources to ships and space combat to gain land to continue to grow the Empire and just eat. Due to this, a culture would have grown around combat, one based on gaining land and calling it honorable so everyone could sleep at night. As is expected, when you look at this type of culture, they would take the more bountiful resources and throw it all into a war machine. The Klingons now dedicating everything to their military as a cultural experience over a necessity. This would ultimately lead to their destruction as the moon of Praxis would explode. Luckily, there would be a man in power who would be a reformer, someone who would want to change everything. Chancellor Gorkon. Being able to see that the destruction of Praxis would mean the extinction of all Klingons, the Chancellor would see that he needed to embrace a different form of honor, an honor for all, and would move away from all combat all the time. While the man was a revolutionary, unfortunately, he was very unique within his culture. Those that would follow him would try to mimic what he was or what he did, but never truly understood it. The Chancellorship could be attained by anyone in theory, but generally was only allowed for those born within a noble family. Deceit and subterfuge started to fester within the noble peoples, and it got so bad that the Klingon Empire would even come close to allying with the Romulans and betraying the Federation. Chancellor Gowron is likely the penultimate example of this faux honorable Klingon. The man was a politician through and through. He was more concerned about what the optics were more than he was the actual honor or bringing glory to the Empire and his family. We see this both in The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Klingons within the Empire were not idiots. The signs were definitely there. They had just become used to what the culture was and pretended that it was something else, that it was whatever they were told in school, even if it wasn't that way in practice. They accepted weak leaders and political maneuvering over honor. It would be something that was simply the norm. They would turn a blind eye to it, just keep it moving. This was a way of life and meant that even the Dominion War would be put in jeopardy as the greatest general, Martok, stood back and let it happen. Because this was his chancellor who was corrupt. He would rather let the entire Alpha Quadrant burn than stand up to Galron. Wow, I, I didn't know Martok was half Cardassian. You know, you really learn a lot about characters when you do these deep dives. And that brings us back to Sisko. We first see the captain arguing over a failed attack by Martok and his forces on a planet deep within the Dominion territory. The Klingons were outnumbered 6 to 1, and still Martok fought harder than most. There were 7 ships lost in this and 5 critically damaged. From beginning to end, it was a waste of resources and equipment, as well as men. Sisko directly challenges Martok, trying to reason with him, but the Chancellor just waves him off. After this, Sisko calls Worf to his office to discuss the huge problem they have. Worf advises Sisko that the attacks are politically motivated. If you hadn't, I would encourage everyone to rewatch the scene between Worf and Sisko, as you can really tell what's occurring based on both posture and music. When Worf related that Galron wants Martok removed from power, the music becomes pretty ominous, and Sisko turns his back to Worf, thinking. He asks if Worf has any ideas, which the Klingon states he does, but it would be difficult. Sisko turns and tells Worf that he should do whatever has to be done, that the issue has to be dealt with, one way or the other. Here's the thing. Sisko is also not stupid. He has had a Klingon under his command for a while and has worked within the Empire. He's fought a war against the Klingons and has had them as allies. The Klingon Empire, generally, has been a close ally of the Federation. There's no way he couldn't know that political assassination isn't an option. Also, this is a man who would be an accomplice to murder to bring the Romulans into the war and utilize biogenic weapons against people who couldn't defend themselves to get one man. So would Sisko have any qualms at this stage ordering Worf to kill Martok? Absolutely not. 
And honestly, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. The only thing that surprises me is that Sisko didn't tell Worf to do it directly and then send him out with a thank you basket and a candy stripper to have the issues addressed. And when you think about it, this really only continues to show the impacts of how a universe that doesn't play by Starfleet's rules and a war that has cost thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives has impacted a frontline captain. While Sisko has always been a different kind of Starfleet officer, I don't believe that the Sisko of Season 1, Episode 1, would do anything near this. It has taken constant degradation of his character for him to take hit after hit to slowly change him. Arguably, after In the Pale Moonlight, Sisko might have begun to do this quite frequently. After all, the first kill is always the toughest. It gets easier after that. But all of these are my opinions. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded. Hey guys, I want to take a minute to say thank you. The response that I've been getting is phenomenal. As many of you know, the pandemic is finally hitting YouTubers as advertisers are pulling out and views are down on the platform. If less than 1% of the people who viewed my videos in a month gave $1, I'd be able to do this for you guys without worrying about trends or YouTube views. So if you can, please consider giving $1 a month. Just $1 helps more than you know. And there are even benefits to this, though I'm not the best at keeping up with them if I'm honest. You're, you're paying to get the videos you're watching right now. I'm just going to level with you. I'll try to get your stuff out, but you're paying for these videos. That's what you're paying for. Anyway, guys, thanks so much. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded. What's up, Lore Masters? For the past year, we've completely broken down every aspect of the Dominion War. The state that the Federation was in before it even knew of the Dominion, the genesis of the Dominion itself, the various wars in the Alpha and Beta Quadrant that came before the Dominion War, and the tensions of the Dominion Cold War. Then the actual conflict itself and how the Federation Alliance was losing at almost every stop. All of that has brought us here. Against the odds, and with it making no sense, the Federation Alliance was able to attain an energy dampener weapon and create a counter to the Breen. The tides were turning. Plot writing is something no one can stand against. Not only that, but a new warship had been assigned to Deep Space Nine, the USS Sao Paulo. It was placed under the command of Cisco and given special dispensation to be renamed to the USS Defiant. I'm glad things in DS9 never have lasting repercussions. Makes it very Voyager. Due to the Federation's extraordinary good luck, the Dominion would retreat to within the borders of Cardassian space. The Founders believing that the Federation wouldn't push the war. After all, so many had already been killed and this is a chance to have the fighting stop. However, ironically, the Founders didn't realize how much they had changed the Federation. Which was the ultimate goal, but they had pushed them in the opposite direction. Had the Dominion been dealing with the Federation before this war, they would have likely been right that Starfleet would not have pushed forward. But now, this Starfleet was very different. This was an entity that was commanded by a government that had watched almost everything that it held dear be lost, with everyone either being dead or subjugated. The Federation and Starfleet had been molded by the fires of war into something new, a militaristic type organization that was willing to end the war once and for all, even if it meant pushing that war. The Dominion would of course become more and more desperate as the war entered into the final throes. The Founders promising the Breen whatever they wanted in order to win, including Federation space when the war was won, on the Dominion side of course. Though this promise was never intended to be kept, it was just something to inspire the Breen to continue to push forward. Both sides were now primed. Starfleet, Romulan, and Klingon fleets assembled at Deep Space Nine and made their way towards the Cardassian border. Likewise, the Dominion would gather its remaining forces to stop the incoming fleet. We don't know a lot about the Battle of Cardassia. The major pieces we do know are that it began at the Cardassian border and ended at Cardassia Prime. The fighting would be at its height at the border, however both sides throwing ships at each other. 
Like we see in most all confrontations, the combat degraded into basically a melee brawl. Similar to what happened at the Sacrifice of Angels, the combat effectively broke down into dozens to hundreds of smaller battles along the lines, ships grouping up in smaller flights of three or more to fight each other. These conflicts would shift as vessels often left one battle to assist in another. However, like we've seen in most conflicts with the Dominion War, the Dominion did force the Federation Alliance to earn every inch. At some point, the flagship of the Romulans would be destroyed, and this would cause the Romulan lines to start to crumble. In a desperate bid to ensure that the Federation Alliance doesn't meet defeat, the Defiant and Two Wings would move to assist the Romulans and restore cohesion. During this time, the remaining Starfleet and Klingon fleets would attack the middle of the Dominion line. It was determined that the Dominion lines were spread too thin, and this was the best chance to turn the tides. Intriguingly, the battles that we see are different in one way. There is one change. In previous confrontations, all ships were constantly active. From Defiant class to Galaxy, they would all be moving in combat, constantly trying to gain an edge. However, here, we observe that larger ships like the Galaxy class vessel just sit in one place, while smaller vessels fight around it. The larger vessel would be firing on enemy ships, just not moving. This effectively makes the Galaxy class an artillery vessel or base of operations. The Dominion's larger vessels would be doing exactly the same thing as well, creating little pockets. As stated, smaller vessels like fighters, the Defiant, Miranda classes, and more would dip and weave back and forth between the two scrimmage points. I don't know if this was done on purpose, it's probably more likely that it was just cheaper to have ships stay in one place versus making them move, but it creates an interesting situation. Towards the end of the confrontation at the Cardassian border, it did seem like the Federation Alliance was about to win. However, they would be taking massive losses for this victory. Fortunately, there would be saviors of the battle, and this would come in the form of the Cardassian military. Inspired by the Cardassian resistance, and due to being treated poorly by the Dominion, the Cardassian military completely turns on their former allies. Cardassian vessels would begin firing on Dominion and Breen ships, causing instant chaos and heavy Dominion losses. The Founder, on Cardassia, incensed by the treachery, would recall all of her forces back to Cardassia Prime and begin the complete genocide of the Cardassian people. We'll discuss more on that after this. Hey guys, if you are enjoying this, I really need your help. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or a YouTube member by clicking the button below. You can also send money via PayPal by going to paypal.me forward slash reloaded studios. YouTubers are currently being destroyed due to the coronavirus and until the economy is back on its feet, any little bit helps. I want to thank you so much for your consideration. The Federation, ironically, would initially be reticent to continue the attack after the Dominion retreat. They had pushed the Dominion back to Cardassia. There was nowhere that the enemy could go. However, after discussion, it was determined that the Founder and Breen could continue to build up and be able to put up some form of fight from Cardassia somehow. I guess they would build the ships on the surface and launch them and somehow be a threat to the entire Alpha and Beta quadrants, which could build ships across both quadrants and send them in from just everywhere. Though I do also wonder about the systems controlled by the Breen. Their infrastructure wasn't touched as far as I'm aware, so why isn't the Federation Alliance concerned about them? In fact, why don't the leaders of the Breen and the Founder bring that up? Funnily enough, when it comes to the Federation Alliance, we don't see the Cardassian nor the Romulan representative's opinion on what they need to do next. This is largely due to the fact that it would cost money to pay for actors to have dialogue, so I assume that the two nations just agree with whatever everyone else does. We are going full Skyrim rules tonight, boys. The fleet would make its way to the Cardassian border. Both sides would be revving up for a fight, though due to Odo, something we'll discuss in the next video, the battle wouldn't begin or go that far if it did. The constable would talk the founder into surrendering and the Dominion forces standing down. I guess we don't need to see what the Breen thought about this either, so we'll just ignore that. Unfortunately, the Battle of Cardassia, both at the border and Cardassia Prime, is exceptionally disappointing from a breakdown standpoint. We are told more than we see, and the combat, while we do have some interesting visuals, though most of it is recycled from either DS9 or movies, really leaves you wanting. 
There are a few pieces here and there, as I stated, that are great and makes it look tense, but they're not there all that often. To be fair, this is a part of the finale episode, which included six different storylines, and this specific piece was really just a bridge. It wasn't the main focus. We will discuss the Dominion response and genocide of the Cardassians, as well as the ending treaty and more in the next episode. Wow, this has been a wild ride, guys, and the Dominion War series is basically my magnus opus of this channel. And it's about to be done with only two or three more videos left. That is just wild. What's up, Lore Masters? Right before the war ended, the female changeling ordered the entire native population of Cardassia, and Cardassians everywhere, to be wiped from the universe. Hundreds of millions of Cardassians were killed before the Federation Alliance, along with the Cardassian military remnants that had joined them, could stop the atrocity. However, stop them they would when the Dominion ultimately surrendered and the war was over. Let's take a look at the day after. After the war, a treaty would be signed that included the United Federation of Planets, the Klingon Empire, the Romulan Star Empire, the Bajoran Republic, as well as the Cardassian Union and the founders of the Dominion. Ironically, in the actual treaty, it designates that the Romulan Star Empire and Klingon Empire are in the Alpha Quadrant when they clearly aren't, or at least a majority of their space is not. But that's neither here nor there, and I just point it out so that we can have the arguments in the comments. This treaty, also known as the Treaty of Bajor, would require the female changeling to surrender herself to the United Federation of Planets to stand trial for war crimes. Additionally, all Dominion military personnel were to commence a complete withdrawal from the Alpha Quadrant within 26 hours of the general ceasefire. I guess they could stay in the Beta Quadrant, or the Prophets would allow them to return without massacring everybody that entered into the wormhole, or maybe the Prophets would still massacre them and the Federation Alliance simply didn't care. We're never really told. Anyway, continuing on, all territories occupied by the Dominion would be returned to their respective sovereign powers, including the Cardassian Union and Breen Confederacy. And that any Dominion territory gained, including by treaty, must be ceded to the Alpha Quadrant. Just the Quadrant itself, no specific power. The last requirement is perhaps the most controversial, though. It states that all borders, sovereignty, and ownership of affected territory would return to its pre-war status as of the point in time when the First Dominion Fleet entered the Alpha Quadrant. This means that the Cardassian territory that the Klingons had captured during the Klingon-Cardassian War stayed with the Klingons. To be succinct here, the Klingon Empire would be rewarded for the titular conflict that all but guaranteed the Cardassians would join the Dominion. Maybe Galron wasn't as idiotic as people make him seem. Basically, the Klingons were a major player in causing a multi-quadrant war, and then they get to keep the land that really started that war. I think the former Chancellor is on to something here. Along with some questionable choices, the treaty would highlight something that many don't really discuss. That is, that Bajor ultimately stays independent, at least for the moment. It would be recognized as the Bajoran Republic instead of the provisional government that we'd always heard it called before. Something definitely worth noting. Additionally, depending on how you read the treaty, this might be a return to the demilitarized zone, which means that any Maquis that survived the war, in theory, could start rebuilding. Not that they would, and to be honest, it's more likely that the DMZ stopped existing and those planets were now just firmly in the control of their respective nations. That could have also been the trade-off, where Cardassia gets to keep those planets with no Maquis, but had to cede the territory they lost to the Klingons, so maybe there was some negotiation. When you look at the layout of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants after the war, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that has been constantly highlighted by this war is that Romulans absolutely don't know how to effectively wage war. To be fair, this seems consistent. Whether in an alternate universe or actual war in the Prime universe, when in actual combat, the tactics of the Romulans seem to include folding easy. While I'm aware that Sloan was worried about the Romulans being a large threat after the Dominion War was over, it is possible that he had not counted on the energy dampening weapons which crippled the fleets of the Rianzu and possibly led them to not being a larger threat as described by Odo. I might also wager that this war, along with Shinzon's insurrection, possibly crippled the Romulans to the point that they would need assistance with the evacuation of their planet, like we see in Star Trek Picard. Another interesting piece that I never really see anyone talk about is that we assume that Salone was being completely honest. After all, the entire operation was meant to trick Bashir so that he would get a mole into the highest echelons of the Romulan leadership. So the Romulans may have never been a threat from what Starfleet could see, it was simply Sloane manipulating Bashir. 
The Klingon Empire would emerge completely different from what it had been when it entered into the war. At least a third of the Klingon fleet was destroyed before the war had begun, and another third or more had been annihilated during. The infrastructure was shaken up as Martok attained chancellorship, and things looked hopeful now that the known corruption of the Klingon Empire's internal affairs was coming to an end. However, the Empire would have to rebuild, and its feudal system would add additional challenges to restoring the Klingon Defense Force to its former glory. The Cardassians had always been somewhat of a developing nation within the galactic arena. It was because of this that the government was militaristic and expansionist. With hundreds of millions dead, the loss of territory, and the near destruction of their entire military, the Cardassians would be heavily reliant on trade and support from other Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers. While this isn't in canon, for the moment at least, it's likely that the Federation would supply the bulk of aid for Cardassia, which probably would lead to the entire government and peoples being absorbed into the Federation at the end of the day. We don't know much about the Breen or the impact of the war on their nation. From everything that's observed, the major loss for them was ships and people. They would keep their sovereign territory and infrastructure. In theory, their military would be curbed, but there's no evidence of this one way or the other. One of the major changes to occur is probably to one of the least talked about about nations. That is the drastic political and infrastructural changes in the Ferengi Alliance. The inner workings moving from a free marketplace to one that protects its citizenry is quite distinct. Most say, and the dialogue does support, that this is largely due to the machinations of Quark's mother. But I'd be willing to bet the treaty between the Ferengi Alliance and the Federation Alliance probably solidified these improvements. After all, the Ferengi would work more and more closely with Starfleet and the Federation and see all that that type of attitude has to offer. Eddington wasn't wrong in the way the Federation assimilates other species, after all. There would be other smaller nations that would enter into the war on one side or the other, one of these being the Sona. And while these peoples and nations were impacted, we don't know enough to really break down what happened to them, not in totality. The impact on the Dominion would be a mixed bag. The Alpha and Beta Quadrant forces would be battered, bruised, and demoralized, but the Gamma Quadrant forces would largely be untouched. The Gamma Quadrant had lost a massive fleet, true, but their entire infrastructure was intact. They had the ability to mass-produce ships, Forta and more Jem'Hadar. While the Founders were sick and dying, they would still be able to exert their will. Honestly, the fear of the female changeling always confused me. I'm not convinced that if the forces in the Gamma Quadrant ever decided to restart the war and could get through the wormhole, that they wouldn't win. It's probably a question we'll never see discussed in Star Trek Picard, I'm absolutely sure. The biggest winner, and something I honestly see reflected in Star Trek Picard on that note, would be the United Federation of Planets. When the war started, the mentality and production of the United Federation of Planets existed in a way that assumed no major wars would occur. However, after the first year of conflict and the loss of so much life and just having so much death, the Federation would have its entire infrastructure revamped, one that would be able to support a quote-unquote war economy. Hundreds of worlds began to create and produce weapons and ships of war to fight the Dominion. Vessels as old as the Miranda were retrofitted to better withstand the weaponry of the enemy and everyone became a part of the solution. The capture of Beta Z, the massive losses of entire fleets would change the culture as well. Cadets would be fast-tracked into officer status and those peacetime explorers who joined to look at the universe and discover new things were killed off and replaced by wartime officers trained to fight and kill the Dominion. A large part of the internal structure of Starfleet would be replaced by Warhawks, not because of any internal coup or because of a natural progression, but because the Dominion was killing everyone off. Section 31 would become stronger than ever. The Starfleet that left the Dominion War would be one naturally geared towards protection first, exploration second. With the exception of Section 31, in essence, the Starfleet post-Dominion War was quite like the Starfleet during the original series. While we can't be sure any new territories were gained by the Federation during the conflict, we do know that Starfleet came out the strongest, being able to now severely outmatch any other major Alpha and Beta Quadrant power. It's an irony that the Dominion wanted to change the geopolitical landscape of the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. It wanted everyone to be subjugated under them. Ironically, they would only ensure that the one government that wasn't arguably authoritarian would become the major stakeholder. Without argument, Starfleet would now be able to enact its will and heavily influence Quadrant events for a long, long time. 
There are very few instances in Trek history that a definable change or turning point can be seen, even an unintended one. The Dominion War would be one of these times. There would be no question that things had changed, that entire governments were now completely different, that they were shadows of their former selves. The Alpha and Beta Quadrants would never be the same the day after the Dominion War. What's up, Lore Masters? If you have been with the series a while, you know that I have purposefully avoided everything that was connected with the Prophets and religion in regards to the Dominion War. All of that was to wait for this video. The fact is, I heard a theory a while back that does make quite a lot of sense. What if this entire thing, the Dominion War, the pain, and the loss, was really just a proxy conflict wherein the Prophets fought with the Paw Wraiths? It's not as crazy as it sounds. Let's break it down. We know that the wormhole was constructed, it's not natural. We don't get a ton of information on how it was constructed, but here's a question. It was made connecting Bajor to the Gamma Quadrant, right next to the Dominion. Space is vast, it's more likely than not that you're not going to hit anything. But somehow, the construction of this wormhole has it right next to one species, a species that can't defend itself, and a mega empire. That's odd. And then, looking at the Prophets, we know they don't deal with linear time. They don't enjoy point A to point B. For them, somehow, everything happens all at once, or they can pick and choose where they are. We know that the Prophets decide to create their own avatar, a human. They infest a woman, force her to have sex with a man, probably multiple times, breed her, force her to pretend like everything is great and she wants this, and that she's in love with someone that she's probably not, forces her to conceive the baby that was forced inside of her, doesn't allow her to tell anyone else, doesn't allow her to go to the cops or report it to Starfleet, but does allow her to leave ultimately, and all of it so that Benjamin Sisko can be born. They then allow Sisko to go through his life, fall in love, go up against the Borg, and end up at Deep Space Nine a single father so they can use him for their own purposes. And while all this is happening, they allow Bajor to go through tremendous amounts of pain and suffering that they could have arguably stopped. Remember, the Prophets have the ability to manipulate people. They can change them. We see this with the Nagus. So why not slowly do this to the Cardassians? It's a risk, but I feel confident that they could have figured a way to get a few high up Cardassians and change them for their own ends. And this could have helped the Cardassian people, who knows? However, instead of doing anything that could have helped the people that they stay that they care about, they just stood back and watched as murder and slavery occurred. They let it happen. And the real reason is, if they had stopped it, Starfleet might not have stepped in and they never would have had Cisco. When the Dominion presents themselves, again the Prophets can see the uses of the totalitarian state. Due to the Dominion, Starfleet would try to shut down the wormhole. However, all that would result in is the fact that the Dominion sabotage Starfleet, ensuring that the wormhole can never be shut down, effectively leaving the wormhole there forever. And then you have Kai Wen, the Prophets purposefully go out of their way to ignore her, to ensure that she is always distant from them. They never reach out to her. It's well within their power, but she never hears a thing. And then, thanks to her, she would ensure that the Paw Wraiths infest Dukat so that the battle between Dukat and Sisko can occur. In fact, when you look at it, when do the Prophets take an active interest in the Dominion War? They do it only A, when it saves Sisko, and B, when it causes a psychotic break in Dukat. By saving the Alpha Quadrant and getting rid of the fleet, they ensured that Dukat would go mad with anger and remorse and set him up to be a puppet of the Paw Wraiths. They made sure that someone who had nothing to do with their fight would suffer eternally so they could win. It could not have been more perfectly played. If there was no Dominion War, there would have been no defeat of the Paw Wraiths. This also brings up another curious question. Why didn't the Dominion try to kill the Prophets? either on the Alpha or Gamma Quadrant. We know it's possible to do, and with the wormhole now a permanent fixture, it would be plausible to kill them and still keep the passage. Did the Prophets make some side deal with the Dominion, promising to defend the Gamma Quadrant, but to allow the Alpha Quadrant affairs to occur? Could explain why the Prophets allowed the Dominion to return after they were defeated to the Gamma Quadrant, even though they weren't a part of the affairs of the ceasefire. In fact, we don't ever really see any attempts to take down the Prophets until Dukat goes rogue and the Paw Wraiths assault the Wormhole. And at the end of the day, who did the Dominion War help? Certainly Starfleet was the strongest at the end of the day, but this was at the cost of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to more lives. Every other government was crippled, possibly fatally. Well, every major government, not including the Gamma Quadrant. The Prophets, though, they destroyed the Paw Wraiths and now never have to worry about that again. And they got a pet human.
Not a bad bargain, if you ask me.